All right, uh, we're gonna get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jason Lee, chair of the Board of Trustees. I'm now really gonna project my voice. How's that? All right, thank you. Um, so we're kicking off uh, a series of meetings. And if, uh, I know everyone was taking notes when I gave my inaugural speech about the heart and soul of the State Bar, but this meeting will be uh, defining the roadmap for the soul of our agency. And we're going to be focusing on uh, our work in diversity and inclusion, as well as access uh, to justice, um, with bookmarked by the um, fascinating topic of uh, our budget and a discussion relating to our fee increase. I, I know very scintillating things, but happy to be here. Um, if I could uh, get the roll call, please. Broughton? Here. Chen? Here. Dillon? Here. Duran? Here. LeBron? Here. Manning? Here. Mendoza? Here. Pertula? Here. Seleg? Here. Stallings? Here. Steinbrecher? Here. Thanks, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to start with a progress update on our strategic plan. Uh, led by our capable uh, ED, Leah Wilson. So with that, Leah. All right. I am not actually going to lead this session, but I am going to kick us off. So we're doing things a little uh, differently this year. The bulk of your strategic plan update has been provided as a written agenda item posted as an update on strategic plan progress. What we're going to cover over the course of the next hour are selected objectives from the strategic plan uh, related to our discipline and admissions functions. Uh, and in that manner, we are going to combine the admissions discipline training that is on the board calendar with strategic plan updates. So uh, what you're going to do over the course of the next hour is hear from the directors of the offices of State Bar Court, Probation, Client Security Fund, our Chief Trial Counsel. Um, they're going to give you a brief overview of the functioning of the offices and then launch into the implementation of key strategic plan objectives impacting their areas. And on the discipline side, that is the implementation of the Odyssey case management system, which we deployed as a soft launch in October, but we're going live with February 11th as well as the development of uh, metrics. Uh, the metrics have been provided to all of you as part of the ED report posted for tomorrow, but you're going to hear from the leadership of these offices about the tools that we have developed in order to assess our effectiveness, uh, not just workload. So before uh, we begin the actual substance of today's training, I do want to ask if any board members have questions about the written update that was provided. Uh, understanding that we are going to cover uh, orally today only selected strategic plan objectives. No? Okay, so we are going to start off with discipline and then we'll move to admissions. Admissions, similarly, we're going to get a brief overview of the functions of the office and then an update on implementation of key strategic plan objectives on the admissions side, the admissions case management system. Uh, on virtually the same timeline as the discipline one, and then the attorney practice analysis, but giving you a broader overview of the studies on the bar exam. Uh, so with that, we will kick off with the Office of the Chief Trial Counsel, Melanie. Hi, good morning. I'm Melanie Lawrence, and we did want to start with OCTC this morning because it really is where the discipline system starts. I want to give you a brief overview of what our office does. Uh, primarily, we intake and investigate complaints related to attorney misconduct. Um, they come from a variety of different sources, including clients themselves, also co-counsels, uh, opposing counsels, banks, courts, 
self-reports from attorneys. They have a variety of responsibilities uh, in terms of reporting certain misconduct that occurs. And occasionally our office actually uh, opens investigations when we have specific information um, without a complaining witness. We have a number of different types of cases. The bulk of the cases that we talk about and when we talk about things like backlog, which I'll refer to later in my discussion with you, uh, are original matters. So those are the cases that I discussed, the cases that come from clients and other sources. We also have a variety of different cases that when we talk about them, they are not included in the, the numbers, the overall numbers in the cases that we talk about in backlog. Um, so for example, uh, the non-attorney and authorized practice of law cases, those are cases that we deal with and we have a team uh, that addresses those cases. We have moral character cases. Those are cases where the committee has denied admission to an applicant and the applicant then seeks appeal in the state bar court and our office defends the committee of bar examiners. We also deal with reinstatement cases. These are cases where the respondent is, has been disbarred or resigned with charges pending and we are opposing their reinstatement. We also deal with probation and reproval violations and also criminal conviction matters. So where an attorney has been convicted of a crime and the review department has referred the conviction to our hearing department for a determination as to whether or not the conviction amounts to moral turpitude or other misconduct warranting discipline. Our process generally, we can move to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, our process generally is that all cases, for the most part, begin in our intake unit. Our intake unit is staffed mainly of attorneys. We call them read attorneys. Their function is to literally read complaints. What they are looking for when they are reading complaints is whether or not if all of the allegations were true, would it constitute attorney misconduct? If the answer is yes, then the case moves forward to our enforcement unit. At times, there's not sufficient information to make that determination, in which case our attorneys uh, are reaching out, for example, to the complaining witness to gather more information to make that determination. And in the end, if the answer is no, the case is closed in our intake unit. The case then moves forward to investigation to the enforcement unit. Some of you may remember the workforce planning um, um, that we went through a couple of years ago. The recommendations included that we separate our enforcement units out into teams, um, generalized teams who handle cases. Um, and so when the case moves from enforcement to investigations, they go to uh, an enforcement team. The teams are uh, headed by a supervising attorney. They are also staffed with investigators and uh, legal advisors and also support staff. We work in a vertical prosecution, which means that the attorney who begins the case investigations as a legal advisor stays with that case throughout the life, stays with the case throughout the life of the case meaning that if the case moves forward to filing, the attorney actually handles the filing, and if the case moves forward to hearing, that attorney handles the hearing as well. There are a number of different things that happen during the investigation phase. It could include subpoenaing documents. It could include interviewing witnesses, including the complaining witness uh, and other witnesses, and also getting information from the respondent. Um, this is all to determine whether or not there is sufficient evidence to move forward for filing or to close the case at investigations. Now, keep in mind that throughout this process, from the time that that case walks in the door into our intake unit throughout this entire investigation process, the 180-day backlog date is ticking. And it ticks until the actual NDC filing. We are not able to get there until we actually go through an early neutral evaluation, which is essentially an early settlement conference that uh, we go to after having drafted uh, disciplinary charges and also um, attempting to gain information from the respondent in terms of what they consider uh, for mitigating circumstances so that we're able to have meaningful early neutral settlement conferences. If we're unable to actually resolve the case, then the case gets filed with a notice of disciplinary charges. And that's the time when the 180-day clock, if you will, uh, ends. 
our attorney then handles the case, as I th said, through trial. We do have a specialized appeals unit. So if our office seeks appeal or the respondent seeks appeal, then we have a team of attorneys who actually handles those appeals. In terms of our staffing and our workload, OCTC has about 250 staff, and that's between Los Angeles and San Francisco. You'll see that we have about 200 folks in Los Angeles and about 50 in San Francisco, um, made up of array of staff, including supervisors, managers, um, attorneys, investigators, and support staff. It's approximately 80 total attorneys. The numbers that you see from 2015 to 2017 are the numbers that we've received over those three years into our intake unit. And keep in mind that that number does not include the non-attorney non unauthorized practice of law cases, the criminal conviction matters, the moral character and reinstatement cases. So it's only the cases that come in from clients, for example, banks, uh, courts, et cetera. You'll see that our averaging, average processing case time versus the statutory goal is listed there for cases that are closed. It's uh, generally 115 days and filed in state bar court. It takes about 450 days. Well, we're missing a slide here. Um, so I, I, want, I did want to highlight the, uh, the unauthorized practice of law cases for you. Um, because I know that it has been important to the board over time and it's important to our other stakeholders. And as a result, we do have a team dedicated to the unauthorized practice of law by non-attorneys. The team is staffed by uh, a supervising attorney, attorneys and investigators, as well as support staff, including paralegals. This team acts as, as a vertical team from the intake point. So those cases... Uh, alleging the non-attorney unauthorized practice of law do not go through our regular intake. They're in, uh, the intake function is done by the specialized team itself. Uh, we do have a number of different options when we're looking at these cases um, from closing them if there isn't sufficient information to move forward to issuing, issuing cease and desist letters, which we do on occasion when we see minor misconduct, um, perhaps it was some time ago, um, it's not ongoing, but we wanna make sure that we give the person warning that they've uh, perhaps crossed the line and that in the future, if they continue to do so, that there may be additional action on the part of our office. I will also say that in the, in the intake uh, function in this particular unit, when cases are moving forward to investigation, uh, we actually do a law enforcement referral at that point. So we refer to our law enforcement partners. This is before we've actually completed an investigation. Um, so we do do that. And to the extent that we can work with them throughout the process of the investigation, we do that. Uh, on occasion, we've been successful at collaborating with them where they bring criminal charges. And at the same time, we actually seek an assumption of the unauthorized practice so that we can go in and take client files which is um, ultimately the, the one big thing that we can do that um, generally law enforcement agencies don't do is that under Business and Professions Code 6126.3, if there is uh, an ongoing practice by a non-attorney and we have probable cause to believe that a client or interested party is harmed, we can go into the superior court on a verified application and we can ask the court to assume jurisdiction and to appoint us to go in and seize the practice, which essentially means that we go in and take files, that we freeze bank accounts, and that we reroute the mail and uh, the phone calls. And our goal in doing this is to actually turn those files to the clients and let them know that the person that they have engaged is not actually authorized to practice law. It can be fairly large operations and they can tap our resources fairly significantly if we have hundreds or thousands of files to actually go through and return. In 2017, to give you an idea of um, the numbers, we had 668 complaints related to non-attorney non UPL. I imagine that the numbers will be similar for 2018 as well. And recently, with regard to the cease and desist letters that we occasionally issue, 
we have started listing on our, our website the names of the people that we are issuing cease and desist letters to, as well as the county that we are from, so that the public has that information. All right, I'm gonna move on for some reason, my, uh, my slides aren't working. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk with you about was CMS. And um, as Leah mentioned, we are launching Odyssey uh, on February 11th. And our staff for the last couple of weeks has been going through training and they will continue to. I had my own training last week. Uh, and I think that generally speaking, people are very excited. Um, I wanted to show you a couple of slides, and I see that they're up now. And really, it's just a side-by-side -side comparison showing you um, what our life looks like in the DOS environment of AS400 on the left and what it will look like on the right-hand side. And this uh, slide doesn't actually do it justice, so we're getting away from the black and green uh, screen of the DOS environment and moving to the Odyssey environment. Um, I think that uh, it will help tremendously in terms of the flow of our work. It will be interesting to see in the end how it impacts productivity. But one thing that stands out in particular, and with some of these cases in particular, is it can be very voluminous. And what we are dealing with now are actual paper files sometimes, which make up several boxes. And now we will have all of those documents scanned in and living in the Odyssey environment, meaning that our staff, so including the legal advisors who are working on a case in tandem with the investigator, can actually work on a file uh, at the same time. So um, I think it'll be really interesting to see how, how it all impacts us, but we are very excited that it's finally coming. I do imagine that at least for some brief period of time, we will see a slow in our productivity as our staff becomes accustomed to it. Lastly, I wanted to talk with you about uh, metrics related to OCTC and in particular, uh, our case prioritization system, which I have mentioned before. Um, in terms of metrics, uh, what we're working towards is to reduce the number of P1 cases. Those are the cases that pose the most significant public protection risk uh, that are in our backlog. There are uh, a number of reasons why cases go into backlog. Um, and the fact is that even in the P1 cases, there will be some that will uh, continue to roll into backlog as we have to uh, rely on other sources oftentimes for our information, including when we're waiting for documents, when we're trying to get respondents and witnesses to actually cooperate with us. But to the extent that we have control over these cases, our goal is to reduce the number that are in uh, backlog. And the other big one is to for those cases that we have designated as P2, which are essentially cases that we think with a little bit of work and a bit less process, we can actually move much more quickly. And we want to um, set some time goals for how long uh, we want to take to move those cases along, what we think is reasonable. Um, and also that hopefully we will see that those P2 cases will never be in backlog. That is the goal. Um, we have three teams currently that are dedicated to expediting cases, two in Los Angeles and one in San Francisco. It's a team of uh, one, one to two investigators and a legal advisor. And thus far, we've seen good results when it comes to this. So we will continue to work on that throughout this year. And then, of course, the, the big challenge is that when you're moving cases along, that we still maintain our good quality. And there are uh, a few ways to do that. They're listed on the slide, including the number of cases that the complaint review unit recommends that are reopened because they disagree with us, not because the, that there is new evidence that we weren't allowed to consider and also um, the Walker petition. So those are cases that are going to the Supreme Court because the complaining witness has requested and how many of those are actually returned to us by the Supreme Court. So we wanna make sure that we keep those uh, numbers down. And also we have uh, two random audits that happen during the year. Um, there's about 200 plus cases that are randomly audited. We want to uh, minimize the number of cases that that auditor recommends that we reopen. So those are the things that we'll be working on this year. I think that's my time.
Sorry, had it on, it went off. I'm Antonia Darling, uh, Chief Court Counsel, Chief Court Administrator for the State Bar Court. California is the only state in the nation with an independent professional judge, with independent professional judges dedicated to ruling on attorney discipline cases. Since 1989, the court has used these professional judges who are appointed by the California Supreme Court, the legislature, and the governor. Prior to that, the State Bar used panels of volunteer, um, three volunteer referees to hear cases, as many uh, State Bars still do. The State Bar Court is an adjunct to the Supreme Court, and the judicial officers are independent of the State Bar. The Bar provides the court with its physical support, such as courtrooms, offices, supplies, as well as sufficient staff to support the functioning of the court. The court is divided into two departments, a hearing department and a review department, which was headed by the presiding judge. The hearing department is the trial level of the State Bar Court, and the review department is essentially the appellate level. State Bar Court judges hear the cases and appeals, which are filed by Office of Trial Counsel, and then make recommendations to the Supreme Court for discipline. Or they can issue reprovals in less serious matters themselves. The court can also temporarily remove lawyers from the practice of law when they are deemed to pose a substantial threat of harm to clients or the public. Like all courts, the State Bar Court's work generally begins when a case is filed. When the State Bar's prosecutors, the Office of Child Counsel, brings charges against an attorney, a case is initiated, a judge assigned, and the process begins. A few matters are brought by petition, not by notice of disciplinary charges, and occasionally some, char some matters are started by um, attorneys themselves, such as petitions for reinstatement. Unlike other courts, the State Bar Court may become involved in a case before charges are actually filed in one situation. If the respondent elects to participate in an early neutral evaluation conference, in that a judge is assigned to the case to meet with the parties, parties hear their take on the case, and to render some opinion as to either the strength of the case, which may lead to the respondent settling, or the weakness of the case, which may lead to OCTC deciding they need to do some further work before they bring their case. It can make the process very efficient, and a fair number of cases do end up being settled. And this year, we're going to be studying the whole e and &E process to see if we can make it more efficient and effective. Once a case is filed, however, the State Bar Court manages all the pretrial activities like discovery and motions and ADA accommodations. The judges then conduct a trial. And if attorneys are found to have committed acts of professional misconduct or they were convicted of serious crimes, a decision is issued. Then the parties can request a review by the review department. And if so, then an appellate hearing is held. The court, the review department run does an independent review of the case. So they don't just consider the issues raised by the party, but they look at the entire case to make sure that it was handled properly, all issues were addressed, and that the decision is appropriate. Ultimately, of course, only the California Supreme Court can issue any discipline against an attorney. In the hearing department, the State Bar Court has five full-time judicial positions, which are split between Los Angeles and San Francisco. The Supreme Court appoints two of the hearing judges, while the governor, the speaker of the assembly, and the Senate Committee on Rules appoints one hearing judge each. We've had two hearing judge vacancies since November 1st, so the hearing department has been doing some double duty and a lot of traveling to keep the cases moving. There are also three review department judges who hear all cases en banc with oral arguments set in either San Francisco or Los Angeles. All three review department judges are appointed by the California Supreme Court. As to staff, the court has 32 non-judicial staff members. 12 are in San Francisco, 20 in Los Angeles, and this is down from 36 staff members last year. Staff includes court counsel, who are research attorneys for the judges, court clerks, what are called case specialists, who handle all the court clerk and courtroom deputy duties, and a few administrative positions and some managers. In 2018, there were 584 matters filed in the hearing department of the State Bar Court. 498 were disciplinary cases. These include cases arising from complaints and um, Rule 9.20 violations or proceedings because an attorney violated the terms of probation, and some cases were because a reciprocal state bar has issued discipline against an attorney and the matter is then referred to California because they're also a California attorney. There were also 66 regulatory cases filed, which include moral character applications, reinstatement petitions, and arbitration enforcement proceedings. 
The hearing department held 102 trials in 2018, and the rest of the cases were either settled or were handled by default. In the review department, there were 46 requests for review filed, and 100 conviction transmittals were filed in the review department. Initially, they're considered for interlocutory action. If it's a serious crime or involves moral turpitude, the review department will place the attorney on interim suspension pending finality of the conviction, and then the matter returns to the hearing department for determination as to appropriate discipline, unless they're summarily disbarred. Of the two strategic um, goals that the court has been working on that are set by the board, the first, of course, is CMS, as you heard from Melanie about what, what OCTC is doing. The court is also moving to the Odyssey system. We spent a great deal of time in the last two years working on this with the CMS team. And moving from our legacy case management system to the Odyssey system will provide three big advantages. First, we'll have the ability to create complete electronic files for cases. Currently, we provide some access to a docket, such as a list of activities on cases, electronically. But the actual case file is still paper, as Melanie mentioned. Hers are, too. Although occasionally the court can allow a party to submit a doc document via email because of like an ADA accommodation, um, currently we have no system to store the entire file electronically. Since we have courts in both LA and San Francisco, that means we ship files back and forth a great deal. and like OCTC, if one person's working on the original file, nobody else can have access to it. And when a case is shipped to the Supreme Court on appeal or for verification or validation of the ultimate decision, we have no file at all. This is pretty ridiculous. So moving to electronic files is going to be very, very helpful. Um, also, when cases close, we'll be able to store them electronically instead of shipping them to off-site and paying for a great deal of storage. The second big positive change for CMS is that the Odyssey system positions the court well to moving into electronic filing when the next phase of the electronic case filing system is developed. And third, moving to, to the Odyssey system will increase public's access to court matters. Oops, too far. Oh, we're missing a slide here, too. <laughs> OK, we'll go back. Um, under the BMP Code Section 6086.1, all state bar court hearings and records of original disciplinary proceedings are public as soon as the NDC is filed. Currently, the court complies with this duty by providing electronic public access to the docket in every case and responding then to requests for copies of the documents. The docket has limited specific information, like it'll say there's an order, but it doesn't say whether the order granted or denied the request. Um, and it doesn't give you access to the actual documents. As you know, many courts have already moved their entire court files to an electronic system where all the pleadings are available online, and that's what we're shooting for. Uh, under this new system, we will also be having um, a public portal which will allow people to see the complete docket and will have links to the documents. To do this, of course, we have to create electronic files for the court. And that will take some time. As both OCTC and probation are moving into the same Odyssey system, although they are separate, they can serve as our test customers for developing our e-filing procedures and creating the actual electronic files. OCTC and probation are a, probation in, are a party in every single proceeding, which means at least half of every single the documents filed in every single case are created in a system that can be transmitted easily to us electronically. Through a task queue, the court can allow OCTC and probation to submit these documents to us. That helps us develop rules and procedures for when we roll out electronic filing to the public, and also helps us create the electronic files that will give transparency and access to the public as well as the parties. This should create efficiencies for the court as well as OCTC and probation, and it will also reduce errors as if a document is input once, into the system, then we don't create problems by doing it multiple times. We have initially eliminate, uh, limited OCTC and probation to transmitting initiating documents electronically out of fairness to parties because we don't want to be perceived as giving them any special favors. But since they choose when those documents are filed, it doesn't make any difference if they send them electronically or if they send them through inner office mail. Eventually, we will roll out to all of their documents, however, because 
it, again, it's half the documents. If we don't have to scan them in, we're going to move to having complete electronic files much more quickly. We will, however, work closely with both sides to make sure that that doesn't somehow create any unfairness for the other parties. Also missing some. Other. <laughs> All right, let's talk about state bar court metrics. Um, in 2004, the state bar court adopted a set of court performance standards to assess and report on the court's effectiveness in meeting various standards. The standards were designed to ensure that the court was as efficient as possible and in meeting its duties and thereby protecting the due process rights of the parties. Using those standards, the state bar court has steadily improved its case closing ratio, that is, the number of cases opened every year or closed every year, thereby eliminating any backlog, and its on-time performance in concluding cases. The previous standards, however, measured many internal deadlines, and I don't know, I guess, yeah, that's backwards. <laughs> okay. This shows you some of these internal deadlines. You have 25 days for a response, 40 for a request, 45, 65 for discovery, the trial begins, the case is submitted, and 230 days to get a decision filed after the trial is over. While these internal measures are very helpful, and again, similarly, review department has internal standards. While these internal deadlines are very important for the court management to look at to make sure that we're moving each case along at every step. In fact, they don't really mean much to anyone else, and often they are not met because of due process. If a party is sick, if a transcript isn't prepared on time, if some other issue arises, we will always continue the matter to another date in order to make sure that the parties have all of their rights. But we still work very hard at making sure we meet the last deadline. And sometimes that means we don't give the judges their full 90 days to write a decision because we are deaf on that last deadline to make sure that we get decisions done within the outside number. Therefore, the new metrics are really only going to measure for you the last number. Are we getting the case processed in the full amount of time, the 365 days for appeals and the 230 days for the trials? We as a court will continue to monitor those ed deadlines to make sure we're not developing any problems with our system, but it really is meaningless to both the public and to the board to worry about those internal deadlines. Um, I think you really are just mostly concerned that people get their cases done. So the new metrics are, first we have the qualitative measures. Um, and the first one is, what? Well, those were perform. Okay, the performance measures. There we go. The performance measures are the efficiency in case closed clearance. That is the ratio of the number of cases filed each year to the number closed. That's a way of preventing a backlog. That's a number we've previously reported to you, and we will continue with the new performance metrics. The second one is cycle time, the on-time case processing, and that now has been eliminated to or uh, shortened up to just the outside deadlines. Um, instead of those individual inside dates. And the third one is a, a different way of looking at it. It's case disposition time, measuring, you know, are, do 90% of the cases make the deadlines, you know, and what's the percentage? It's just a different way of looking at the same numbers. Um, right now, we are at 100% of meeting the deadlines in review and effectuation, and, I, and 89 or 90% at the hearing level. So we're doing pretty well, and we will continue to monitor that. So those are the performance metrics. We're adding a new measure, however. It's a qualitative measure that has not been done before completely. And in that, based on the number of petitions for review filed with the Supreme Court, we will report the number of cases that were either remanded to the state bar court um, for further action. And we have previously reported that number to the court without telling them the universe against which this comes. And whether or not the Supreme Court actually reverses or changes the level of discipline, something we have not reported in the past. Um, these numbers are going to be very small. Uh, many years there are no remands and, and no uh, reversals. Therefore, these will only be reported to you semi-annually uh, because there just won't be numbers. But I think it's still important to see that the Supreme Court is, in fact, agreeing with our courts and in, in affirming their decisions. And if they're not, we're certainly going to take a closer look at it. 
that's everything for State Bar Court. Good morning. I'm Terry Goldade. I am the supervising attorney for the Office of Probation. The Office of Probation monitors orders by the State Bar Court, such as reprovals and ongoing ADP matters in which conditions have been ordered. We also monitor orders by the Supreme Court in probation cases. Probation matters typically have a stayed <coughs> suspension period, but they may also include a period of actual suspension. And the length of time can vary on any discipline, but typically um, we see at least one year. No matter the level of discipline, certain terms and conditions are generally required in each of those matters. For example, they may need to meet with a probation case specialist to review the terms and conditions of their probation or approval. <coughs> they may need to file quarterly reports, attend ethics school, and pass the MPRE. For specific reasons for why misconduct was committed, sometimes there's probation conditions that are targeted for those types of problems, such as maybe lab testing, restitution, or attending client trust accounting school. Currently, once the court orders discipline, the state bar court provides a copy of the order to the Office of Probation. It usually arrives in interoffice mail as a paper copy. So the Office of Probation opens a paper file, and then we enter um, into AS400 electronic data that will open our electronic file. We then draft a courtesy reminder letter to the attorney, um, setting forth their deadlines, their conditions. We include any information sheets that are relevant to them, such as how to register for ethics school, how to register for the MPRE. We also include forms for them. For example, we include a quarterly reporting form that is specifically tailored to their conditions and to their case. And then, then we upload the letter to the attorney's My State Bar profile on the State Bar's website. We then send them an email letting them know that it's been uploaded and that they can access it. When we open and monitor these matters, it's an intensely paper-driven process. Each quarter, most probationers have to send in quarterly reports, and they may attach to those um, proof of compliance with their other conditions, attached uh, and such as self-help group attendance logs, um, mental health therapy reports, complying with tr client trust accounting procedure. Then we review these as they come in by mail or fax or any alternative method that the, the attorney may want to bring them in in person. So paper, email, all of that sort of stuff, we have to review it. It can take several weeks. And then we have to update both the electronic and the paper file. If there's non-compliance, we notify the attorney and let them know that they may be referred for additional discipline unless they come into compliance by providing uh, completion of proof late. If they don't provide that proof of completion, then we do refer them. And currently, we uh, file either from my department a motion to revoke their probation in state bar court or we refer it to the Office of Chief Trial Counsel for them to initiate a new proceeding in state bar court. The referral process is very time and labor intensive. Uh, we copy every document. We then certify every document. We prepare a memo that sets forth all of the violations, and we describe each of the documents. We then log that in, and then it gets forwarded to the Office of Chief Trial Counsel in um, inner office mail. Over the past three years, you can see that the number of cases that have been opened and closed by the Office of Probation has decreased. This is due in part because as of September 2016, the Office of Chief Trial Counsel now monitors the, its agreements in lieu of discipline. And also in February of 2017, the form for attorneys to resign without charges pending was changed. So now, instead of having a two-part process to resigning, it's a one-part process. And when attorneys resign without charges pending, the requirements of Rule 920 are included within the form. So as a result of that, the Office of Probation no longer needs to monitor um, cases where the attorney resigned without charges pending. 
In, in this, you can see the number of referrals has stayed somewhat consistent, especially in relation to the number of cases. Um, the majority of the matters referred to the Office of Chief Trial Counsel are probation matters and when an attorney violates Rule 9.20. Currently in the Office of Probation, there are eight staff members. There's six probation case specialists, a administrative assistant, and a supervising attorney. We're all located in the Los Angeles office. In the future, the mandatory portion of LAP and ADP may be folded within the Office of Probation, which would um, change staffing and the ways in which cases are handled. Although Odyssey will not provide to the Office of Probation um, an overall improvement at Go Live, it will provide some improvement in our processes. The, processes most, the process most improved is going to be the referral process. As I described, it's very labor intensive at this point um, for the Office of Probation. Um, with Odyssey, what will happen is the probation case specialist will send a task to the supervising attorney recommending referral in a particular matter. If it's warranted to be referred, the supervising attorney will send a task to the Office of Chief Trial Counsel, notifying them that there have been uh, instances of noncompliance that need to be referred. And then the Office of Chief Trial Counsel will be able to access directly from um, probation's part of Odyssey the documents. Uh, with that, the Office of Probation will not need to certify every document at the beginning of the process. We'll only need to certify them if the matter goes to trial. And um, we won't need to do a log or send the paper file because we will be able to run a report. And so the log will be generated within Odyssey. <coughs> Additional improvements are expected in phase two. Um, when an interface will be built, that will allow respondents and hopefully third parties to submit documentation online, such as the quarterly report. This system will be able to prohibit submission of documentation where everything isn't included within it. So if there's not, a, if there's like required fields, if they don't put in all the information, it won't be filed. It will also give the attorneys notification immediately whether their submission is late. Um, this will save an extraordinary amount of back and forth between the attorney and the Office of Probation, and it will um, hopefully minis minimize the amount of ministerial review that the probation case specialists need to do. An important measure so that the Office of Probation can improve and refine our approach is to understand who and how many successfully complete probation. In meeting these performance metrics, careful consideration has been made as to what successful is and what that looks like. Because our legacy CMS system does not have as many data points as Odyssey will, we may not be able to do a historical side-by-side -side comparison of the two, but at least initially, the Office of Probation will be measuring cases in which every condition was completed on time as well as cases that were not referred for noncompliance, but in which maybe there were some conditions completed late. After seeing what this data provides, we may be able to refine our definition of successful, which will help us as we move forward with what we've referred to as revisioning probation. And this will help us move forward in terms of an evidence-based practice to help us focus our resources and improve outcomes. Understanding recidivism rates will help us determine how we should focus our resources and how we might craft recommendations in the future to the court for which conditions to impose in particular cases. Another area that we don't really know enough about right now is how successful probationers are in meeting their restitution condition requirements. We will be defining successful completion as completion of all restitution ordered in probation and reproval matters. It's important to note that not all probation cases for restitution have a firm deadline. Some of them are ordered to make restitution and until. So in other words, they will remain suspended until they make restitution. Also in disbarment cases, there's usually no deadline for making restitution. 
Um, so unless an attorney wants to be reinstated, they usually have a pretty low incentive to pay that restitution. Understanding the types of probationers who are successful in making their restitution will help us to understand how to craft restitution conditions in the future and to hopefully work with our other probationers to improve our restitution rate. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Lori Mellock. I'm the manager of the Client Security Fund. Uh, just a brief overview of the fund. Uh, the Client Security Fund was created by Business and Profession Code 6140.5 to relieve or mitigate pecuniary losses caused by dishonest conduct of active members of the state bar, which means that CSF reimburses the victims of attorney theft. That's essentially what we do. In the last three years alone, CSF has reimbursed more than $23 million to over 3,500 people. CSF reimbursement is discretionary. There's no right to reimbursement. And the board has created the Client Security Fund Commission and the CSF rules to administer the fund and to exercise that discretion. Now, in order to qualify for reimbursement, there are a number of requirements that must be met. The main one being that a California attorney must have received the money. We do not reimburse for negligence or malpractice. A promise that I was going to settle your case for a million dollars and you didn't ever get that million dollars. The attorney actually has to receive the money and wrongfully retain it. Also, the attorney must have been uh, disbarred or disciplined. In the CSF rules, this falls under our rule 3.432. And while there are other ways for this rule to be met, for example, if the attorney is deceased, we can proceed on those cases. The main way that this requirement is met is usually through the discipline of the attorney. Now, if the discipline is less than disbarment, the Client Security Fund can only proceed on those cases uh, that we specifically have an application that matches the discipline that went against the attorney. If respondent was disciplined for his conduct toward applicant Smith, then we can move on applicant Smith's application. But if the attorney is disbarred, then the Client Security Fund can move forward on any of the applications that were filed against the attorney, even if the uh, particular matters were not included in the disbarment decision. So a little bit about our process. Anyone can apply to CSF. They have to submit an application and supporting documents, and then CSF investigates and provides the legal analysis to determine if the matter qualifies for reimbursement. There are three ways to resolve a CSF application. We can close the application administratively if it clearly falls outside our rules or if the, uh, there's no discipline imposed against the attorney. Uh, the manager can issue what we call a notice of intention to pay. Now this is used in clear cases where we don't uh, uh, anticipate any objections. And it's a default process under which the legal document is served on the respondent attorney. And if the attorney does not object within 30 days, then the case is paid. Uh, the final process that we have involves the tentative decision process. This is used in more of the complicated cases or cases where uh, there's going to be a denial to the applicant or if the attorney uh, is objecting. Then what happens is uh, a legal document called a tentative decision is drafted. Um, and right now, we're undergoing some changes in that process. These cases have always been presented to the commission at all of their meetings. What we're going to be switching over to is the staff issuing the tentative decisions. And then moving forward, only the objections will be brought to the commission. So they'll serve as more of an appellate, bo appellate body. This was part of the Appendix I recommendations. So uh, once the tentative decision is served, the parties have 30 days to object to the decision. And if there's no objection, then we issue a final decision. If there is an objection, it goes back to the commission now for review of the entire administrative record. CSF has eight staff members. There's um, myself as the attorney manager of the fund. I also have a full caseload as well as doing the administrative work of the fund. We have three attorneys, one investigator, and three administrative um, staff. You can't really uh, look at the current client security fund without understanding a little bit of our history, which in the past years, going back to 2008, started with the loan modification crisis, is what we call it. 
Um, this involved attorneys offering to represent homeowners and renegotiating their home loans. Attorneys advertised on the internet. They had clients all over the country, and often they had thousands of clients that they were uh, supposedly representing in these matters. Unfortunately, many of these lawyers were not providing any services. And then they continued to take fees even after the law was changed to prohibit advanced fees. So the Client Security Fund had an extremely large increase in the number of cases that were filed. As you can see, we went in 2008 from receiving 825 new applications to over 3,000 in both 2009 and 2010. And that continued for the next few years. So our workload increased tremendously, and that, of course, affected the amount of money we had to pay out to people. So we've been reducing that inventory, but we are still dealing with the effects of the loan mod crisis, and there's still a large aging inventory that we are working through. Until recently, the loan modifications uh, area was the largest uh, area of practice that we received um, cases on. But in 2018, it was uh, family law and PI cases that uh, we received the most in. So the loan modification cases are finally starting to um, not come in at such a large level. Uh, but we do still have some respondents from that era that have we're waiting for discipline on. Those cases still have to be resolved. And we also have cases that have just been waiting essentially their turn to be resolved until we have the money and the staff time to get to those. So even though each year we reimburse the full amount that is budgeted, we, it still does take a long time for a case to get through our system. Uh, in 2018, we reimbursed 9.15 million. Um, we resolved over 1,500 applications, and 870 of those uh, were reimbursements. The others were denied for a variety of reasons. That can be that the attorney performed the work on the case, that he returned the money, that it just falls outside the scope of our rules for some reason. There's all different reasons that a case can be denied. Uh, we track the time that it takes to resolve a CSF application from our jurisdiction date until the matter is closed. So what we refer to as our jurisdiction date is when we can finally move forward with an application. And as we, I told you earlier, we require discipline on the attorney before we can move forward. So if a discipline complaint is filed and a CSF application is filed at the same time, it might take, let's say, three years for that case to get through the discipline system. That application has been waiting in CSF for those three years, but we couldn't actually move forward on it until the discipline was final. At that point, we put it in the queue for the attorneys to work on, and that's when we try and start tracking how long it's taking us to handle the case. In 2018, the average time it took to resolve an application was 711 days, and that's because of the large inventory that built up during the loan modification years and all these cases have been waiting for their turn, essentially, until we had the money and the staff time to get to those cases. Uh, we're hoping that that's peaked. Um, we're, when I'm looking at my numbers, it looks like a lot of the older cases have been resolved. But we do still have some that were either waiting for discipline or were we, they were waiting for their time to, to be reviewed. We have identified that we need an increase in CSF, uh, the CSF assessment. It's currently $40 for active members. It's been that since 1989. $10 for inactive members. And it's it was calculated that a one-time fee increase of up to like $80 would help us to really catch up and get through this large inventory that we have. But any increase, of course, would help us to be able to pay the victims more quickly. Uh, here we see the different performance metrics that CSF um, has to measure our workload and our performance. Um, we provide status updates to all applicants twice a year. Uh, it's usually, it can be more than that because people will often call on their cases, but we do do a mass status uh, update to all of the applicants twice a year. We track the number of applications that are paid annually and we ensure the timely and accurate budget allocations for the office. We'll be developing and monitoring annual benchmarks for the number of cases to resolve each year based on the budget that we have. And as we transition to this new process where the commission will function as more of an appellate body, we're going to be monitoring benchmarks to track improvements in the efficiencies under this new process. And we will continue to monitor the length of time it takes from CSF jurisdiction, like I said, which is usually final discipline, until the resolution of the cases. Thank you. I'm going to do these next couple slides before we move on to admissions. If somebody could advance, you could advance it, Lori. 
Okay, so in addition to the metrics that have been developed for specific offices within the discipline system and really within the state bar, for the discipline system, the board has also established system-wide metrics. And what I'm presenting to you here does not include updated data, and it is a set of PowerPoints that some of you have seen before, but I think it's important to... Uh, revisit them. So at a system-wide level, there are really two key considerations that for the first time we will be measuring and reporting on. One is recidivism, and you heard uh, Terry mention this when she talked about the Office of Probation. This is a concept, obviously, that's very uh, robustly um, studied in the criminal justice system, but of course, because we do have our own mini court system, judicial system here, it's a very relevant concept for us as well. And it's a system-wide metric because we have uh, folks who are going through many offices within our system, OCTC, a State Bar Court, the Office of Probation, and ADP, the substance abuse, a court-ordered substance abuse treatment component of the Lawyer Assistance Program. In addition to recidivism, we are also really interested in measuring procedural fairness. Uh, this is a concept that is a really important one for any uh, judicial system to um, uh, invoke or implement. And it's one that's really getting at this question of whether or not people who come into contact with our system feel that they've been treated fairly. It's a different question from, do you agree with the outcome, but do you feel like you are given an opportunity to be heard, uh, and do you understand the results of, of what occurred? And so, of course, that's also a system-wide metric impacting folks who touch uh, the state bar through many of our various offices. So this data, again, has not been updated from what was presented to the board maybe six or eight months ago, but I thought it was worth revisiting. This is our initial look at our recidivism data, um, and this is looking at uh, recidivism based on uh, two different measures, a new complaint received in the Office of the Chief Trial Counsel or complaints moving to pre-filing. So you can see uh, the on the... Um, bottom axis, which is the x-axis, I believe I forgot all my algebra. On that axis, you have the days following the disposition. So it goes from zero days out to 500, so a little over a year. And then the recidivism rate up on the y-axis. One of the things that's really interesting from this, both of these graphs, is that you can see that there's a confluence of uh, recidivism rates between cases that were dismissed uh, outright versus those where stipulation was entered into. Uh, that's a flag for any system that something is perhaps not working. Uh, you shouldn't have the same recidivism result for, for situations where a case was dismissed as you do for a case where stipulation was entered into. So that's something that we'll need to be taking a look at. Uh, obviously, when you move on to pre-filing, that is cases where there is some actual evidence there to support the complaint that was received, but you again see that very similar recidivism rate uh, for cases with stipulation versus dismissal. Yeah. Sorry, can I just make sure I'm reading that right? So that says of people who were who had a complaint filed against them, a complaint was dismissed within a year and a half, 50% of them had another complaint filed? Right, it's, it's actually um, worse than that. This is a folks who have received discipline within that those time frames. So if you go out to 500 days, 50% of those have had a new complaint filed against them. So our, and, and this really aligns with some other data that we've been looking at in terms of um, there, there are certain population of folks who are getting multiple complaints throughout their careers. And so our system is really comprised, the, our workload really centers on kind of a core group of attorneys. And as you start to look at the data, you see that. So have you dug any deeper into that to see like at certain kinds of cases where the people come back or certain people who handled them or, you know, like are there any common, I mean, that's a huge number, that's great. Right. It is. We are um, doing better than CDCR, the 
California Department of Corrections, they do have 70% recidivism okay. rate. So we're doing better than that. It's However, good to know that the attorneys are slightly <laughs> better than the felons. However, but, okay. um, no, I think that this is an area where, frankly, because of um, workload issues, many competing priorities, we haven't done enough digging into it, and we absolutely need to. Yeah. Um, because it's, again, it drives your workload. And it's the same yeah. people keep coming right. back. Yeah, you, uh, you need to figure that, it out. It'll yeah. eventually pay your workload. And, and do a better job. And about how many people are we talking about? Is it, is it a big universe of the same people? Um, that's a great question. I don't think, I, I don't, I can't pretend to know what, how many years this data set represents, but I think every year we discipline about six, seven, eight, nine hundred attorneys between disbarments and um, suspensions. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many people it is. In, in the aggregate terms, typically um, when we look at this data, we're looking at cohorts of 10 years worth of attorneys, 10 years worth of data. So the numbers can be quite large. I can't tell you off the top of my head how many this represents. Leah, are we, are we, Leah, are we uh, tracking the, um, I guess, the practice areas that these complaints are being received in? Um, or, or Brandon asked if Brandon asked if we're tracking practice areas. I don't believe Melanie. That's that's information that we track. Um, we will just on a completely different note, and I do want to move us on. Um, but we have recently launched. We're going to talk about this in the diversity panel new surveys on my state bar profile we will be capturing um, practice area although practice type solo uh, small firm government attorney etc through that vehicle and then the, that information will be tied to an attorney's bar number so that we would be able to ultimately do that kind of analysis in the with respect to these statistics so quickly moving on to the other system-wide metric, uh, procedural fairness. Last year, we launched surveys uh, that we distribute currently only to complaining witnesses. Uh, by the end of February, I hope that we uh, have deployed a similar set of surveys for respondents because, again, everybody should think the system's fair and not just the complaining witnesses. Um, but these are the questions that we are asking of folks. We send this survey out. Uh, when they receive the closing letter. Um, and you can see on the screen, there are access questions and there are fairness questions. You can see where we're rated high, uh, easy to find the complaint form, and where we're rated fairly low, uh, the communication that I received actually addressed my issue. Um, so this is, again, the, a really important and rich data set. We've gotten quite, our ends are much higher now uh, since ORIA and OCTC worked together to start sending these surveys out uh, electronically in, in a format that really could uh, result in complaining witnesses uh, responding more easily to the survey. We have a lot of data, so sort of similarly to the recidivism comment that I made, we just haven't been able to invest uh, the time that we need to dig into it and then uh, figure out what our response is going to be to what the data tells us. Any questions on procedural fairness? All right, so the next steps with all of this, CMS is go live February 11th. Uh, the new metrics for the uh, discipline offices will be used to build the RAD reports and other reporting that we do. Certainly, you'll see them in the annual discipline report. As I mentioned, the procedural fairness survey will begin to be distributed to respondents by the end of February. And updated recidivism and survey will be presented to the board in March, and we will work with RAD to begin to develop goals for each of the areas. The first step is obviously collecting the data. Then you need to set goals in, in order to hold ourselves accountable. So with that, let's move on to admissions. All right, good morning. I'm Amy Nunez, Director of, of the uh, Office of Admissions, and I'm going to start with a description of some of the functions that are carried out by our office. Thank you. 
So to start, um, our office is responsible for uh, developing, administering, and grading the different exams. Uh, this includes the California Bar Exam that's administered twice a year in February and July. The first year law exam that's administered also twice a year in June and in October. And the legal specialization exam that is uh, administered every other year with the, in, along in conjunction with the October first year exam. And uh, this year is a legal special exa examination uh, uh, cycle. Um, and with that, I also want to remind the board that um, the Office of Admissions sends out badges and list of um, our test locations for every bar exam. We have one coming up, like as I mentioned, in February on the 26th and um, 25th and 26th. And uh, you should anticipate receiving those badges. And I encourage you to uh, come and observe um, the work that's carried out by our office. Uh, the Office of Admissions also accredits um, uh, or the state bar regulates um, 15 Cal accredited law schools and 19 registered law schools across the state. Moral character determinations are also processed through the Office of Admissions. Approximately 6,800 applications are filed yearly, and that includes extension applications. We also oversee the um, special admissions programs. Um, here, um, let me uh, describe the multi-jurisdictional practice um, classifications include registered in-house counsel, registered legal services attorneys, and eventually registered um, uh, military spouse attorneys. And what these programs are, are programs that allow attorneys that are not formally admitted to uh, be licensed in California, but that meet other criteria that deem them eligible to practice under certain restrictions um, and when certain criteria are met. Now, the Office of Admissions also has other special, pro uh, special admissions programs. For example, the State Bar's Practical Training of Law Students, PTLS, is a program that certifies law students to provide legal services under supervision of an attorney and with permission from the dean of their law school. We also have the Out-of-State Attorney Arbitration Council and Pro Hoc Vice. Um, these cases must registered with the State Bar, and that's run through um, the Office of Admissions. Lastly, the uh, office also oversees the legal specialization. So the State Bar, via the uh, California Board of Legal Specialization, certifies a specialist in 11 areas. And the goal of that program is twofold, um, to provide public protection, which um, gives consumers an independent means to verify an attorney's qualifications, as well as assuring attorney competence in these areas. The Office of Admissions has 64 staff, 40 in San Francisco, and 24 in Los Angeles. Now, um, I'm also going to talk about AIMS. This is the case management system that's repla replacing the AS400. Um, this initiative stems from the strategic uh, plan goal two, objective N, that provides that, uh, for greater transparency, accountability, efficiency, and access that we develop and deploy a new case management system for the Office of Admissions by June 2019, and we will be, achieve that goal. And um, I'll let you, uh, I'll walk you through the schematic. So um, as you can see there, that's the actual AS400 screen itself. Uh, the DOS base that um, Melanie referred to, or we all uh, uh, have talked about at some point. And uh, the way the information flows right now, um, you see that corner where it says ZAP. ZAP is a third-party vendor that we use that accepts applications for, uh, for, uh, for each bar exam and for um, the first-year exam, as well as moral character applications. So. When somebody applies for, the, for either of these, the bar exam or uh, a moral character, they are launched from our website to ZAP, and that requires um, eventually for us to integrate that data back into the AS400. It's a manual process that's conducted daily. CBG is our uh, Cal, Cal, grade barter, uh, Cal bar grader system. This is a homegrown system that's used to capture exam scores and eventually scores, uh, stores the weights of the final the, for the final calculation of bar exam scores. So um, 
again, when that is completed in CBG, that data then needs to be transferred into the AS400. This is a schematic of our current system. Uh, we also accept paper applications, and um, we have some programs that are entirely right now on paper applications. Again, this includes the MJP that I've re referred to earlier, our Pro Hoc Vice, um, our testing accommodations. These all come to us in paper applications, and staff eventually enter some critical data into the AS400, so it's truly a manual process. Our AIM system that um, is under development and uh, will be launched in February um, is a Salesforce cloud system, which means that it can be accessed from the internet, and as a Salesforce platform, it is secure. Now, um, I mentioned that the previous system is entirely accessed by, um, uh, sorry, let me show you. In the previous system, the AS400 is entirely accessed by um, staff. Um, the applicants access um, don't have access to AS400, they access ZAP, and that's how the data comes in. So it's um, the tr the tr essentially the true user is staff internally. Under AIMS, people will have, uh, we have multiple users. So applicants will have a portal, portal that they can log into to access the same cloud-based system that our staff will um, access. Graders, these are graders for the bar exam, the uh, legal specialization exam, or the first year exam, will also be able to access in the AIMS system. Right now, graders are uh, do, do it in CBG, as I mentioned earlier. Exam developers will also be able to access the AIMS system, and obviously our staff. The data migration that I'm referring to here is um, each of these are gonna be automated, so interfaces are being built. The licensee database I'm referring to here is the AS400. The Department of Justice and DMV data that we collect now um, are going to also be interfaced and integrated into the AIMS system. MPRE scores uh, will also be interfaced. Information related to the MBE and NCBE will be uh, automatically interfaced, as well our, as SLIMS results. And SLIMS is our system for looking at child support obligations, um, which is a requirement for licensing. So essentially, within our cloud-based system, what we're gonna have is actual case information, account information, um, exam enrollment, applicant information and history, our contracts, our exam sessions, our scores, grades, and applications are all gonna sit in one central database. Now, I wanna highlight that there are a host of improvements that the AIMS system is going to bring, but there's two that I wanna point out today. One is the um, external users are currently asked to access ZAP to register for the bar exam, and then, or to submit their moral character application. And then to determine the status of that application, they have to go back now to the AS400 to look into that portal to determine the status of their application. With AIMS, the system will automatically, um, uh, the status of each of these applications will automatically appear in the applicant portal. So it's a more automated process. Applicants do not have to go to more than one uh, uh, system to find uh, their, application or the application status. Also, I want to highlight that for staff, AIMS eliminates multiple steps that require currently require hard copy documentation. For example, I talked about how testing accommodations have a paper application. So we wait through snail mail for applications to come in as well as sub substantive documentation. This um, is medical uh, information. And we require that um, currently by mail. Um, so it adds a lot of time in the processing of these applications. For moral character, the actual application starts in ZAP, but has to be printed because we need a wet signature this, in our current process for uh, the release and authorization so that we're able to contact law schools and, uh, and previous employers. So we, um, in our current system, AIMS is going to allow for um, e-signatures and for the uploading of documents. So with that capacity, we'll, we will reduce a lot of the paper and facilitate timely processing. So essentially, the system is going to improve service delivery to applicants and create a self-service station where, uh, provide, that will provide applicants the ability to answer all applications online 
Um, we won't need any physical documents um, unless um, some of them are required with first seal. For example, certificates of good standing are often, uh, we need to see the seal in order to uh, uh, ensure that we have an official document. But also, it'll allow everybody the ability to view the status of their applications all within the same portal. This will also reduce the number of calls and inquiries that staff get on a daily basis, which will allow staff to concentrate on core business needs and improve overall responsiveness um, to our applicants. All right, so now I'm going to shift gears and talk about the bar exam studies. The bar exam studies align with strategic uh, plan goal two, objective P, which requires that the state bar conduct a California-specific job analysis to determine, to determine the knowledge, skills, and abilities and then to, uh, required for an attorney, and then to conduct a new content validation study. So with that, I'm going to talk about some of the um, studies that have been completed. So as you may recall, in 2017, the Chief Justice directed the California State Bar to examine the decline in bar passage rates. And the State Bar embarked on four separate studies, three of which were completed in 2017, uh, the last in 2018. And then I'm going to talk about the uh, current um, undertaking that we have. So the first is the recent performance changes in the California Bar Exam. Uh, this used admissions data to evaluate the historical pattern of the California bar exam pass rate and changes in applicant uh, characteristics. The study relied on three cohorts of data, uh, one collected in 2008, 2012, and 2016, and it observed the following changes over this nine-year period. The results uh, determined that the number of test takers declined by 6%, including an 11% decline in the July test takers and a 4% increase in February examinees. So, um, and our numbers always vary uh, between July and February, just as a reminder. So also, the distribution of examinees shifted, where traditionally higher performing groups, uh, they make it up proportionately less of the total test takers over this period. For the July bar exams, uh, the overall average uh, total scale score, so um, that's referred to as a TSS, and the bar passage rate dropped between 2008 and 2016, <laughs> and it declined. the average TSS declined 66 points, so from 1481 to 1415 points, uh, and the percentage passing was lower in 2016 than in 2018, uh, 2008. Uh, there were less pronounced decreases also that occurred in, in the February uh, bar exams. So um, the findings suggested that there are other under intervening variables um, that may be impacting the bar exam performance. And as a result, the state bar has also decided to uh, embark on a study that merges bar exam uh, performance data with individual student credentials. And that's the study that, were, uh, that uh, was released in 2018. So uh, let me wrap up the, the next studies. The second study, the standard setting study, focused on analysis on the appropriate pass line or the cut score. The study concluded that the setting is uh, for that setting the passing score at a combined scale score between 1388 and 1504 would meet the standard uh, required for the expected no level of knowledge, abilities, and skills required for entry level attorneys. And it was based on a job analysis that was performed by the National Conference of Bar Examiners in 2012. As a result, this, the cut scores remain the same at 1440. Now, the next study is a content validation study. Um, and this uh, study was completed, again, in 2017. It sought to examine the overlap between what's measured on the bar exam and what's the critical knowledge required for entry-level attorneys. The process of content validation involves determining the exam content and, and ensuring that it aligns with job-related uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities, and tasks. The study suggests that the content of the examination matches the job-related expectations of the practice of law. Um, so essentially, that California, the California bar exam aligns with the job knowledge expected of entry-level attorneys. And then the last study here on that I'm going to uh, uh, talk about is the um, content validation study. This is a study that um, uh, looked at the decline in the California bar exam performance. 
um, and it used detailed data of over 7,000 students from 11 ABA law schools. And it used detailed information um, for uh, in 2017, 13, and six, I'm sorry, 2013 and 16. Uh, where the pass rate fell from 56% to 43%. Uh, the pass rate rebounded slightly to 50%, um, and it declined again in July. So uh, the basic findings for this performance changes on the California bar exam, again, this is a study that merged student credentials with the pass rate. Um, they found, uh, the study found the following, that changes in, uh, over time in the characteristics of exam takers accounted only for some of the decline in bar exam performance um, during that study period. The study found that these changes accounted for somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of the decline in the bar, performance, bar exam performance during that study period, depending on the performance metric chosen and the year that it was compared. <coughs> The two student characteristics that most strongly predict performance on the California bar exam are a student's GPA in the final year of law school and a student's LSAT score. Also, changes over time in entering credentials so, um, and law school credentials contributed roughly or equally to that portion of the decline in the bar performance attributable to changes in student characteristics during that same period. Uh, also, the proportion of test takers who were ethnic minorities or female grew slightly over the study period, but the study found no correlation between these demographic characteristics and pass-fail uh, outcomes uh, among students with similar abilities. Ultimately, the study was unable to account for a substantial amount of decline in pass rates, concluding that there are might be, may be other unexamined factors that may contribute to the decrease in bar performance. With that, I'm going to get to the last um, study that we are undertaking now. So this uh, study currently under development at the State Bar is the uh, California-based job analysis, referred to as a California Attorney Practice Analysis, CAPA. Uh, just to jog everybody's memory about a what a job analysis does, this body of research examines the expected skill set of attorneys, uh, of entry-level attorneys. The one uh, content, validate, uh, content validation study that was, uh, based on, was based on a 2012 job analysis that I referred to that was conducted by the National Conference of Bar Examiners. And the thought was that it may or may not uh, mirror the current um, skills expected of a California attorney. And as a result, the uh, state bar decided to conduct a California-based study. Um, the goals of the study, again, are to include, uh, to ensure that the exam content is related to the job knowledge and skills required of entry-level attorneys to provide a documented link between the exam content and current legal practice, to also assess the adequacy of the exam format in, um, in testing requisite knowledge and skills, and also to provide a blueprint for uh, question development and selection. And lastly, to inform the development of a minimum competence definition for a standard setting um, in the future. So where this study is now, uh, we've had one working group meeting that was held in um, December, and the next is scheduled for February 26th, and re uh, researchers aspire to have this study completed by 2019. So thank you. And just really quickly, we have the productive mindset intervention uh, there, and we expect to be getting those results eminently. Then the next week, the board should be, receive uh, the executive summary from the researchers. And I'm really looking forward to sharing that with all of you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Any questions? Right. Uh, with that, oh. go ahead, Mark. A couple of questions. Is that study that you just talked about concerning the bar exam, is that published or have you written it up? Yes, um, it was published in um, December of uh, at the end of the um, at the end of December, so it's available on our website. Oh, okay. Yes. I'll look at that. <laughs> I had a question about the um, client security fund. It just it just occurred to me. Uh, you talked about jurisdiction only attaching after the disciplinary proceedings are finished. Is there not a way to to um, to do those two processes? In other words, the disciplinary process and the Determination about the client security fund. Um, isn't there a way to perhaps do that at the same time? I mean, 
we've been talking about the criminal justice system and what I think an analogy would be that when somebody is convicted of a crime, there's an assessment done about restitution. I realize this isn't a restitution issue, but at the time that person gets their judgment, there is a determination about sentence, of course, and then there's a determination about what is the restitution amount. It just occurs to me that instead of waiting to the end of the disciplinary process, perhaps um, that determination could perhaps be made so that at the time disciplinary um, the discipline is um, you know, imposed on that attorney, you have a determined amount in that process. So then you wouldn't have to wait. You wouldn't have two separate systems. Just a thought. Um, we do rely on the investigations that are done by the Office of the Chief Trial Counsel if we can. So we try not to recreate everything if we don't have to. But some of that issue um, can't be resolved because they might only need 15 cases to disbar an attorney, and we have 100 applications filed against that attorney. So there's still going to be um, an, an amount of work that we can't do until we find out what happens to the attorney in the discipline process. Um, also, I mean, if we investigate the case and do it all and do up the workup, and then the attorney doesn't end up getting disbarred, we can't proceed anyway, and we've done all the work on the case now when we're not going to be able to reimburse because that main requirement for discipline hasn't been met. Uh, so it's, uh, we, you know, we do our best to try and keep up on the cases so that if we see somebody is about to be disbarred that we can try and get moving. But we try not to do too much of the work ahead of time because it might end up being that it doesn't end up being fruitful because the, the cases don't end up resulting in discipline. So there's kind of a, a balance we try and strike on that. Not to mention that we're trying to work on the older cases that we do have discipline on, and we don't necessarily have the staff to be looking at the cases that are waiting uh, as we're kind of going through the whole inventory of work. We, we do have an, um, in 2018, we hired a new attorney for the office, and he does focus on cases as they come in the door to try and look at, does this even gonna, is this even gonna qualify for reimbursement? If it's not, then we try and handle that earlier on in the process. And he does also look at what's happening with the discipline at the time. So we kind of have a heads up on what we think might be coming down the line. But again, we still do have to wait for it to be final to actually move forward with the cases. So um, it's, again, it's a, sort of a balance. Thank you. Ruben? Jason, I have a quick question for Melanie, if I could. Sure. On the um, unauthorized practice of law, vertical integrated team approach that you talked about, you mentioned there was one lead attorney how many attorneys support that lead? There are three additional attorneys. Three additional, okay, and then one further question on that. You mentioned that um, at times we've had to go in and take files, and sometimes there are hundreds or thousands of files in, I'm assuming, one notario's office. Do you have any sense of the scope of affected individuals you know, in a given year? How many files are we talking about, essentially, is what I'm asking. Well, I, you know, it, it does vary. Um, and so there are some, I would say at least every year we have some large scale assumption, which would include thousands of files, but I couldn't give you a specific number. Any other questions? Great, thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, we're gonna take a, a short break. Uh, before I do that, I did neglect to take public comment. Uh, if there's anyone out in the public wishing to make public comment, please do so now. With uh, no one stepping forward, uh, let's take a five minute break. Uh, I, I do wanna know we are a little behind by 30 minutes, so please adjust accordingly for the next presentations. Thank you.
All right, everyone, we're going to get started. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. If you, if you could take your seats. All right, hi, it's uh, Jason Lee again. A um, couple logistics. Uh, we're going to start off our first uh, panel on diversity and inclusion. And I'm going to turn it over to Debbie. I'm going to make the important decision on lunch. All right, so this is how we're going to do it. It's out there. So when you're hungry, you can get up and get your lunch. I'm not going to take a break. So. Yes, yes, right. Efficiency, efficiency. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm okay. waiting on... Okay, we're ready to Debbie? go. Okay. I guess I'm waiting on Debbie. Okay. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah. All right, Debbie. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started on... Um, our panel for diversity and inclusion. And we'll start with the, um, the reason why we're here and why do we have to have a, why have a panel on diversity and inclusion for the state bar. So you can see the first slide has the, um, the mission statement that the bar adopted in 2017. So some of these slides, I think you guys kind of know, so we I may not, probably won't read them. And then statutory is, Legislature also weighed in with the mission statement for the bar, and 20, which came effective 2019. So it just came effective, effective this month. And so what we're trying to do now, and what I've seen with the state bar just since I've been on the on the bar, is that the um, one thing that you have a strategic plan that you really try to hew to, which is unusual because most organizations I've ever been involved with that had a strategic plan. You know, they made it, and then when you ask them about it, they, you know, dust it off, and it's, you know, like 10 years out of date. So um, this is very, um, I'm very impressed by how the bar is working with the strategic plan and actually hewing to that strategic plan. And the only thing that I, that I see now is that um, we have a mission statement for diversity and inclusion, but we, what we haven't done yet is, um, is not just say those words, but sort of back that up with action. And so what we're plan to do with this panels today is um, we're going to have, we're going to adopt the state bar diversity goal. We're going to define what the diversity for, for the purposes of the goal. So what does diversity mean in terms of what the state bar does and what can the bar actually weigh in on in diversity? Because what we may do is um, something different than what people think because we're not going to get at the granular level. We're not going to be, you know, ground one, but what can we do? to affect um, our diversity goals. And then we're gonna discuss three distinct areas for the board to consider for new strategic plan objectives. And we'll have presenters for each one of these um, items. And we have um, Donna and her team has put together a great um, group of people to talk to you about that. So um, diversity and inclusion in the five-year plan, like I said there's been no goals and no objectives. We're going to have presenters for um, the diversity pipeline, which COHAF has been involved in for a number of years, retention and career advancement, and judicial diversity. So we're going to go ahead and get started, and hopefully we can make up some time. So we'll, we'll have the, this panel introduce themselves, and then we'll start. Good afternoon, or good morning, 
leading to afternoon. This is Leslie Cunningham. I'm the executive director of California Law, which is the nonprofit navigation arm for the Pathway to Law program. Morning. My name is Mark Shem. I'm an attorney in San Jose and I'm uh, chair of the Early Education Committee uh, with COAF. And I'll start off by talking about the diversity pipeline. As you know, COAF was created in 2007 to be uh, your think tank on diversity issues. The pipeline is an educational avenue to encourage students to follow a legal career by focusing on educational programs and curriculum. We have what we going from high school, community college, to four-year colleges to law school, which is often known as, uh, in addition to the law academies, two plus two plus three. And I'd like to leave you with a thought, or start with a thought, that a key to diversity is in civics education and education as a whole. The, uh, starting off with high school, we have what, uh, the California Partnership Academy, which is a joint program funded by the State Department of Education, no state bar funds, and they oversee a variety of uh, academies implemented through local school districts and they're statewide and they focus on 15 career paths. Students must be at least 50% at risk and in a public high school with enrollment of at least 350 students. There are other law academy models but not the ones that we use here in California and uh, Leslie you want to talk briefly about the partnership with law academies? Very happy to. Thank you, Mark. The law academies were created uh, in order to marry the CPA model, a career partnership academy model. At the time in 2007, there were no academies for the legal profession. And so uh, Ruthie Ashley, who is on our board of directors and who is the executive director emeritus for California law, started the law academy program so that in the high schools, with the education code, the uh, industry, that would be obviously attorneys and judges, could come into the uh, public schools and according to the ed code, 50% at risk or school lunch program, which is right in the sweet spot of diversity for uh, our California students. And the power of the Law Academy model is that the uh, introduction to uh, legal education starts as early as ninth grade. And we find that by the time they are uh, uh, finishing in 12th grade that students who thought they would never have a college uh, education are now uh, very confident to pursue college careers and law careers. Uh, COAF itself has been running several initiatives to, to assist the law academies. Uh, we have previously sponsored a essay contest on legal issues with cash prizes, uh, but we have discontinued it this last year because of uh, not enough students were participating. We've also uh, have a want to be a lawyer brochure that we have for the schools and passing out to the community. We have a Know Your Rights pro uh, program, which in, in educates students on the proper responses and interactions when getting uh, and encountering law enforcement. We hope to uh, ensure that students are safe and, and foster a partnership with law enforcement and invo avoid involvement in the juvenile justice system. Uh, the, that program consists of a DVD and then we also prepared an outline for the uh, presenters to go throughout the communities. Uh, part of our legal, and also we also pr help pr recruit uh, the local advisory councils for these schools. Each school has an on-site advisory council made up of lawyers, judges, and other members of the community. And COAF has been instrumental in providing uh, advisors for these, uh, pro, uh, each of these academies. A little statistic there. You want to comment on that, Leslie? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, what we have found is with a CPA uh, introduction, you can see what happens with the percentage of graduates that will meet a UC or CSU college entrance requirement. Without uh, the CPA introduction, you can see those numbers are quite dramatic in terms of their difference. So we know that CPAs work. 
We have the support of the governor. We have the support of the uh, state superintendent of education. Just that little statistic. Law academies uh, are even more powerful with regard to students who uh, go on to graduate and meet the UC standards. Uh, here we have the slide. It talks about the graduates, 12th grade enrollment. So the graduation rate is a, a dramatic improvement when we are able to provide law academies uh, and uh, have our students go on into uh, college and pursue law degrees. I had also forgot to mention another program that COAF has been working on is uh, civic engagement. As I said earlier, possibly the key to diversity is through civic engagement and activism. We are trying to develop a program or curriculum for our academies in which students engage in an annual uh, civic action project. It would be tied to at least three lessons in the classroom, followed up by an, a program that they would create themselves. We're still fleshing out the details on that. Uh, also, uh, COAF has suggested creating a messaging board system for all these academies for them, the teachers, to communicate some good and bad practices that they've encountered, and we're still working on that. All righty. And as you can see here, we have um, what's it, 20, 22. 22 academies currently and still growing, which leads to the community college pathway. We have, what is it? 26. 26 community colleges uh, that are involved. The community colleges uh, take uh, students from the, partner uh, from the law academies, provide counseling and mentoring opportunities. Upon successful completion, their transcript will have California Pathway Scholar as a designation. After completing certain course requirements as well as other general educations, they are qualified to uh, enroll and matriculate to a four-year university. And we have, I believe, is it eight, eight four-year universities that have agreed to take uh, our Pathway uh, Scholars. And then from there, we have certain law schools. How many do we have now? Eight. Eight <laughs> law schools that have also agreed to take scholars as well. And uh, Mark's doing a great job. One of our uh, awesome advisory council members and members of COAF. <coughs> I work in this every day. So as we add uh, high school law academies and as we add college partners and law school partners, uh, that's why I know the numbers immediately because we're adding them all the time. So Mark's doing a great job with that. But what we have put together is a pathway to law with 26 members of our coalition community colleges eight universities and their law schools, four in the north, four in the south. So our U four UC system schools are UCLA, UC Irvine, UC Davis, and UC Berkeley. And our private institutions are Santa Clara, USC, Loyola, and uh, University of San Francisco. And the commitment that we have from these uh, law schools include priority consideration and the waiving of their uh, uh, application fees, and that is per the MOU that all of these institutions have signed to become a partnership uh, pathway pipeline network for uh, bringing the students through. Now, according to the MOU, community college students can graduate and go to any undergraduate institution. That is very powerful in the sense that uh, students who choose to go out of state, and typically we have now had partnerships with HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities, who are very interested in this program happening in California. They are offering our students free tuition simply because they have the certification here with the California Law Pathway. And then they can come back and go to our California law schools, any one of our eight partner law schools. But in addition to that, we have affiliate law schools that because we have certified them at the community college level, are only happy to uh, have California law certified students come to their schools, and they do recruit heavily for those students as well. So that's the, the meat of the pathway uh, to law program. And we have some uh, uh, interesting opportunities that the state bar can partner with us. Right now, our data is uh, fairly anecdotal. We're able to take from each community college uh, the information that they provide for, to us from the 
faculty champions, which by the MOU, each university, uh, each college program rather has to have. But what we would like to do is be able to be in control of this data that as the students enroll in the uh, Pathway to Law program, we have that data and can track them all along the way throughout all of these systems, community college, undergrad, and law school, so that even if they go out of state, even if they don't go to one of our Pathway undergrad programs, we still know where they are so that we can see how they go all the way through to bar passage. All right. Okay. Okay. Why don't we stop there for okay. a second? Uh, a little more on the advisory councils. The uh, state bar and COAF is uniquely qualified to help recruit additional uh, members for the advisory councils. And as we create uh, more partnership academies, there's more need for attorneys and judges in these uh, roles. Keep going. And there's the stats on the schools that we have. All right, Beth, that's you. All right, I'm going to talk about a bit about the uh, data that we have. And as I mentioned before, it's anecdotal. I have to get this from the faculty champions as they turn it into me. I and mean, as I said, I believe that with the ability to have students uh, give their information to us, their data to us immediately, then we can have control of that and then track them. So uh, with the launch of the Pathway to Law in 2014, 2015, eight programs launched. Eight community colleges launched their programs. Even though at the time we had 24 community colleges signed to the MOU, the community colleges then have to find faculty, they have to find their funding, and put their entire program together. So for the 2014-15 academic year, eight programs launched. They were able to have 96 students to enroll uh, they were able to formulate five advisory councils, and that is what California law helps them to do, formulate advisory councils. And that uh, resulted in 48 volunteers from the bench and the bar and resulted in 10 internships. As we go along, uh, you can see that it increased with uh, programs launching, internships, volunteers, and now we have scholarships coming. So the very existence of the pathway to law brings such a wealth of other resources for these students that uh, create opportunities for them. I noticed on your um, chart here that last year the internships, it's only 13, do you not have um, the latest data or? Correct, that's to date. And their internships typically take place in the spring. So 13 internships have taken place just since the start of the fall. And then they usually have their internships in the spring. So that's why that number, it will increase. Uh, later in the year. And I want to point out that these programs are not funded by the State Bar. They have separate entities that are uh, hosting them and maintaining them. Uh, we, COAF and through the State Bar have been assisting these programs, which leads me to the... Let's keep going. And, and so uh, just to point out, as Leslie was saying, the, the data uh, is anecdotal. Um, and, um, and it's sort of not a longitudinal study, so we know that for example, um, that there were 704 students in the program in 2017, 2018, 936 students in the program uh, for the 2018, 2019 school year. What we don't know is how many of those are overlapping. Did everybody who was in the program in 2017, 18 continue in the program in 2018, 19 if they hadn't yet completed their community college uh, coursework? Or did they drop out of the program? Are these, are these new people? That, that's the kind of information that, um, that Leslie was talking about that you know, we've talked about in the past would really benefit from um, being able to track longitudinally, as well as those who are entering the partnership academies in high school, the law, the law partnership academies, tracking them through the community college programs and, and law school as well. As well as the impact of law academies versus a student that didn't attend a law academy but got into the law pathway program in community college. The impact of uh, a workforce uh, situation for a student that completed their bachelor's degree, did they take a hiatus before going into law school? What is the impact of bar passage from the time we see a student go into the uh, 
go into a law academy. So we'll be able to analyze all of that data, uh, particularly when we're able to have demographic data as well, the first, uh, first generation college attendees. But even with our anecdotal information, it is a powerful program. It is making a difference. It is galvanizing the community college world, galvanizing the university world, and other states are watching us. So we're really, really proud to say we have 298 Law Pathway Scholars, 298 that we have been able to identify that have completed their seven required course pattern in community college and have been certified by California law. Uh, and the inaugural classes at each program also get a certificate from the state bar. So the students are really, really ex excited to include that in their admissions packages to undergraduate institutions and law schools. One thing, one thing I wanted to add to this, and we talked about this a little bit, is that even though the kit, the program is set up for, for, for the students to go through community college, what about those students who went through the pathway in high school who went straight to a four-year school? Those kids, you probably had an impact on those kids as well. Absolutely. They, they, they just didn't go to community college, and probably they may have been stars and, and received scholarships to go to a four-year school, go directly to a four-year school. And should track those as well, because to me, those would be a success as well. Absolutely. As having been in the program and be able to track, to sort of keep track a little bit of where those kids end up at. They went straight to four-year and then maybe went on to law school. Uh, some final thoughts of what the state bar can do and what mm -hmm. the board can do as far as helping with the pipeline. A dedicated support staff uh, to help fill the void that Pat Lee, which I don't think we can ever replace, uh, but try to fill that void. Financial supportive programs. Well, what do I mean by that? Co-sponsorships. Right now, they're the uh, California Law Academy Support Council and the Pathway to Law Summit. Those are two separate programs that have been combined in the past. The state bar has helped by providing conference room space, uh, helping make copies for the programs, uh, taking registration fees online, uh, doing th little things like that, uh, and of course, trying to be uh, monetarily neutral and not run a deficit. Uh, the state bar has a lot of cachet, and when it supports programs like these, people listen. So you bring credibility to these programs. Mm -hmm. And of course, assisting with the advisory councils. Uh, we hope to have more across the state, and that using the state bar's resources to help identify proper mentors and advisors. And of course, increasing diversity in the pipeline means outreach and promoting uh, the ongoing programs and what is happening. And of course, the all-important collecting of data to determine are these programs reaching and doing what we need them to do. Um, and there are always going to be need to create and revise programs and curricula, which I think COAF and the State Bar, given its unique reach, is, is an, has, plays an important role in ongoing diversity issues. With that, um, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Any questions? <clears throat> Comments? So I had a question um, relating to the, the genesis of the California law program. Uh, essentially, who came up with the idea, who was involved, if you can describe if the State Bar was involved in what way? Yes, that was uh, Tui Nguyen, who uh, got involved with COAF uh, and is currently the president of Foothill College, made history being the first uh, person of Vietnamese descent to be a president of a community college. But at the time was uh, counsel for the community college district. And in her activities with COAF, realized that there was no program to really help students go into the legal profession from the community college level. The law academies were already in existence. And certainly Ruthie Ashley was working very heavily with that. But then Twee and Ruthie began to talk, and then Twee was the architect of the Pathway to Law from Community College. Then Ruthie's program and Twee's program married together, and now we have the Pathway all the way through. Sonia? And then Brandon. Brandon first. Um, of the scholars, uh, have they graduated or have passed? Any, any of the scholars passed the bar, or are they still in school? They're still in school. In 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 route. So okay. uh, scholars who have completed, so those programs that launched in 2014, for example, okay. mm -hmm. would 
have those students finishing right around 2016, 17. They're transferring into undergrad in those at fall of 17 and fall of 18. So they're just coming through. Okay. Uh, we expect this spring to have our first law school applicants. And uh, so we will be happy to keep, uh, keep everyone abreast of that. Those who are applying to not only our partner law schools, but any law school that uh, uh, offers them uh, support. Because with the California Law uh, Pathway certification, they are very attractive to even, even other law schools. Of, of the scholars, how many are female? And I, I don't have those numbers. I only have the raw data, which is why of, of who, uh, how many there are. The demographic data is what the state bar can help us to do to be able to have them come through. Now, we do have FERPA considerations in terms of the student privacy. So I do always uh, ask for waivers. If the students sign waivers, then the uh, faculty champions can give me that information. But otherwise, it's voluntary by Thank the you. students. And, and that kind of segues into my question. Um, have you set up um, a process in which all of that data can be tracked um, along the way, you know, going from the uh, CPA to the 2 plus 2 plus 3 to, you know, these various initiatives um, as a condition of being involved in those programs? Are you making it a requirement that they report, you know, whether they passed the bar or whether they, they got into law school, any of those, those metrics? We explored two different programs that we think we could model. Uh, hopefully with the help of the State Bar, we looked at the model that UC Davis currently uses in their KHOP program. And from the moment you register, then you're assigned a number and they are able to track them through Bar Passage. The other program would be the LSAC program. Anyone who's interested in attending law school, once one registers with LSAC, they're able to hold on to you. So with those two models, what we would do is upon enrollment, and we uh, have many of our community college programs, about 20 of them currently offer one unit of credit to come to the actual orientation session. And that would be the place where we would have them uh, enroll in, in the program for data tracking, and then we can keep up with them at that point. So, and that is something that you're probably gonna be walking down in the future, or is that already, already in place? No, we, we want to do that, okay. yes. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I don't know if you know this off the top of your, your head. I'm just curious. I think you said there were eight universities that they transferred to, and eight, eight law there schools. are eight universities and their law schools okay. that I'm are part of our who, MOU. Like, who the schools were. Yeah, that's uh, UCLA, UC Irvine, UC Davis, and UC Berkeley, and then our private schools are Santa Clara, USC, Loyola, and University of San Francisco. You're welcome. Has there been any outreach to, Jason Jason nodded at me, so <laughs> I went ahead and spoke. Has there been any outreach to the um, any of the private LSAT prep companies to partner with the program? Yes. Okay. I have reached out to private LSAT uh, programs. Uh, I've explored discount, uh, volume discount for uh, California law uh, students. And so we're currently in negotiations with one of them. And it uh, looks like that could be fruitful. Uh, it all will be a function of how to uh, allocate what funding, even if for the discount, that can happen. Secondly, Khan Academy has put together free LSAT prep. So we partnered with LSAC and Khan Academy to have our students go there. Thirdly, our community colleges, those programs that can actually put an LSAT preparation class in their curriculum. We're happy to help them assist with that. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, so I want to make an observation, and perhaps I'm, I'm going to take a liberal take on uh, this idea that um, the idea of the California Law Program originated at the State Bar, or the people who were involved and volunteered at the State Bar, and developed a program that has turned into a completely separately funded entity that does not take state bar funds. So I'll distill that into an idea that the state bar can be an incubator for these ideas and then set these ideas into the world where they can take a life of 
of the drone and the success that you've had, it's an interesting model to consider as we uh, think about what we can do in this area. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Hi, my name is Carolyn Amaranti. I'm a program analyst with the Office of Research and Institutional Accountability. Um, and my role today is to walk through some of the research that is available, um, preliminary, uh, a preliminary review of the research that is available on um, specifically path uh, pipelines to the legal profession. Um, and so overall, there's a lot of information regarding pipelines. Um, and so there's a lot to cover in a very short period of time. And I also talk very quickly, so please tell me to slow down uh, if I go too quickly. Um, so, so one thing to start is that the, the pipeline is a long, a long process. We have um, programs that, can, uh, that are developed for junior high school, high school students, undergraduate, just a law school application, um, preparing for the LSAT, um, preparing for enrollment to law school, preparing for graduation from law school, the bar application alone, the bar exam, and then finally entering the workforce. Um, you can have a whole day conversation on all of these uh, different type of pipelines that exist for these different stages. Um, and the research, uh, while there is a lot of information on these different type of pipelines, um, oh, do you hear me again? Um, is limited because there's um, several articles, summaries on models, um, there's discussion on you know, what programs can be best suited for specific target populations, um, and there's several national organizations that will review um, that have played a part in these discussions and the research. Um, unfortunately, the, the literature uh, is limited on the type of data or the type of outcomes that um, address um, some of the challenges in entering, to, entering the, the, the legal profession. Um, and there was one quote out of uh, a report that we'll be going into a little bit more in the presentation that says, diversity pipeline programs aim to address achievement gaps and other obstacles that limit the number of interest, interested and qualified um, minority students entering the legal profession. And those obstacles um, include low, uh, low high school graduation rates, uh, delayed enrollment into uh, undergrad, uh, the length of time to get an undergraduate degree, um, challenges in navigating the law school application process, uh, the cost to entry into law school, um, low graduation rates, uh, low ba uh, bar passage rates, and then the lack of mentorship and career guidance. So uh, these pipeline programs um, really should be speaking and addressing these obstacles. Um, and many of them do, but there's just limited information on how they go about doing that. Um, what we do know is that there's a lot of organizations at the national level who are looking at the specific topic at pipeline. Um, the American Bar Association, as well as LSAC in 2005 took the lead in really raising awareness on the need for pipeline programs. Um, the American Bar Association has done, thank you. Uh, the American Bar Association has done um, a really good job in developing a uh, national pipeline diversity initiative directory where you can go onto uh, the ABA website and look for a pipeline or a, a, a pre-law or a, a pipeline type program that is in your uh, state. Um, the LSAC has dedicated a lot of uh, their services and programming to assisting students to get into law school, as well as collected um, a good portion of data on that. Um, there is a pre-law advisory national council plaque that is dedicated. A uh, national organization has six regional pre-law advisory associations throughout uh, the country to support pre-law advisors and support students in, in preparing for the law school application process. Um, the Council on Legal Education Opportunity, CLEO, which has been doing this work, this work um, for, since the 1960s, has over 11 programs dedicated to um, supporting uh, underrepresented populations into the legal profession. Access Lex Institute, uh, which I'll be uh, presenting some of their data on, has been working since the 1980s, really understanding um, what, is, what is needed to prepare underrepresented populations to get into the legal um, practice um, and the type of um, advocacy and data that's needed to really push those conversations forward. Um, and then the, the Association of American Law Schools is a nonprofit organization that represents over 179 law schools. Um, and their data 
um, really informs much of this work. Uh, authors, they were the authors of Before the JD, um, Undergraduate Views on Law School, where um, it demonstrated that a lot of students are very much interested in going to law school, but it's just their ability to execute that to the next level. Um, one of the issues being uh, not having someone in their immediate family that is a lawyer. Um, and then you have local bar associations, universities, as um, much of our speakers mentioned, and law firms that are doing this work. So a lot of people are doing this type of work, and there's a lot of information that's being collected. Um, where there are challenges is um, more programs are needed to address some of these achievement gaps. Um, there was a researcher uh, that, um, uh, that talked about um, the educational pipeline to law school too broken and too narrow to provide diversity. Um, this research uh, report talks about some of the, ch the achievement gaps um, that um, underrepresented populations are facing, um, which is limiting the pool that is um, readily available to, to then apply to law school. Um, as well as uh, um, some of the long-term um, challenges in transitioning from, um, say, an uh, undergraduate degree to then law school. So uh, one of the other areas is also most of existing programs are isolated. Um, they're not coordinated. You may have a, a jurisdiction that has several pipeline programs and they are not in coordination with one another. Um, so you have a duplication of efforts. Um, you may have a situation where um, programs are not uh, funded as, you know, as a systematic part of an institution, so they lose funding and there is no sustainability. Um, there's also challenges with um, just the data that's available. There's not a lot of evaluations on pipeline programs. There's ideas in terms of what factors could work and support um, underrepresented, underrepresented populations into the profession. However, there isn't uh, a lot of research and evaluations on connecting the dots of a specific program model to address the obstacles. Um, but that being said, there is information out there that we can at least um, get some insight on. Um, Access Lexis, uh, I'm sorry, Access Lex Group uh, provided a really good uh, report in 2015 that looked at 261 pipeline programs uh, throughout the country. And I apologize, the, some of the text here is really small. Um, but some key things to highlight here is that that big blue section is high school related, high school specific uh, pipeline programs. And that takes about 36% of uh, those national programs. 27.2% um, are programs that are targeted specifically to law schools only. And then 17.2% is related to just the four year undergraduate population. So there's there's large sections of pipelines that are targeted to specific populations. Um, there is limited, limited uh, research, I'm sorry, limited pipeline programs that um, support those who are returning adults, um, those who are early in the pipeline, um, say junior high school or earlier, or a combination of these. And with respect to what are the sort of the, the characteristics of these um, Pipeline programs, what do they offer? Um, some of them offer MOOC board, scholarship and financial assistance, mentoring and advising services, LSAT preparation, internship and hands-on experience, uh, study skills, tutoring, academic support, uh, student-oriented conferences, uh, summer programs, um, as well as law school and career support. Um, one thing that's, you know, to, 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 when looking at this chart, what stood out to me was that uh, those large blue boxes are programs that are targeted to high school students. Uh, the green boxes are targeted to undergraduate students. And then the orange box is dedicated to law school, a uh, law school population. Um, and one of the larger supports that are provided uh, is scholarship and financial assistance with 63% of the programs offering that type of support. Um, but uh, the t limited support in mentoring, limited support in um, internships, uh, study skills, um, as well as summer, summer uh, student-oriented conferences or summer programs, um, and career information. There is um, support also for four-year colleges or undergraduate populations across all these different factors. Um, so when 
taking a step back and trying to understand, okay, so we know there's a lot of programs out there. There's a lot of organizations that are doing this work. Um, they're targeted to high school students, law school students, um, uh, undergraduate, uh, and there's limited data on what actually does work. Um, there are some factors that contribute, uh, what the experts say contribute to at least a, a successful approach to a, to a pipeline program. Um, and one of that includes academic support, um, really looking at how uh, the student or the person who is going into, whether it's high school, uh, sorry, undergraduate or law school, um, is prepared for the rigor of a, uh, of a rigorous uh, law, a law school curriculum, um, as well as supporting the motivation um, through recognition. And, and one thing that stood out in the research for uh, black students that are in law school um, really being able to um, support that population in understanding how to um, really speak to their confidence and their intelligence while um, at times feeling isolated in, in um, their environment. Um, there's preparation for LSAT, law school and bar passage, um, and then preparation for the legal career, networking and uh, mentoring opportunities. So these are common things that are in the research that experts are saying that a pipeline program should have. Um, a note on the mentoring program, on mentoring opportunities, um, they really looked at, the research really said, you know, you should, really should have mentoring at every stage of the pipeline. Um, and it should be part of um, developing long-term relationships with um, the mentor and the mentee. Um, but these mentoring programs can be a bit of a challenge to implement um, and without successful monitoring and evaluation to, to one, train uh, the mentee and the mentor on what to expect. Um, some of these programs can quickly fall apart. Um, and, and so these are four areas. The other areas to cons that the um, research highlights is uh, some things that are a bit more unique to the program of, of a pipeline, which is a pipeline program should be very strategic and have specific goals, both short-term but very much long-term goals. Um, there has to be a cross-program partnership. Um, in the health field, they have models of uh, continuum of care uh, where they would follow the individual from the start of the participation to the program all the way to the end of the service that they receive. And in, in that respect, uh, these pipeline programs should have that continuum approach um, where uh, once the, the, the participant is involved in a series of programs, um, they can transition to different education levels um, and then eventually make them their way into law school and graduation, but still having the support throughout all stages of the process and even after, to the extent that they're so engaged that they would want to continue to support the program. Essentially, the, you know, the success of the participant is the success of the pipeline program. Um, and then regular data collection and evaluation. Uh, this is really key here, one, because the, the research uh, has really communicated strongly that there's a lot of pipeline programs, but there's limited data on what works um, and being able to evaluate it and demonstrate in the evaluation um, that these programs are having some type of impact on addressing these obstacles is, is very key. Um, in talking with a doc, a Dr. Aaron Reeves, who um, provided some insight on the conversation we'll have later on regarding career and retention, she made an interesting point about there's a lot of people who want to do diversity, but they don't know uh, what diversity is. And one of the things that she does is help them understand what the market is, what is where is their need, and how does that diversity program address that need? Um, and I think that's a good segue into the data component of you know, what does the data tell us with respects on the national level, as well as California, in terms of where there are potential needs. So before I jump into that, is there any questions we're going to research? Just okay, a quick I question. Brandon and, um, sorry. A very quick question. Um, I noticed you had a moot court up there. There's a mock trial program that's different in high schools. Do you, is that part of like the uh, pipeline here as well? Yes, yes. So, moot, so programs that expose um, participants into, uh, you know, having a, a court trial or um, um, being in front of a judge. Um, those type of cases are. Those type of programs are um, part of some pipeline programs that are available. Now, during your research, have you looked into 
differences between the way different uh, generations, such as you know millennials and Generation X, Generation Y, about how they approach education and maybe how some of those differences are being, um, I guess, demonstrated in participation in, you know, let's say, mentorship opportunities or these pipeline programs? So, so specifically to pipeline, um, no, but with, in separate research regarding um, just entry into the job market, um, newer population, uh, uh, sorry, younger generations are entering um, the workforce uh, much sooner. Um, and you are seeing um, a delay in taking on um, the cost of a, a graduate or a law school degree um, and the impact that has on their um, choice. And in the, uh, before the JD report, um, one of the things that were interesting was, um, you know, the, the cost of a, um, a law school education was one of the things that were, was strongly being considered regarding whether they want to pursue even the law school application process. Were, were there any other um, things that really popped out at you as to why people are delaying education? Um, I mean, economic downturn, any, any factors like that that are, that are coming up? Um, I, so specifically, uh, when looking at the research, I was um, seeing mostly regarding why undergraduate students or high school students, and so undergraduate students and high school students, there is an interest to enter the, the law, uh, the field of law. The challenge that I saw was that there's not much information in terms of um, why, they, why there is a delay outside of um, maybe financial reasons, but it's not something that I look specifically into, but, but can. Um, I have a question before you go into the data. Just whether or not you found any studies at all that really explicitly addressed the outcome or impact of a program, say through a controlled trial or any kind of comparative analysis. No, I, I did not. I think the Access Lex analysis of the 261 program, 261 a national program was the closest thing. Okay. Um, there, are, there are programs that provide data on population and um, the likelihood of success of going into that program, but nothing where there's a randomized study or analysis across different cohorts if one participated versus one that did not. Yeah, and that's something that's most definitely missing in the research. Any other questions? Um, so, so these are slides that I'm, you may have seen before. Um, I've pushed it in front of you guys a few times. Um, but it's really to, to speak to what we know um, currently regarding um, the national trends on entry into the into legal profession. Um, and uh, this slide here looks at national data um, looking at uh, white to non-white ratios and male to female ratios, um, and looking at those that are um, in undergraduate, law school applicants, first year matriculants, and JD degrees awarded. Um, and that line there that uh, is being highlighted in red is to um, be, help visualize a little bit more what is being um, communicated. Uh, in this ratio, we're looking at, you know, um, is there a disparity gap? Are there um, less populations of color participating in, or represented in each of these groups? Um, are there less women um, participated, um, represented in each of these groups? And what we see in 2011 for whites and non-white is that we are seeing um, a disparity gap where um, undergraduate populations versus law school applicants versus um, even JD degree awarded, as you go further into the pipeline, further into the legal, um, access to the legal profession, um, the disparity increases. There is a less uh, representations of populations of, of color um, as you move towards getting a JD degree. Um, and you see that happening consistently in 2011, 2012, and 2013, where there is a, a, a bit of a jump between 2011 and 2013, between those who enroll in law school and those who, in fact, graduate. Um, and, that gradu and those graduating in 2013 um, being less diverse than in previous years. Um, disparity gap is, a, is um, 
uh, is not as severe, but is still present in the male-female ratio where um, you do see a more male uh, population uh, represented in graduation um, compared to that of undergraduate. Um, and that uh, still being uh, represented in 2013 compared to 2013. Explain why we have such relatively old data on this. These yeah, years. so, so um, much of this data that was obtained for this analysis was um, developed through, was collected through um, ABA reports that were available online. Um, and that information is limited as we, as they transition in the type of um, data outcomes that they were reporting in previous years to now. Um, and so what will be ideal is if we can have a, uh, um, a uh, close relationship with the ABA um, to get the raw data sets where we can um, provide a, a more up-to-date analysis. And uh, this uh, slide speaks to specifically California. I do want to note, um, as I was mentioning um, uh, just previously, there is limited data for, limited data online available uh, on uh, gender by gender. So this slide is specifically representing white to non-white ratio. Um, and while, uh, again, and you know, ideally we would wanna disaggregate this information by racial and ethnic groups. And ideally we wanna even do, go further and analyze the data um, by racial and ethnic group by gender to see where there are impacts on inter intersectionality of gender and race. Um, but this is what we have currently right now and what that information is representing um, with these big, large red circles is that in 2011, 2013, um, we are seeing disparity gaps in those who are um, completing their JD degree. So while you know, the, the California undergraduate enrollment um, in uh, undergraduate enrollment in 2011, 2012, 2013 is diverse, is under that red line, um, those who are graduating um, from JD um, is not, as a, not a, as a diverse population. Um, and those trends are similar to the US, um, but not as, as severe as the national level. And then the next slide uh, speaks to California ABA law schools, again, looking at the estimated uh, law school dropout rate. And so um, we took information regarding 2013 um, enrollment and uh, compared to 2017 graduates. And, and um, again, we're, we're uh, using a data that's available online. So these are not exact matches. This is not the same cohort. Um, but what we are seeing is that there is um, a percentage of drop in populations of color and, and black uh, law students um, feeling the the, having experiencing the, the most of that dropout rate. Um, and moving along the, the, the pipeline to um, test takers, uh, we see this um, issue exacerbated by disparity and bar pass rates. So what you're seeing is in the blue is the percentage of those who are taking the test, um, disaggregated by race and ethnicity, and then the percentage of those uh, who actually passed it. Um, and again, uh, black test takers uh, having uh, the lower of the passage rate. Um, we would like to do similar analysis with the state bar credit law school and credit law school data, but that data is limited um, on uh, enrollment, dropout, and graduation trends. That's something that uh, we're in discussion with to see if it's something we can collect in future future applications. So, so with that being said, much of uh, the discussion um, that I was providing you is high level, what are best practices? What do we know? Um, and what we know is that a lot of organizations are doing pipeline work. Um, and there's a lot of information in terms of what a pipeline program should look like. Um, and unfortunately, there's just not enough um, data on what is actually addressing some of those barriers um, for that is resulting in some of these um, statistics showing that for underrepresented, underrepresented populations and population of color, 
um, are still struggling to really um, meet the same success rates as their white counterparts. Did you want to structure this, Debbie and Hyland and, and Donna, so that at the end of all three panels, then there's just general board discussion about where the State Bar might focus? Is that correct? So we have a wrap-up at the end. Um, uh, I think the questions now are helpful, um, but we have a wrap-up at the end where Helen and Debbie will be going through each of the categories, pipeline, retention and career advancement, and judicial diversity, and focusing our attention based on what we heard in the panels. So, yeah, we're, we, well, almost. So we are ready. Um, by the way, I've gotten really good at clip art. Um, we are ready to move on to our um, career advancement um, and retention uh, part of the panel. Um, I'm going to ask us before Highland um, uh, takes us through the analysis of the existing studies and the data that exists or does not exist on retention and career advancement, I'm going to ask to take out of order Judge Holly Fugier. Um, if you jump forward in your in your agenda on this career advancement and retention panel, um, we were going to be turning ultimately to a question of what the state bar's role should be. Um, and one of those items that uh, Holly, Judge Holly Fugier was going to talk about is a. Uh, the idea of the state bar convening a leadership summit. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, Judge Fugier has a commitment at the court and needs to return to the court. So uh, with your indulgence, we will take her out of order. My jury thanks you as well. My jury is waiting for me back at court. Um, so first of all, I want to thank the Board of Trustees and the staff for all the support that you've given. I understand that you are tremendously committed to diversity and inclusion, and we are your, your uh, uh, hopefully your tool to be, able to, to be able to do that. One of the things that I keep at the back of my mind at all times is the fact that the legislature, as, as, uh, as, as Debbie knows, um, is very, very concerned about diversity and inclusion. I uh, was speaking actually last Friday with David Chu, Assembly Member David Chu, and he was talking about, he says he wants to know what it is the State Bar is doing for diversity and inclusion. I, I assured him, I said, absolutely, that is something we're committed to. It's in our mission statement. We know it's in the dues bill. This is something that we want to do. Now, he says, he, he said, well, you know, appreciate that, appreciate those words. We want to see it. And a, diver and a leadership summit is one of the ways where we can show that the state bar is truly committed and is putting the money, its money and its efforts where its mouth is. Um, the last leadership summit that we had was in October of 2014, and uh, it convened uh, people from all over the state and uh, a, a lot of diverse uh, potential leaders to talk about and to learn about how it is you become a leader in the bar and in, in, in the community. The, the thing about, about especially div the diverse population is that a lot of people are first generation lawyers, sometimes first generation people in this country, and so they don't know how to become leaders. For, you know, when I, first, when, when I became a lawyer, I didn't know any lawyers at all. And so for a lot of people, it's, it's leadership is something you don't even think of as a concept, as something you could do. It took me years to do that. So, so I think this is something that we can use, especially when we talked to uh, uh, Trustee Stallings was talking about the millennials. We need to introduce them to how it is you become a leader because this is not something necessarily that you learn by sitting in your, uh, in your room playing video games. Uh, so, sorry, uh, that's just that's just my son. Um, so so this, the, it, not only does this this uh, tell people about how you can become a leader, it introduces them to people who are leaders and who can become a, uh, who, who can become mentors. I mean, we would love to see at a leadership summit that we would you know hope to have in, in the near future. We would love to see all the members of the board of trustees there to meet people and to show, this is what I can be. You are the people now who are making the policy for the bar and for all lawyers, 
and it, doing things like admissions and, and the, all, all the good work that, that is being done in terms of the pipeline. And to, to see this is something that I can aspire to. This is something where I can really make a difference. And I think that's what the Leadership Summit does. It introduces them to people who are leaders. It introduces them to people who are on the leadership ladder. And it shows them this is what you can do and gives them very practical advice on how it is you can get involved, how, you know, what, you know, maybe uh, organizations you can join, how you find a mentor, how it is that you, you, you volunteer for, for, uh, uh, for positions on committees and things of that line that'll get you ultimately into that leadership position. So they can see that, you know, someplace down the line, hopefully relatively soon, they can find themselves in some kind of leadership position. That's going to keep them, that's, that's retention as well as success in the profession. Because if you feel committed to the profession, if you feel that you have a place in leadership, you're not just a cog in your, in your uh, you know, firm or your organization, that's, that is what, I get, what is going to get people to be devoted to the profession and want to work towards its advancement. So I think this is something that's very important. It's something that, again, we can point to as the state bar to the state legislature and say, well, frankly, I think we should be inviting members of the legislature to come and speak, as we have done in the past. We had um, Congresswoman uh, Jackie Spires. Is it spear. Spear. spear? I always pronounce that wrong, even when I'm speaking to her. Um, but uh, uh, so you know, we have we have Congress people. We have uh, you know to have assembly people, to have uh, state senators, to have people who are involved, to have people involved with with the governor's office. So again, so the governor's office understands what it is the state bar is doing. So I think it's a very very important thing for the state bar to be doing to be pushing uh, uh, programs like the leadership summit, which is something that the, that COAF is is uh, absolutely committed to doing and making sure that this is something where it. It's a, um, it's a symbiotic relationship here that we're trying to develop and nurture uh, between the state bar, between uh, the, the legislators, the governor's office, and, and the, the leadership within the bars to, again, you know, I, I'm seeing, I see a lot of sort of the graying of leadership among, among local bars where you don't have the millennials, you don't have Gen X in there. Um, and we need to bring them in. And one of the things you can do, I think, is you make them feel important. You have them at a leadership summit. And you say, you are a future leader. And they think, oh, yeah, I guess I am. So, so um, that, this is something that, again, we hope will be part of the, the planning that the State Bar does that will give us the go-ahead to, to plan this kind of summit. And we do that. We're going to work closely with the Board of Trustees, closely with the Planning Committee, and, and, try to, and, and closely with, uh, with the bars and the legislature, legislature and the governor's office to try to, again, get, get the enthusiasm going uh, among our younger lawyers, especially, uh, to, to, uh, to get support for the state bar and hopefully for the dues increase. Just a thought. All right, so thank you. Any questions? So, so um, Judge Fujie, um, mm -hmm. what about represent representatives from um, the, the employer community, representatives from the law firms, oh, from absolutely. DA's offices, public defenders? Are those folks that, that we had invited in the past to, to this summit? You know, I'd have to look to see the specific speakers. I believe there were certain. Certainly, I, I'm I'm just looking at at, at one one page, and uh, we're looking. We had we had we have law firm partners. We had judges. We had we had uh, bar presidents. We had we had uh, uh, people from from legal uh, legal services. There were people from all sorts of areas, so people could learn. It's not just you know I want to become president of the state bar. Uh, it's it's not just that. It's it's that you can be a leader in your organization. You can be a leader as a as a lawyer. You can be you can be a leader uh, in your law firm. Things of that things of that nature. It's teaching general leadership skills and giving people the resources and and the mentors to assist them in doing that. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. And then I don't know where my slides are. Is that, do we have to call it anyway? Just, just next so in the room. All right. 
Okay, so this is Hylin Chen, a member of the Board of Trustees and a partner at Munger, Tolls & Olson. Um, I'm going to be talking about the data on retention and advancement in the legal profession. And this is an area that has been very near and dear to my heart. Um, at my firm, I founded and co-chaired our firm's women's initiative. Um, I spearheaded our firm's uh, adoption of a diversity strategic plan about 10 years ago and have monitored um, how it has performed um, and have stayed very involved in diversity issues. Um, I co-chair the ABA's Section of Litigation Women Advocate Committee, which is focused on women's advancement in litigation. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of the national data. And as you listen to this, I'd like you to think about um, the role that the state bar can play with respect to data, because I do think that that is a huge opportunity for us. Um, you've heard about pipeline. And so retention and advancement gets to what happens once those attorneys, once those diverse attorneys are in the profession. Do they stay? Do they leave? Do they advance? Um, and there are a lot of organizations that have studied this and that are currently studying this. And here's just a sampling of some of them. The ABA has a couple of different commissions that are focused on racial diversity, women in the profession. The Minority Corporate Council Association is really focused on attorneys in the private sector um, and corporate law, both law firms and in-house at corporations. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of the data from the National Association for Law Placement, which is a nonprofit that studies where do law graduates go um, and do they stay. The California Minority Council Program um, is also really involved, and we'll get to hear from Robert White uh, shortly about the work that they do. The Bar Association of San Francisco has been really involved in diversity efforts, and then if of course, there are a ton of affinity bar organizations with varying levels of um, involvement in really diversifying the legal profession. So just to give you a framework for understanding what data there is out there, we can divide it into a number of categories. There's a lot of data about the private sector. So again, both attorneys and law firms and attorneys who are in-house counsel at companies that's where most of the analyses is. But we know that that's not the only place where lawyers are employed. There are lots of lawyers in the non nonprofit, uh, in the non-private sector. Um, so that would include government lawyers, nonprofits, legal aid organizations. And then there's also analyses that are divided up in terms of sort of affinity groups um, or minority categorization. So there's been a lot of studies on women in the legal profession a lot of studies on attorneys of color. And there's starting to be some studies now on attorneys with disabilities and LGBTQ attorneys. But with these last two categories, the data is not very developed. So here's some high level takeaways on the research. Again, there's a lot of research on the private sector and that's where I'm gonna focus a lot of this overview. And really it's to give you an idea of what the data looks like and what where the gaps are, where we could be uh, playing a role. Um, there's a move towards doing more data-driven analyses of diversity efforts, and that's sort of a theme that you're hearing all throughout today that you've heard already, is we need to know what the data says. Um, what are the metrics of success? What you'll also see, disappointingly, is there has been little growth in uh, the senior leadership ranks of the profession with respect to women and minorities. That number has remained stagnant nationwide. Um, looking at the research, there is a general set of recommendations about best practices for retention and advancement of diverse attorneys. Um, and those general set of recommendations typically get recycled over and over again in all the literature. Um, there hasn't been a lot of studies on the metrics of success. Um, with respect to these recommendations, it seems that law firms and non-private entities have been slow to adopt a lot of them. So there's been lots and lots of recommendations for years and years and years about things like having a part-time program, um, making sure there's equal distribution of opportunities, what have you. And those are being adopted, but the rate of adoption is fairly slow. Um, and increasingly, you see in the research 
a recognition of the need to engage non-minority attorneys in diversifying the legal profession. And so what you see at many law firms and companies is that it's the attorneys of color and the women who are leading those efforts. And it's funny that Debbie and I are up here doing that same thing today. Um, but I can speak to my experience at my law firm in particular. It has made a huge difference when we started to train and educate and really support our white male partners in speaking the language of diversity, understanding how they can, what they can do to help. And it is especially important because they are the ones who are typically in positions of power. And that effort has made a real difference at our law firm. So I'm going to go over some NALP data. Um, they do an annual diversity report that is read widely in the sort of private law firm industry. Um, they survey over 100,000 lawyers across offices all over the country. Um, they have numbers on race, gender, LGBTQ, and disability. They also put out reports on part-time lawyers, part-time programs, lawyers with disabilities. And they also talk about the placement of recent graduates, which is some really interesting data. And I'll go over it. Um, in a second, because it tells us where the gaps are. If all of the data studies are on the private sector, it tells us that we don't know a lot about what's happening to where most of the minority attorneys are going, which is to the non-private sector. And so some of the takeaways, they, they have done uh, surveys of where recent graduates get employed, and they have that data since 2002. The last study was in 2017. And what we're seeing is that with respect to legal services organizations, women, especially non-white women, are disproportionately going to legal services jobs. And so, for example, in 2017, Hispanic women represented 5% of all employed graduates, but 14% of those who are going to legal services jobs. So the disparity is great. Um, on the other side of the coin, white male graduates uh, represented less than half um, of those going to legal services jobs. With large firms, meaning law firms that are over 250 people, Asian graduates uh, you know, were overrepresented. Black male graduates were about equal. Um, and then you're seeing a lot of black graduates going into the public defender's office. And so... This is what the data shows from 2017. You can see with respect to, for example, the Hispanic uh, employed graduates, it's disproportionately, uh, there's a disproportionate percentage going into legal services. And because we don't have a lot of data on how tracking the advancement and retention of attorneys in legal services organizations, there's therefore a gap of knowledge as to what's happening to those minority attorneys. So what's happening, I'm now going to go into the data as to private law firms, because that's where the most robust data is. And this is just meant to be an example of what types of studies have been done. NALP has tracked the advancement and sort of demographics of law firm attorneys, associates and partners, going back a long number of years. And what you can see from this data is that the percentage of attorneys of color in the partnership ranks has remained stagnant. For the past 10 years, there's been very little growth. Um, with respect to the associate ranks, there's been some slow growth. Um, and again, these are nationwide numbers. I'm going to show you some of the California-specific numbers that NALP has. NALP does surveys, um, will break down its survey numbers in some instances by major metropolitan areas. And so I calculated the California numbers by looking at LA, San Diego, um, San Francisco, San Jose area, and Orange County area. And so this is just another way of looking at the data. Um, and again, the percentages are very, very small. On the y-axis, you know, you're only going up by 2% each jump. You can see that with respect to Hispanic associates and black associates, there was a dip, um, quite a significant dip that has come back up. Um, and then an, a sort of steady increase in the number of Asian associates percentage at law firms. Um, here's just looking at minority associates. So what do the associates look like at law firms nationwide? And then you can see the difference with respect to California. Um, so what you see with the NALP data is that there is a significant difference with respect to some major met metropolitan areas and the number of 
uh, minorities at law firms. Here's just another way of looking at the same data, looking at the trend over time, and you can see that the growth has been virtually none uh, with respect to black and Hispanic associates. It's gone down and then come back up. Um, and then this graph plots where California is. And so we are really leading the nation in many ways with respect to our um, diversity in law firms. Here are the numbers with respect to partners. So looking at, okay, so we're getting some minority attorneys to come in the door to law firms. Do they advance to partnership? And the answer is very slowly. Um, you can see here the numbers nationwide and then at the bottom with respect to California uh, major metropolitan areas. Here's just another way of looking at the data, again, with the California number plotted to the side. And there's NALP does a lot of studies on women and minorities, and in particular minority women. And that is where a lot of the data has shown some very disappointing results. Um, the ABA commissioned a study in 2007 that showed that five years into the profession, only, sorry, five years into the profession, 80% of minority women had left the profession. And so they were leaving law firms in huge numbers, leaving the profession in huge numbers, and that's being reflected in these numbers. <coughs> Here's just another way of looking at the data. So not a lot of change over the past 10 years. And here it is again with the California numbers. And you can see again here we really lead in terms of the percentage of minorities. And what's happening at the partnership level? Well, as you might suspect, if minority women are leaving the profession in huge numbers, you have very slow growth in women in general rising to partnership, virtually no growth over the past 10 years with respect to minority women. And you see in California, there are lots of minority women associates above the national average, but we're not above the national average with respect to partners. And so again, this is data that is, as you can see, fairly robust for uh, private law firms. But the same type of data just doesn't exist at the national level or any sort of state or local level with respect to sort of non-law firm jobs. Here's the data again, and you can see we lead with respect to um, associates, which pulls up the total number. And just to give you, I wanted to give you guys just one example of a study that the Stanford Criminal Justice Center did, part of the Stanford Law School, a study that they did that was California focused and the impact that it has, um, which again, I think presents a potential opportunity for the state bar to play a role. Um, they did this study, let me see what year it was. I think it was 2015, yes. And what they found with respect to California prosecutors is that minorities are severely underrepresented. Although whites represent 38% of the population, they represent 70% of prosecutors across the state. And where that disparity is really having an impact is with respect to Latinos. Latinos represent close to 40% of the population, but only 9% of prosecutors. And then you're seeing a disparity with respect to gender in terms of who is rising in the ranks. And so women, there are fewer women uh, in the supervisory ranks of prosecutors' offices. And so here's a graph showing that disparity. And the study was really interesting because it talked about why that matters. Why is this important? Well, prosecutors are the ones who decide who gets charged, what gets charged, what sentence they're going to ask for, what concessions are going to be offered, if any, in exchange for a guilty plea. They are really setting the policy for criminal justice, which is an area where race really plays a huge role and racial disparity is a significant issue. Um, and having this data makes a powerful, powerful point. Um, this was a study that was then followed up with another report a few years after. 
um, not with respect to metrics, but with respect to sort of policy issues. Um, and I think that it's a good example of a place where the bar may consider playing a role. So typical recommendations, um, and we'll come back to this when Debbie and I have a discussion at the end, that are coming out of all of these diversity studies about best practices. They all talk about how it starts with leadership. And leadership doesn't mean just let's trot out the attorneys of color to talk about diversity. It talks about having buy-in from the very top. Um, the research supports making this stuff data-driven so we can measure success, having more trainings, making, setting objective standards so that implicit biases can play less of a role, making sure that opportunities are distributed equitably, trying to maintain some sort of work-life balance and having measures uh, to help people do that, um, offering mentoring and having more assessment and accountability, which again takes us back to data. All right, any questions? We'll be looking again at some California-specific data. So again, I'm Karen Namaranti, a program analyst with the Office of Research and Institutional Accountability. Uh, and so the data that we're, we're reviewing is what we know um, currently regarding uh, licensee population in California. Um, and some of this data we presented on previously. Um, so what we we know that a majority of those that are licensed uh, to practice uh, through the state bar are uh, majority white with a 41%, I'm sorry, 77%, 12% uh, Asian Pacific Islander, 6% Latino, 3% black. And where we see um, uh, disparity is that, um, as Hayden mentioned, there's a, a large percentage of Latinos in uh, the California population, which is not reflected in the licensee population. Um, as well as um, black and API. Uh, for male and female, there is a larger percentage of males uh, with 44% compared to 36%. Um, again, you're seeing the, the difference compared to the California um, population. Um, this is, I'm a researcher, so I, I think data is exciting. <laughs> I think this is a really exciting uh, chart because what it is reflecting is um, that gradual shift in the demographics of the light state population, um, where um, the populations that were admitted in um, previous years um, are uh, less diverse, but as you see that lean towards that right, um, there is um, more population, a population that is a higher percentage of minority and female. Um, and when looking at the data disaggregated by um, the uh, employment type, um, you see much of what uh, Highland was mentioning is that there are more diverse um, licensees in the government and nonprofit and academic uh, pra uh, legal practices, um, whereas the private sector is still majority uh, white and male. Um, and, and again, I, I think this data is exciting because it, it really provides um, you know, a, a sort of a benchmark in terms of um, the data that we are going to be collecting in the future. Um, we we launched a, a My State Bar Profile New Demographic Survey, um, which uh, as of today, I think we have 12,000 uh, survey partici uh, participants that, I'm sorry, licensees that completed the survey, which is exciting because it was launched yesterday. Um, and uh, in that uh, My State Bar Profile Survey, um, which, you know, we really have to thank many of the board members that uh, provided feedback, as well as um, many of the affinity groups of uh, volunteers from the Diversity Summit who helped provide input um, to help us draft those questions. And uh, those questions highlight um, not only the demographics, where we include um, uh, uh, race, ethnicity, uh, updated gender categories with uh, non-binary, um, uh, sexual orientation and disability. Uh, we also include questions regarding employment types. So really drilling down into not only you know do you work in the private sector, uh, do you work in the government? What type of you know are you federal? Are you state? Um, getting information on those who work in academia. So really breaking down the different employment types 
Um, and then your job level type, which is, you know, are you an associate? Um, are you a staff attorney? And then how um, beneficial the long-term data will be as we see where there's changes in job level type um, disaggregated by the demographics. Um, and then those who are um, not practicing, um, what is the percentage of that? Um, and then career satisfaction, which um, gets too much of you know, what we're trying to understand in terms of the, what is the experience in, uh, th th that attorneys are having in their work environment and how that can in any way inform some of the, um, the policy recommendations or research that we can you know, look into to, inf to, to better understand how we can dis diversify the profession. Um, another survey that we're working on um, to be released soon is the transfer survey. Um, and this survey is really getting to understand, um, again, I'm highly mentioning the, the, those who are leaving the profession. What do we know about that? What is going on? What is the demographic or the composition of those attorneys? Um, and so when attorneys choose to go inactive or they resign, we have a very short survey they would be completing. Um, and and you know, I look forward to really seeing what the outcomes of that survey would provide. Um, so again, this is to be um, uh, rolled out in the upcoming months. Can I just ask all of the attorney members of the board, I really encourage you to log on to your State Bar profile, take the survey. I did it, you did, yeah. So it's, it's really exciting. I also wanna give a public kind of shout out and appreciation to our Office of Information Technology, who in addition to Carolina and our volunteers really worked tirelessly to get this launched. And we wanted to do it before the end of the regular billing cycle. Um, and because we're coming up right at that deadline, I think that's why we had 12,000 responses in one day. So it's gonna be a really exciting and rich data set for us. <laughs> One thing um, to clarify, um, Carolina, your um, licensee population data that you were sharing, mm -hmm. um, as uh, I believe this all comes from the five-year survey. So the reason that one of the key reasons that we are doing the survey that Carolina just talked about that, that we've just launched, that some of you have taken, and that we will be launching, is the five-year um, the five year, uh, attorney survey, the response rate um, for the last one was, I think, 17%. Um, so, so the numbers are really small, and so we are trying to really get a lot richer, fuller, comprehensive data that will um, will be able to sort of tell us something. Because I think, in part, one of the things that you know we're going to be asking all of you to think about as we talk about what should our objectives be, I think, to the extent that there are sort of holes in the data that we have. Um, it may be hard to focus where our interventions can be most successful, and we need to think about the importance of getting that data to really help us um, identify the places that the state bar can be most impactful. Okay, thank you. Just, just go for it. Okay. Uh, Helen, um, thanks for that presentation. You did a lot of work, and I appreciate that. One of the things that struck me though as I was looking at it is that um, if if there's only three percent of the total attorney population is minority women then the equivalent for example that you see up here as partners would roughly equate to the total number of you know attorneys attorney women so I'm I'm curious as to whether you compared um, those numbers, in other words, the, the total number of, in this case, minority women to, to the partnership issue. Because if, if, if it's the same number, then the problem is getting, getting minority women into the profession to increase the numbers of minority women. Yeah, so what we're seeing is that the numbers are starting to increase of minority women coming to the profession. The problem is they leave after a few years. Um, and maybe that, I mean, hard to, in a few minutes, make that come through in the data, but that is what the data is showing, is that they are coming through the profession, um, and those numbers are slowly increasing, but they're not staying, they're not rising through the ranks, um, they're not rising into leadership positions. And I think, um, Mark, just to, 
to extend upon that point in terms of additional work we can do, the kind of comparative analyses that I think you're suggesting mm -hmm. is exactly the type of thing that we can do. Um, we can do it. Certainly we know what the demographics of the attorney population looks like. Like we have only 3% of licensed attorneys are African American. Uh, so you wouldn't expect to see necessarily 15% of partners be African American. So that's exactly the type of, of work that we can do going forward. So at this point, um, we want to hear from some voices in the field on uh, things that uh, the state bar may, con um, what the state bar's role might be in this retention and career advancement um, area. So I'd like to invite to the table Judge Marguerite Downing and Robert White. things out. Okay, there we go. So first of all, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, mentoring task force project. So first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, having served as a member of what was the Board of Governors at that time, uh, coming back here and addressing my colleagues is always like coming home. Um, just a little historical, and I also want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to have chaired this project since it's um, uh, inception, and uh, I want to give a shout out to one of your former employees, Patricia Lee, who is no longer with the bar, but was instrumental in putting this report together and serving uh, as staff uh, for us and also for co-op when I served there. Now, historically, in 2015, the Board of Trustees appointed a mentoring task force to put together representatives from CYLA, co-op, from the state bar sections and others to address the creation of a statewide mentoring program in keeping with the bar's public protection mission. It was a, rec a recommendation from TFAR previously. The task force looked at programs small and large across the country, at volunteer and mandatory state programs, bar programs, and some in-house programs. A preliminary report was created in 2016. The Board of Trustees at that time sent it out for public comment. The comments were received, reviewed, and tallied, and our preliminary report was then issued. The Board of Trustees then asked COAF to look at implementing a statewide task for a statewide mentoring program in addition to looking at a bar passage program. Co-op uh, was able to identify a research team that took over the bar passage portion of the plan, and so that's why we have the Mindset Bar Passage Program. That is, um, once again, it was kind of incubated here at the State Bar, but it's been uh, sent out, and the State Bar does not has sent it off. So then after intensive review, it was determined that the State Bar could not implement a statewide mentoring program, either voluntarily or mandatory, for a number of reasons. Cost, the uh, concern about trying to, uh, whether or not it was going to be mandatory or voluntary, creating new staff, trying. We were wondering where we were going to get all these mentors for the 6,000 lawyers that come in. Uh, on an average basis yearly. However, uh, the task force envisioned that creating the and making available the technology to run a mentoring program uh, would be a better use of state bar funds. There were many bar associations across the country, big and small, that were running their own mentoring programs and they were having the same challenges that the state bar litigation section was having in terms of putting the partnerships together, training, reaching out, getting mentors, getting mentees. 
And so the task force looked at the possibility that if we created the technology and made that available, then the bar associations and the affinity groups could run their own programs. They were in the best position to do so. Many of them had been running programs in their community, but they needed the ability to grow their programs. And for the smaller bar associations that were considering the project, it gave them an opportunity to partner and to learn. So the thought was that the state bar would do better instead of trying to run a program to provide the technology to allow the smaller bar associations to create ate their own program. We looked at a number of vendors, and our recommendation is that we go with Cronus. Cronus's yearly cost is $14,000. It's probably half of what it started out when we started talking to them because they were on our dream list, but based on what it was going to cost uh, early on, we said it was just not doable. However, they're very, very, very motivated to have the State Bar of California as one of their clients. And so they have reduced their fees dramatically um, to present the carrot to you. This amount would be doable use, uh, utilizing SS, excess EOB funds. For that price, Cronus will provide assistance to 400 users. Those users can be spread out amongst various bar associations. The other program we looked at is every time we added a bar association, we were going to have to pay approximately um, a $2,000 fee to add them. But Cronus will allow us to use to have 400 users across the country with various bar associations uh, using their platform. We partnered with the Alameda Bar Association, who has a very robust uh, mentoring program uh, in Oakland. And one of their challenges was some of the services that Cronus would provide, the hand-to-hand -hand, uh, creation of the mentoring, the fact that one staff person had to put the mentoring relationships together, they had to monitor them, they had to keep up with the demographics. Cronus would allow, um, the platform would allow Cronus to do that and take it out of the hands of a staffer. Cronus would, we also worked with small bar associations as the Asian, Asian Pacific Women's uh, Lawyers Association in Los Angeles. Cronus would provide all the training. They would provide 24 seven customer service access. They would train the um, state bar employees or employee that is involved. And it appears based on our research that this is a project that would only require three to five hours each month from a state bar staffer. And that state bar staffer would be able to access the um, data from the various bar associations that as they're working on their mentoring program, they would be putting the information into Cronus and the state bar would be able to access that information. In putting this, uh, our final report together, we involved the state bar IT uh, department to ensure that this was something that was doable. Uh, they agree uh, that this would work. There is no upgrading needed from the state bar's computer system because Cronus would be a third party vendor. None of the actual work would be in state bar computers, but you would have access to them. Uh, since the state bar would really only be pulling aggregate data, uh, the feeling is that the three to five hour uh, commitment monthly by the state bar a state bar employee is fairly accurate. It's been men mentioned a couple of times uh, that one of our missions is a public protection and providing the mentoring services statewide clearly falls within that area. It is geared to help new lawyers smoothly transition into the practice. Uh, we found that in um, we participated in another uh, lawyer survey uh, using state bar services, and we found from lawyers that 54% of them uh, attributed their success in law having a mentor relationship. 
So the view was if we could help them do that, uh, we could be successful. We looked at whether or not trying to make this a mandatory or a volunteer bar, but one of the advantages or the disadvantages is we are a very, very, very large state. And the classes that we bring in each year are triple what any other state has uh, really in their practicing field. Some states bring in 30 to 50 to 100 or 200 lawyers each year. Uh, that's that's a graduating class of one of our law schools. So we felt that we just couldn't do it. And as you know, the state is different. What works in the urban cities does not work in rural areas. We looked at the fact that in some rural areas, we didn't have enough lawyers to serve as mentors, or we might not have enough lawyers to serve as mentees. So in closing, uh, I do want to stress that this mentoring project will support your mission. It will provide needed transitioning support to new lawyers in the profession without creating staff or expensive monetary outlies. I'd also like to point that in North Carolina, who had a mandatory bar uh, and had a mentoring program for their young lawyers, uh, they... Uh, evaluated and discovered that in the 10 years their program was working or the 10 year stretch that they looked at, they got down to three uh, disciplinary referrals for new lawyers and they attributed the fact that they had come down significantly because of the existence of the mentoring program that the state had initiated. So I'd like to thank you again for your attention and your time. And thank you for the opportunity to have served as this chair of this task force. Thank you. And I, I'm available for any questions. Thank you. OK, we'll have go now to, um, to Mr. White. Thank you. Uh, you can do it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert White. I'm executive director of California Minority Council Program, CMCP. Um, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. I appreciate your uh, patience. You've been sitting quietly uh, in your chairs for a long time without uh, a lot of input. And I know for lawyers, that is not always an easy thing to do. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my organization um, and then also about what some other organizations um, and initiatives in the field are doing around diversifying the legal profession. Um, CMCP, uh, which I hope most of you are somewhat familiar with, was founded 30 years ago, um, and it was in response to studies and examination by some committed individuals, noting that the numbers of minority attorneys, both in law firms and legal departments, were substantially less than in the population at large. Uh, the initiative was to actually address this by creating access. For business lawyers, obviously, the ability to actually meet clients and prospective clients is key uh, to survival and to advancement. Uh, so a lot of what we do is to create those uh, scenarios. We still do uh, a program that is simply a speed dating of minority lawyers and potential clients. Uh, we do more in the way of professional development as well, uh, putting on programs um, intended to increase opportunities uh, and growth for minority lawyers. Um, one of the programs that we are just initiating is one on associate retention, uh, which ties in very well to what Halen was talking about earlier. Um, and a lot of that is kind of building off of existing research, um, trying to do not just the studies and statistical data on it, but also getting to information which also drives the success of diversity initiatives, such as do minority lawyers actually believe that their firms are sincere in their diversity efforts? Like what's the cost to them of participating in those efforts? Um, I want to... Um, also kind of give a caveat that obviously my focus professionally has been on business lawyers in the private sector uh, that have self-familiarity with some of the issues that show up into the diversity and uh, legal services in the nonprofit field. Um, but um, a lot of my information will be slanted more towards that segment, but I think as a lot of it is um, very universally applicable. Uh, so I want to talk um, a little bit about kind of root causes for diversity, uh, and it's a little bit more of a philosophical point. But I think there are two areas that tend to hold back diversity. One are the systemic issues, 
you know, and some of those you see in the discussions of pipeline, uh, socioeconomics, uh, structural uh, issues with how law firms are run, um, how lawyers develop into nonprofit leaders. Uh, some of it is relational. Um, very success as a lawyer is very much based on being able to buy, get mentors uh, to be able to recruit clients, uh, to be able to connect, right? And then within the legal field, obviously those connections between attorneys are what really drive the success of diversity. Uh, and efforts that tend to bring people together um, are uh, typically going to be more fruitful. Um, I think you need both. Um, I think you need to address the structural issues. I think you also need to make sure that you're addressing the personal issues as well. Uh, so we can move on. Um, I'm going to tell you briefly about um, kind of my take on some of the initiatives that are underway. And, and I didn't have time to kind of spell out all of them. Um, so this would be kind of fast and shallow with some highlights, uh, probably like people you knew earlier in your life that you no longer want to be around. Uh, but um, I'm going to try to cover as much as I can. Um, in terms of um, the kind of areas that we see, and we've talked about kind of pipeline, uh, recruitment, retention, mentoring, uh, professional development. Um, I've talked to you a little bit about what CMCP does and some of these other organizations do around business development and leadership. Um, the organizations you see on the right uh, often have multiple kind of focuses within their diversity efforts. Um, some that I will kind of draw out on the law firm side, uh, some of the programs that seem to be most successful are uh, a program by a firm, Little Mendelssohn, in which they actually incorporate their clients as part of their diversity and professional development effort. So they match up their kind of promising lawyers with a team, including partners at the firm, and also allow their clients to get involved, to give input, to become mentors and sponsors. Um, and, and I think it's just a smart idea. Um, it allows in-house lawyers who often don't have as much access to get involved in diversity efforts, when the ability to make a real impact Obviously, for the actual diverse lawyers that are involved, it's a huge boost to their career to get input from people who are business leaders, um, as well as people who can kind of affect the trajectory of their own career. Um, another firm uh, involves uh, what they call a triad approach, which is a cipher Shaw, in which they match up their um, promising lawyers with both uh, kind of more of an early level partner and a more experienced partner, right? And the idea of being a team mentorship sometimes works better and is more logistically feasible than one-on-one -on -one mentoring pairs. Um, among um, legal departments, um, we've really seen that legal departments are leading the charge in terms of diversity in the private sector. Uh, they've more and more kind of embraced their position as driving diversity, and, which makes sense because they are the ones who obviously have the money which drives the firms. Um, what we see in some cases, uh, if you look at, for example, HP Inc., uh, formerly part of Hewlett Packard, uh, their general counsel, Kim Rivera, made a very simple analysis of, you know, what will drive behavior at firms is economics, right? So if we're driving a diversity effort, we should get, speak to the economics. Um, HP instituted a program in which they essentially hold back a percentage of a law firm's fees based on them hitting certain metrics in terms of providing diverse counsel. Uh, and they have a guide, I think, of 30% of the attorneys in their matters have to be women or racial minorities. Um, the interesting thing about this approach, um, which was an aggressive approach and one in which took a lot of uh, work there, is that simply by announcing to the firms that this was going to be the new kind of rule of the land, behaviors started changing immediately, uh, even before the rule actually went into effect. Um, they gave, I think, a one or two year lead in time um, before uh, actually implementing the whole back. And we've seen a marked increase in performance uh, by the law firms because of the uh, um, connection of revenue to diversity metrics. Um, on the nonprofit sector, there are a huge number of organizations that are doing really good work here. Um, one of the organizations I personally am indebted to is One Justice, which has an executive fellowship program, which doesn't on its face uh, characterize itself as a diversity program, but which makes a point about talking about diversity as part of developing leadership um, within the nonprofit world, which also focuses on recruiting uh, diverse lawyers uh, for the fellowship program itself. Um, the um, uh, uh, other programs, uh, the Justice Collaborative or a Collective uh, is also some interesting kind of consulting work. One of this uh, Compass Point provides a lot of resources for nonprofits uh, around kind of management and around diversity uh, and initiatives. Um, 
I want to circle back briefly again to the private sector. A couple of other uh, organizations that are doing some interesting work. Uh, Microsoft for years has had a rewards program uh, in which they essentially pay an additional 2% of fees to firms that hit certain metrics. Um, Walmart uh, has taken a kind of proactive approach in how it kind of treats supplier diversity by its law firms. Um, one of the things that it does is to bring in its relationship managers with a mandate that if they are not diverse, they bring along their successors who themselves are expected to be women or minorities. The idea being that there is a reality check that you know, diversity doesn't happen overall, but succession planning can actually be tied to diversity of the profession of the organization as well. Um, another program, Walmart Ready, uh, brings in potential law firm providers and basically teaches them how uh, Walmart attorneys work and positions them to be able to get business in the future. Um, uh, again, among diversity organizations, I talked a little bit about what CMCP does. Um, Minority Corporate Council Association, um, NAMWOLF, National Associated Minority and Women-Owned Law Firms, um, Leadership Council for Legal Develop, uh, sorry, Leadership Council Le Legal Diversity, uh, LCLD, uh, Institute for Inclusion Legal Profession, all contribute in different ways. Some by research, uh, which is very helpful. Again, kind of the underpinnings of diversity efforts. Uh, some by networking and bringing together and making connections among uh, diverse lawyers. Um, some by education. Uh, some by again promoting business development uh, with the idea that we kind of then grow the next generation of diverse partners. Uh, who are then in turn able to bring up more diverse lawyers behind them. Uh, another interesting uh, development has been uh, CLOC, um, Corporate Legal Operations Consortium. And here's an effort by the business um, of uh, business people that is impacting how diversity plays out in the legal field. Uh, CLOC consists of the operations uh, professionals within the legal field. As corporations get bigger, often they treat the practice of law as simply one of their business lines. And as opposed to having lawyers who have expertise in the practice of law trying to be business people and manage the kind of the billing, um, the outside counsel management, et cetera, they have professionals who are actually trained and who actually look at this uh, and who are naturally much more kind of metrics driven. Um, I think the impact of this is that we have the ability to uh, have a body of uh, corporations, which really look very scientifically at like where the money goes, uh, who measure it very carefully. I'm sure if all of you at law firms are very familiar with diversity surveys, um, and who are then able to actually kind of apply that very strategically, very tactically. Um, in the more sophisticated legal departments, uh, the data is able to show, for example, how many minority lawyers work on all of my single plaintiff employment matters in California, right? allowing them to kind of be very targeted in their approach in recruiting additional lawyers uh, and in their diversity effort. Uh, bar associations, uh, we think we've talked about a lot today, are obviously driving a lot of the uh, work around the diversity space uh, in various ways with kind of making connections, mentoring, scholarships, pipeline, um, and have the advantage of being able to kind of target their approaches for particular populations. So looking at all this and trying to think a little bit more, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, like what are the kind of the general trends, you know, that I see in terms of what seems to help these programs work uh, and what seems to not be working? Um, one of the big themes is that, again, um, it seems like the best programs are those that kind of try to talk about both structural issues, but also create opportunities for personal connection. Uh, we've talked a little bit about... Um, drawing in people who are kind of out groups into diversity efforts. Um, one of the programs that since we did was one called Power Up Your Diversity Committee. We tried to talk about what are best practices in those diversity councils, including handling tough questions like how do you incorporate um, outliers into it? How do you employ them successfully? How do you deal with tough issues and focusing where your diversity effort goes if different populations are being um, having different levels of success within an organization? Um, I think that the uh, state bar and other organizations have the opportunity to help by kind of promoting more of that learning and again, being a resource center there. Um, the other uh, theme that I see in the programs that are most successful is that they acknowledge and they really leverage a reward system um, rather than uh, pure altruism and trying to drive diversity. 
uh, on the law firm side, obviously kind of addressing the economics um, and treating opportunity and access to clients as a trade-off that can be used to encourage diversity uh, has been very successful in getting kind of buy-in at all levels of a firm. And often what I find at CMCP is that sometimes my main connection to a firm isn't necessarily the diversity committee. It's sometimes it's the business development people who see the advantage of diversity in that field, right? And obviously that requires some balancing of interests, um, but it does seem like it's a hook in to get organizations that may not otherwise be receptive to see the advantage of participating. Um, again, along those lines, kind of aligning with the organizational objectives and their interests as part of the diversity effort seems to ensure the success of the program. Um, and then lastly, just use of data um, in an increasingly metrics-driven world, the ability to generate data uh, to show the ROI on diversity efforts uh, is often very persuasive in getting buy-in. Um, with that in mind, I think I'm extremely encouraged by upcoming developments with the State Bar and collecting more data and hopefully making that available to diversity organizations uh, and, uh, and individuals kind of committed to doing this kind of work. Um, obviously, that, you know, um, the legal landscape has not changed a lot. So there's a lot that's missing or not yet done in terms of diversity. Um, one of the challenges of existing efforts is simply that there are so many um, people in the marketplace that often coordination of activities becomes very difficult. Um, or there is not necessarily an incentive for organizations to work together. Um, Collaboration uh, sometimes happens, sometimes not. Um, and efficiency, therefore, is lost. As I'll talk a little bit more later, I think one of the unique powers of the State Bar is to act as uh, a body that can just help coordinate the various efforts. Um, and, and just skipping ahead a little bit, I mean, one of my ideas that I've talked about is simply uh, something as simple as having a master calendar of all the diversity events that are happening uh, in the area can be incredibly helpful. Right, so that we don't have organizations scheduling events over each other, potentially having their fundraising impacted uh, by being in conflict with other organizations' events. Um, accountability is also a challenge. Uh, and just being very candid, I think that the existing efforts um, often are very powerful, but I do question whether or not there is an opportunity for more aggressive approaches to be taken um, if organizations are more willing to deal with the accountability. Right? So it's easier to put together a diversity 1L hiring fair, right? Where the organization isn't necessarily expected to hire a 1L, right? But obviously you look at the number of diverse partners, we see that there's less of an accountability factor in terms of what firms are doing there, right? That you can actually, as um, an article came out recently, uh, noting that the number of firms which touted the number of diverse partners they've made, but which were you know, markedly missing African-American partners. So I think it's one of the challenges with our existing efforts. Um, and again, broad impact, looking outside the walls of a particular organization uh, does not always happen. Um, I think reliance on funding uh, and on funders uh, as driving the agenda is also a challenge. Um, you know, as part of all this, I think that one thing that is helpful is trying to look at diversity efforts which are able to be disruptive um, and transformational. This happens more on the business side, I think, than within the legal field. Um, but diversity efforts that actually kind of look at how work gets allocated within a firm, at the economic structures um, by which legal services are provided, do actually have an impact on diversity and provide an opportunity for us to think more creatively uh, about how to get a more proportionate representation of business lawyers. Um, uh, and, and again, uh, what's missing in a lot of cases is simply the data, the ability to track uh, efforts and to uh, be more metrics driven uh, in our programs. Um, go to the next slide. Um, so I, I looked at the uh, State Bar and opportunities in a few different areas. One um, is as a resource center. They talked about um, simple, something as simple as events calendaring uh, can be helpful. Um, there are um, a number of uh, diversity training materials out there. And again, using the State Bar website and other resources as a, a bank, a library uh, for these various efforts, I think can be very helpful. Um, often there's a lot of recreating of the wheel uh, even in terms of something as simple as coming up with a PowerPoint to talk about diversity. Uh, I think that's something that the State Bar might be positioned to help with. Um, um, one of the things that I've done using the existing State Bar website is simply to send 
uh, companies and law firms that are interested in getting more of their attorneys involved in diversity efforts, a link to the page that simply gives all of the various bar associations. Right? Um, I think bringing that to the floor would be to me like a technically fairly simple for me <laughs> to do, uh, idea, but which has actual real value, right? It kind of like shows attorneys, here are the ways that you can personally get engaged uh, in diversity efforts. Uh, for minority lawyers, it also helps them identify peers, um, uh, affirming groups and individuals who can help them. Uh, um, another um, kind of somewhat related idea is that uh, given, again, the richness in some ways in the legal field, of all the various pipeline efforts, mentoring programs, uh, career advancement programs that are aimed at diverse lawyers, a simple, uh, or, or not so simple, but I think helping to map where those resources are can be incredibly helpful, right? So that an attorney who's in Fresno knows, okay, here are the different mentoring programs that are available to me. Um, or a law student in San Francisco can actually see, okay, here's what the different programs are, which are what are the eligibility um, requirements uh, that would allow me to have access to those resources. Uh, uh, another area is a state bar, uh, again, as the kind of standards upholder uh, for um, lawyers. Uh, I think that the articulation of a statewide goal for diversity, I think, is incredibly powerful. Uh, and it gives all the or other organizations something in which they kind of can then pin their own diversity efforts on. Um, I think uh, promulgating kind of criteria, um, not necessarily regulating, but at least setting here are kind of basic expectations for what diversity training can and should look like um, and what trainers should look like. Um, I think one of the things that is occasionally problematic is that anyone can basically be a diversity trainer, right? But I think having at least some understanding, okay, here's the basic competencies uh, of that, um, I think would be helpful. Um, you know, obviously a much more complicated issue, but I think looking at the uh, CLE credit for recognition and elimination of bias uh, might be a worthy effort. Um, I think over the years, the expansion of the kind of content that qualifies for that credit, I think has been good. So we can bring in uh, topics that aren't necessarily purely based on lawyers and diversity in the legal field, right? But which deal with law, affirmative action, et cetera, right? But I also think it might be worth thinking about if we're looking at this kind of big tent diversity approach, is there value in actually breaking out sub segments of that, right? So that we don't just have, you know, one blanket blessing of, okay, I got my elimination of bias training, but we actually break it out. Okay, I have my training in gender identity issues and cultural competencies, uh, et cetera. Um, and the third um, area, uh, next slide, is looking at uh, State Bar really as a change maker um, in terms of enabling, empowering uh, other organizations. Um, again, the sharing of demographic data, I think it's very helpful. I think being a thought leader uh, and having focus groups that can really look at um, uh, various aspects of diversity is helpful. Um, Jason Lee stole from my head the idea I had about looking at the State Bar as possibly a, a source of being an incubator for new diversity initiatives. Often for those organizations that have new ideas, one of the challenges is just finding the funding the access to uh, uh, funders uh, and just a platform. I think the State Bar could kind of do a lot of value, uh, provide a lot of value by providing almost an incubator, just as you would for a small business, uh, to get new ideas about diversity out into the field. Um, again, bringing in diversity uh, very in with an intentionality to even the State Bar's own events, uh, in terms of how speakers are presented, um, in terms of how uh, positions are, or um, events are. Um, advertised uh, to make sure that diverse lawyers have access and are aware of them uh, would be valuable. Um, uh, uh, another approach, again, is looking at, you know, uh, of existing groups, whether they're bar associations, practice groups, whatever. Uh, again, this may be driven by more data. Uh, seeing where there is a discrepancy in the number of women and minority lawyers, right? And then being more targeted and approaching them and figuring out what are the barriers to entry. Right. Um, I've had lawyers talk to me about everything from the cost of malpractice insurance, uh, which for lawyers who are trying to open up small shops uh, is an issue, um, to the actual lack of training. Um, what is often happening is that as large law firms are no longer as available to law school grads, many young lawyers are having to put out a shingle. Um, and I see anecdotally from their experience going to court that they often are not prepared 
right? I think a very intentional approach of providing training, uh, which, which wouldn't necessarily have to be characterized as training for diverse lawyers, but which I think would have uh, an actual impact uh, on that population. Um, could this serve both the bar well in terms of adequate representation of their clients, as well as helping these lawyers kind of develop their careers um, and probably making judges a lot less irritated? Um, um, I, I, kind of last thought is to look at things like the resources that the State Bar provides uh, through the Lawyer Assistance Program and making sure that the providers of counseling there are also kind of attuned to the specific issues that women and people of color, uh, LGBTQ lawyers, people with disabilities may have, right? And prior to preparing them to be able to provide adequate advice, counseling, uh, and support, and to be directed to uh, appropriate resources. So that said, um, obviously these things are all very easy to do. Uh, <laughs> it can be done overnight. Um, and some of these I'm hoping that you after this will have a chance to kind of think through from your own organization, which of these resonate, which are things that kind of make sense um, that the State Bar could be involved in. Um, so with that, um, any questions or comments? Sonia? I'm done. Thank you. Um, being in a oh. corporate world also, um, in, in your study uh, of the business lawyers and the private sector, do they have, uh, are, are these corporations allotting any portion for this, you know, as part of their social uh, corporate responsibility for pro bono or any of those services that will then make them more involved uh, in diversity and inclusion? Mm -hmm. um, is that something that is even uh, part of the policy of the right. business or corporate world? Right. right, that's a great question. I think that varies uh, somewhat with the corporation in terms of how um, conscious they are of pro bono and community service. Um, and again, a kind of plug for CMSP. One of the programs we did uh, last year was a, a panel presentation with in-house lawyers and law firm lawyers talking about ways that the two groups are able to work together on pro bono and community service projects. The challenge often for legal departments is that they don't have the bandwidth and resources to be able to participate effectively in a lot of pro bono projects, especially those that are longer term and more time intensive or resource intensive. Uh, for law firms, on the other hand, the resources are there, um, but the, the motivation to get involved in those efforts increases a lot when pro bono is also connected to the ability to work closely with prospective clients. And develop relationships outside of their usual kind of baseball games, dinners, etc. Um, it also ties in, you know, to what actually happens in the real world, right? That the same people who are very involved in diversity efforts are often also very involved in community service and giving back uh, efforts as well. Joanna. Yes. Uh, Joanna Mendoza, have you had a chance to reach out to the California Lawyers Association? I, I know that diversity and inclusion is on their uh, list of things they really want to start to pursue, and they're starting to get into that area now. And some of the things you mentioned are better suited for the California Lawyers Association, and you've got some great ideas. And in case you haven't, I want to introduce you to Emilio Veronini behind you. And hope that maybe the two of you can maybe step out at some point and have a discussion because I really think the CLA as a statewide bar association now could really do a lot of uh, of what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. No, no that's a great idea. Uh, I have met with some of the um, uh, leaders in the CLA, um, and I've also worked with some of the um, sections there, and particularly the business law section. Uh, there on. We've done a joint program together. Uh, looking forward to doing more things together going forward. Any other questions? So about 10 years ago, I went to a CMCP event uh, where you honored um, the then general counsel of Microsoft. So you mentioned Microsoft in their rewards program. And he, out he outlined Microsoft's diversity efforts that included not only a component of an economic benefit, but also um, internal evaluations of their lawyers and their ability to ensure a diverse um, outside counsel team that represented Microsoft. So I was happy to hear that Microsoft's efforts are still 
continuing and that your good work is still going to continue. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to the judicial diversity. I'd like to welcome to the table Judge Brenda Harbin Forte, Vice Chair of COAF, and Judge Kevin Brazil from the LA Superior Court. Good afternoon. I want to thank you for the opportunity to address you um, again on my favorite topic, the um, judicial diversity uh, topic. I want to um, talk a little bit, uh, and um, so we're not ready for that slide yet. Leave the main slide up, sorry. What I want to talk about is, first of all, I'll give you a little bit of history uh, about uh, efforts on judicial diversity and a little bit of personal history um, as well. Um, I was on the, um, on the State uh, Judicial Council from 1996 to 1999. Um, <clears throat> around that time, there were various reports that were coming out uh, in and around that time. One of them was the race and ethnic bias report that the Judicial Council, um, <clears throat> Judicial Council Commission. That report um, was presented to the council. And during that report, in that report, there were details regarding some um, appalling and troubling stories uh, of lawyers your members who were coming into our courtrooms and who were being treated a particular way, um, <clears throat> and which meant that your members were not able to represent their clients effectively and not able to, um, to get the actual justice for their clients uh, that was deserved. When we um, accepted the race and ethnic bias report from the Judicial Council, it was a very contentious meeting. Uh, there were very strong views about it, um, lots of um, strong opinions. Um, there were those of us who um, were, um, who could validate some of the concerns because as ethnic minority lawyers and me as an African American uh, lawyer who had appeared in the various courtrooms, we um, could lend some legitimacy and express some concern about the things that were being reported. Uh, around that, that time as well in the 90s, there was also the gender bias report that the Judicial Council Commission and it talked about the experiences of women uh, in the court system. And also there were public hearings, so members of the public also came in. But we knew there was a problem uh, in the 1990s. Um, after those reports, there were various recommendations and things that were, were done, but no real effort ad that addressed the lack of diversity in our court system and how that might be impacting the negative experiences that lawyers and members of the public were, um, <clears throat> were receiving. There was um, no plan of action to address judicial diversity at all. There were no studies asking uh, about you know, what are our numbers? What are our demographics? What do our courts look like? What can we do to increase and improve the experiences of court users? It was not until, not until 2005, almost 10 years after those reports came out, that something was done to talk about judicial diversity. And it was your leadership. It was the bold leadership of the state bar in terms of in terms of uh, creating the, the um, diversity pipeline task force in 2005, and then eventually in 2006, convening the state bar convened the first summit on diversity in the judiciary. And yes, the Judicial Council was one of the co-sponsors of that, of that um, summit, but it was a historic summit. We had everybody at the table who could make a difference in terms of judicial diversity. We had the law schools, we had bar associations, we had members of the legislature, we had the governor's office there, the judicial appointment secretary to talk about the importance of, of diversity. Um, there was also some legislation that eventually passed, that SB 56, uh, that, um, that eventually was passed. In fact, um, that was Joe Dunn's bill. Everybody remembers Joe Dunn. 
Don, Senator Joe Don at the time. Um, <clears throat> so that was his bill that basically tied uh, funding and new judgeships to uh, an increase in diversity, required the collection of demographic information because we had no idea we could not go to our judicial council and say, how many women do you have on the bench? How many African Americans? How many uh, Latinos? How many API members of the bench? How many uh, LGBT members? None of that information was available uh, to us. So that was the 2006 summit, and um, we had a plan of action after that 2006 summit. We, um, <clears throat> the legislation passed SB 56 that required the collection of demographic uh, information uh, from the Judicial Council, from the, um, from the state bar, uh, the Jenny Commission in terms of how many people were actually getting through the evaluation process, and as well from the, um, <clears throat> from, uh, from, from the governor's office, so that we could get information about how many people were being appointed, how many women, how many ethnic minorities, so we could get that information. The uh, diversity uh, summits were held, the first one was in 2006, five years later, another one was held in 2011, another one in 2016, hopefully if we keep with our five-year goal, there'll be another one in 2021. But what we do is sort of do a report card, and we look and see what progress have we made in terms of increasing diversity on the bench. And we've been looking for some measurable outcomes as well. And um, what we've had in terms of the next slide, now where did Donna go? Get me the... All right. The next slide is, shows basically a comparative analysis of where we began in 2006 when we held that first summit and where we are now at the end of 2007, which is the latest, uh, 2017 rather, the latest report, uh, uh, official report that's required under SB uh, 56. And what we saw in 2006, uh, starting at the far left, the white population was 40.6%. Uh, there were over 70% though of the judges were Caucasian. Um, in 2000, um, at the end of 2017, that population has gone down. The percentage of Caucasians has also gone down because we have increased diversity on the bench. So it's at 67.5%. For African Americans, on uh, the next slide, you'll see the 7% population and 4.5% of the judiciary in, in uh, 2006 and then 5.8% of the population, but over 7% of the judiciary now. Asian Pacific Islanders, similarly, um, look at the kind of brownish reddish bar, 4.5% in 2006, now up to 7.4%. The Latinos uh, were at 6.3% in 2006 when we had that first summit and now up to 10.3% at the end of 2017. So we have seen an increase, and it has been due to, to your leadership and it's due to, um, to the actions of the state bar through its council on access and fairness. Some of the, um, and let's go to gender diversity. Next slide, please. With respect to gender diversity, you'll see that in 2006, when we had the first summit, it was 27.1% women on the bench. And uh, at the end of 2017, that number had risen to 34.5% of the bench. Uh, and um, <clears throat> for the men, again, you'll see the percentage of 72, almost 73% in 2006, and down to about 65% as we've gotten more women uh, appointed to the bench as well. So um, those are the kinds of measurable results that we have seen. And again, that was due to the bold action and the bold leadership of the, uh, of the state bar in terms of the diversity summits, in terms of the other things that the COAF has done. We have also uh, worked with the governor's office, for example, in terms of um, trying to get the online application done. We addressed some issues. I spoke about those kinds of things uh, before when I, was, when I was last before, at least the programs committee or planning committee um, before, so I won't go through, uh, through all of those. But we've had programs on that essentially demystify the judicial appointments uh, process 
that the state bar has put on, and people have attended that. Uh, again, with the, with the uh, governor's judicial appointment secretary, there have also been mentoring programs where we've had put on ways to get appointed to the bench, uh, having uh, applications reviewed, uh, and uh, having the uh, governor's judicial appointment secretary address um, the attendees to tell them what the governor's office was looking for in, uh, in any judicial, um, in, any, in, in the judicial applicants. So um, <clears throat> the State Bar has, um, we've also seen in terms of your membership, your constituency, what we've seen is um, some um, <clears throat> encouragement of, uh, of uh, a more diverse population seeking appointment to the bench and actually getting appointed to the bench uh, as well. Uh, and more a more diverse group of lawyers running for open seats to get on onto the bench, and that is all because the, the state bar basically has said that we want a more diverse judiciary. We 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 think it's important and uh, a recognition. We hope that uh, that your lawyers uh, need to appear in a setting that allows them to be treated fairly and to um, to get justice for their clients. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, I'm going to show you the next couple of slides. They show you in bar form where we are, I'm sorry, in uh, pie chart form where we are now uh, in terms of um, the sitting judges. Um, that's ethnic diversity, that first pie chart. Again, 67.5% Caucasian judges. And you'll see the small pieces of the pie for the other um, ethnic minority groups. And the actual total number. The next slide shows the bar, bar graph, a pie chart. I'm sorry, for uh, for gender diversity in the courts. Again, obviously overwhelmingly male, with 65.5 percent and 34.5 percent. Even though the population of women in California is about 50 percent, a little over 50 percent. Um, so, um, so we have talked about trying to ensure that our judiciary. Uh, reflects the rich diversity of California. I know that there will uh, be discussions regarding um, the State Bar's role in terms of what we do um, and what you do, rather, uh, including the size of the uh, of, of COAF. Uh, I think you know the history that COAF really was a combination, a compilation of five different um, sections, uh, committees of the bar, with five different areas of focus, women, et cetera. Uh, and I, it all came together uh, under the uh, State Bar's Council on Access and Fairness. Um, there's certainly a discussion about the, um, the role of the State Bar in terms of whether or not this really, this issues really belong primarily to the Judicial Council uh, and not to the State Bar. Uh, and you will make a decision regarding what should be done. And we have um, Judge Brazil here who will talk about uh, what the Judicial Council um, has been or will be or will be doing, and others may have information regarding the Judicial Council. I would only say that I hope that you that the State Bar doesn't walk away from its history. It was you created this. You started a movement. You educated people and sensitized people to the idea that a diverse judiciary was in the best interest of the lawyers and the members of the public who were coming into these courtrooms. And were it not for your leadership, I think there might still well be a lot of discussion and, uh, and a lot of wringing of hands, but perhaps certainly not the kind of increase in the levels that we have seen. So I would hope that as you decide that you look to see whether or not there are some concrete plans for someone else taking on the responsibility um, and, and not just aspirations, uh, but there be some concrete plans. And again, I, in the 20 something years that I have been involved with this and have worked on it, uh, it has been the state bar that has been the leader. So I think it's imperative that the state bar maintain its leadership role. And certainly, 
we will obviously work with the Judicial Council and anyone else uh, who will do it. But I do hope that the State Bar maintains its leadership role and is seen as the leader on this issue because it is your members who are most adversely affected by a judiciary that, is, that lacks diversity and that lacks sensitivity to issues uh, affecting all of, the, um, all of the diverse groups, including LGBTs, uh, including the disabled. Uh, and and um, <clears throat> without that leadership on your part, uh, I don't think that we would have seen the progress that we have seen um, since, the, since 2005. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, since 1996, when I was on the Judicial Council. Um, so again, I want to thank you for, uh, for that. I, again, we talked a lot before, and I think that uh, any reports that, uh, that are needed, I would also encourage you to, um, to be provided a copy of the Council's um, race and, uh, Racial and Ethnic Bias Report, the Judicial Council's, as well as the Gender Bias Report. Read some of the stories and then think about what's still going on in some of our courtrooms today. There is still much work to be done, still a lot of work to be done. And so um, it is getting done and attention is being, uh, is being paid to issues because of your leadership. So I would encourage you not to step back from that, but to continue the bold actions that you have uh, engaged in in the past. Um, <clears throat> I will take uh, certainly any, any questions, and, uh, if anyone has those before um, Judge Brazil will, uh, will talk, if anyone has in, uh, any questions. And we can certainly get you a summary of all of the accomplishments of the State Bar's Council on Access and Fairness that we did um, with 25 or so members then. Um, will be difficult to continue to do with, um, with, with 10, but I understand that that is a recommendation, but I'm hoping that there would be sufficient personnel to do all of the work, sufficient members to do all of the things that need to be done in order to maintain your wonderful um, track record of increasing diversity on the bench. Thank you. Yes. I can take any questions now or later. Uh, otherwise, I think. Okay. Judge yeah. Brazil. Judge Brazil. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I. Yes. The bottom. Can you hear me now? I feel like I'm on that commercial. Can you hear me now? <laughs> So uh, my name is Judge Kevin Brazil, and I'm the presiding judge of the LA Superior Court. And I'm also the co-chair of the Judicial Council's Access and Fairness Committee, providing access and fairness. It's one of the advisory committees that the Judicial Council has established. I became the co-chair just uh, in September. And my other co-chair is uh, Justice Lori Zelon. And the purpose of our committee is pretty much to make uh, recommendations to the council about the judicial system, fairness in the state courts, as well as diversity in the judicial branch, as well as court services regarding self-represented parties. The advisory committee exists to support the goal of the judicial branch strategic plan, which is access, fairness, and diversity. As it relates to this panel, that goal includes the following. Members of the judicial branch community, who will strive to understand and be responsive to the needs of the court users from diverse cultural backgrounds. The makeup of California's judicial branch will reflect the diversity of the state's residents. To that end, uh, we like to partner with the State Bar to update the Judicial Council's Judicial Diversity Toolkit, a toolkit of programs designed to increase the diversity of applicants for judicial appointment. The toolkit was conceived as a result of the 2006 Summit on Judicial Diversity, which Judge Harbin Forte has just described to you, which was also co-sponsored by the State Bar, the Judicial Council, and various state and local and specialty bar groups. The toolkit was created by the Council in 2010. It contains model programs designed for presentation to diverse attorneys to encourage them to apply for judicial appointment. Some of the programs are collaborations among judges, the courts, and local bar associations. Some are model pipeline programs focused on acquainting students with the justice system. Now, this toolkit has not been updated since 2010. So 
the Providing Access and Fairness Committee that I chair, we are going to be forming an ad hoc group of advisory committee members from the uh, Providing Access and Fairness Committee to spearhead the updating of the Judicial Diversity Toolkit. We've had one meeting last year talking about the toolkit. We've got some members from the State Bar who are going to be helping us, and we appreciate the work and the assistance that the State Bar will be giving us. I know Judge Harbin Forte, Judge Holly Fuji, and some staff from the State Bar are going to be assisting us with this toolkit, and it's very important. Uh, it'll create a roadmap for courts and judges on how to best conduct the necessary outreach and engage with those who want to be a judge and don't know how to best to achieve that goal. I was one of those people 16, 17 years ago, or maybe don't even know what, what is their goal. So I want to talk a little bit about the forms and a variety of programs that we have yet to conceive, but updating the toolkit is just the first step. And the council, and the chief in particular, as well as the other council members, take diversity very seriously. And we are very gratified that the State Bar is willing to work with us and to help us. Now, in the LA Superior Court, we have some programs that I think will be helpful statewide. And if you really want to do something about diversity, you have to do community outreach. And community outreach starts, and this may have already been talked about, but it really starts in the high schools, it starts in the colleges, it starts in the law schools. At LA Superior Court, we have a large community outreach committee consisting of about 50 judges. And we go out to the schools, we go out to the law schools, and we hold our own diversity summits uh, at LA Superior Court. We've held a few, and we've even had the former Judicial Appointment Secretary Josh Groban, now State Supreme Court Justice Josh mm -hmm. Groban, uh, attend those diversity summits. And it's, again, the toolkit is something that's an online tool that's helpful. But to really make a difference, we've got to get out in the community and talk. We have to have face-to-face -face interaction. And that's what we do at the LA Superior Court where our judges, again, we have teen court, we have the SHADES program, which is basically focusing on high school students committing hate crimes, and we work with the probation department and our other justice partners so that the kids can see how the system really works and that a career is, u is useful in being a judge or going on to be a lawyer. Uh, and I'll just tell you my own experience. When I came up, I'm born and raised here in Los Angeles. I never knew any judges. I never knew any lawyers. And it wasn't really until I got to college that I even know or met a lawyer or judge for the very first time. And that has to happen early on. They have to see us. They have to talk to us. They have to hear our stories. I mean, I have a story. Brenda has a story. Marguerite has a story. Those kind of stories resonate with people who want to get into the legal profession. Because when you talk about diversity, what does that really mean? How do you accomplish that? We can say we want diversity, but we have to have some concrete plans in place to make it happen. And community outreach, face-to-face -face communication, just like I'm here today, we got to go into the schools, the high schools, the law schools, and we have to work with the bar associations. We have several minority bar associations here in Los Angeles and they are a rich resource of applicants. One of the things we do here in Los Angeles, uh, the LA Superior Court, some of our judges, we have our own vetting where we actually go out and identify attorneys that we think should make a judicial application. But it doesn't stop there. We vet them, we work with them, we work with them on their applications so that they submit a quality document because they have to be rated by the Jenny Commission, they have to be rated by the LA County Bar, so we try to guide them through that process. So to really make diversity a reality, those are the kinds of things that judges have to do. You know, Brenda has a group up in Northern California where they do the same thing, where we as judges, we feel as though, who knows better than we do about what it takes to be a good judge? Okay, sorry, I gotta get used to this. Who knows better than we do what it takes to be a good judge? So we've decided, We've got to do something about it. We've got to step up. So in LA Superior Court, that's what we're doing. That's why we do the vetting. We identify judges. And again, we basically shepherd them through the process. And this is a simple model, but it's a model that can apply statewide for any minority group. The Latino judges are doing the same thing. The Asian judges are following the same model. 
We have a lot of leaders here in LA Superior Court who've led the charge, like Judge Kelvin Filer in Compton, Judge Allen Webster in Compton. Uh, some of our retired judges are even involved in our diversity outreach efforts. So it's important and it works. So again, the toolkit is something that's important, but it's a start. Also, the judicial summits that we've had in LA and in other places, we need to have those regional summits. If we could have them not only in Southern California, but in Northern California, Central California, that makes a difference. Because a lot of times, and I mentor a lot of lawyers, I mentor a lot of college students, they just have to know, is it possible? Because people have to know somebody truly believes in them. Because a lot of times, you don't believe you can do something until somebody else tells you you can't. And that's what we're trying to do here. That's what we're trying to kickstart is let people know, yes, you can do it. I did it. I share a similar story to, of yours. I'm going to help you. I'm going to be with you and make this a reality. That's how diversity works. So you know, I'm all for the diversity toolkit, and I'm happy to be on the committee and be as the co-chair. But I, I want the message that I wanted to say to you all today it's time to roll up our, our sleeves and get to work. And get to work means we all have to be out there in the community, reaching out, finding the people who can become lawyers, who can become judges, and helping them and being a guide. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions? I looked up the answer. Any questions? <laughs> so I have a comment. Uh, and, and then a question. Uh, so I've been to uh, several of the LA County uh, diversity uh, events, and they've been wonderful. Uh, I, I imagine that LA County must be uh, one of the more um, active uh, court houses uh, in, in California, pushing diversity on the uh, bench. So I think we're in good hands with you as the co-chair of those efforts in the Judicial Council. Um, another observation. Um, from the description of the Judicial Council's efforts or even the LA County Courthouse's efforts, there seems to be a lot of opportunity there. Um, this COAP also, and the State Bar also does similar types of activities. And I know we're sort of at the beginning of a partnership between the Judicial Council and the State Bar on judicial diversity. Um, aside from toolkit, which I think is in its, the reimagining is in its infancy, what are your thoughts about what a partnership would look like going forward? I think when we go into some of the law schools, when we go out to the oh, colleges. Can you hear your microphone? OK, I'm going to get this right before I leave today. <laughs> going out to the colleges, going out to the law schools, if we have members of the bar with us, when we talk to people about what it takes to get into the legal field, what it takes to be a lawyer, what it takes to be a judge, that's how we partner. We're doing this hand in hand with you. I don't want to be there by myself talking, it's nice to have a lawyer or somebody from the LA County Bar with me when we do these programs. We have a program very similar with the uh, ABTL, um, American Business Trial Lawyers Association, and where we go into the various law schools with one or two judges and four or five lawyers, usually a graduate of that school. So just what's coming up in March is we're gonna do one at USC Law School I'm a UCLA grad, go Bruins, so I'm going to do the one at UCLA. And we always have lawyers with us. So that's what's really important where lawyers and judges working together on diversity. Because when these kids, and when I say kids, kids, kids in college, people in law school, they need to see us. They need to talk to us. And it's not just me as the judge. When they can talk to a lawyer to say, this is my path. This is what I'm trying to do. You can do it too. And then I can say yes, and it all fits together. It's all part of a chain. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you all. Thank you. Thank you. All. Okay. So, um, time for the wrap up. Okay, so we're going to start with um, sort of seeing if we can define some sort of diversity goals, statewide diversity goals. And, and some of the options, and some of these options came out of our diversity summit and out of um, another meeting we had with COAF. 
and one of them was um, long-term goal was diversity of the attorney population matches the diversity of statewide population. And that was um, at a co-op planning meeting. I don't think, okay, it is up there. So, or the long-term, the diversity matches population in that county, or the interim goal could be diversity of the, of the attorney population matches the diversity of the California law school population, or the long-term goal, goal could be diversity of the judiciary matches the diversity of the statewide. So those are those are um, possible goals we can have. Um, we can sort of either sort of look to um, identifying one today, so to help the uh, programs committee tomorrow when they have to take this up as part of their programs um, meeting, so that if we already have some of these things sort of decided today, then it'll just be more of a ratification as opposed to them having to start the discussion all over again. I don't want to do this. Anybody have any uh, comments? No. Yeah. Joanna. Since Jason's not looking, I'll take your instruction. Um, the challenge I see is our strategic plan is a five-year strategic plan. And I hate for us to set goals that are so aspirational that they can't be met. And it seems this is, without any question, the long-term goal we would want to set, but we only have five years for whatever goal we set for ourselves. So I'm wondering if there's a more realistic goal that we can set in these, in these areas. Um, I'm more concerned about those areas we regulate, which, which are law schools and attorneys, and how we can impact those. Um, I'm wondering if we should be talking about a percentage of improvement over five years instead of equaling the population of the state in five years. Good point. The only um, distinction I would make is I, I think there's somewhat of a difference between kind of our overall organizational goal or vision for diversifying the profession and goals and objectives that wouldn't be included in any particular five-year strategic plan. So I think the two could live side by side. You could have, as an organizational goal, we believe that the long-term goal should be to match the statewide population. Um, I agree with you, within the confines of a five-year plan, you may need to set more modest increment benchmark goals, and perhaps even the interim goals that we have here are not realistically achieved within five years. Um, but I think you can, we could conceptually have kind of an organizational goal, our understanding, our vision for diversifying the profession, and then we have goals and objectives in five-year increments related to the each strategic plan cycle. Because one of the things having the long-term goal can go, can cover several um, strategic plans. You know, it covers, it always be sort of a benchmark you have for your next strategic plan is that you carry that one over. What I'm challenged with conceptually is where does the long-term goal go? Um, you know, our strategic plan is a document. It's a living document we we're working with regularly. Are we talking about putting something up on our website that says this is what we want, you know, ultimately to happen? I, I struggle with what this long-term goal is compared to anything else that we do with the bar. I don't think anyone would disagree that's a long-term goal. But I don't know where this is housed and how it's followed and um, you know, how we measure it going forward. So we have other long-term goals. We don't necessarily would have them anywhere. Well, wouldn't the, um, the articulation of a long-term goal would be something in which you would then establish the incremental um, steps to get to that long-term goal in the five-year plan, which is, I, I think, by the point that Jane was trying to make. So you can say, Diversity of attorney population matches the diversity of the statewide population. And then to your point about the five-year plan, to set goals in that five-year plan that achieves incremental percentage increases across the different categories of the population. And I think that would still be consistent with a long-term goal and also mesh 
with the strategic plan. I understand what you're saying. Um, to me, we look to our mission statement as our long term. You know, these are our focus I areas for the long term. We already men mentioned it. You know, diversity and inclusion in there. Um, I just, I don't know how much we're going to break it down for, are we just doing that with respect to diversity? Are we going to do that also with access to justice? Are we gonna look at our mission statement and break it down even more so and add long-term goals for each one of those things? I'm just having a hard time structurally trying to figure out what, do, what is a long-term goal for us? Where is it housed and how do we measure it going forward other than our strategic plan? So th those things easily get lost. You know. I think that's true. The strategic plan is kind of our living institutional. It is the institutional representation of our goals and objectives. And that's all we have right now. Um, and so the question of if you had this overarching long-term goal that was broader than something that was in any particular strategic plan, where would it actually live? Would it live in a board book? Would it live in the charter for the Council on Access and Fairness? Where would it live? We have the goal four objective of our current strategic plan, which is the access and inclusion objective. Um, actually, I think that one thing we probably need to do in addition to talking about adding objectives is modify this goal, right? Because the goal says support access to justice for all California residents and improvements to the state's justice system. It doesn't talk specifically about diversity and inclusion. So that's a concrete way, to your point, to incorporate a diversity uh, goal into an existing institutionalized document that reflects our values, the strategic plan, um, rather than just having it live somewhere else out in the ether. And, and I agree with you, things that live in the ether can get lost. Renee? Sorry, I think we're maybe over complicating this a bit. Um, there's no rule about what a strategic plan and a set of goals have to look like. In fact, I would say, in general, our strategic plan is incredibly detailed in a set of goals relative to what I typically see. So there's nothing that says you can't have an overarching set of goals, right? Longer term aspirational goals that I don't want to be too lofty, but you can actually reach, right? And then you have a set of goals underneath that. And then they progressively get more finite as you get down by department as to how you're going to achieve those. If you know what you're working to long term, I mean, it could be a 10 year goal, but plan is for three years and how you're going to make progress towards that and what the benchmark is you're trying to achieve in three years. So I don't see it as being problematic if you have that as an objective in the organization. And I think that's what I heard Jason speaking to a little bit in terms of incremental progress. And the question becomes, do we quantify that? Do we use a more aspirational word like meaningful progress? Is it 10%, 20%? I, I don't know. But I think the important point is that um, in light of our long-term aspirational goals, these particular s smaller subset of goals don't get lost anywhere. That, that there's an affirmative um, statement by this board that it's important to us in light of our statutory objective um, and that we're taking the following steps to move incrementally. And so I think, you know, the discussion that we can either have today or tomorrow is, you know, do we agree with goal four? Or do we need to change uh, the way goal four is added or at least present that to, um, you know, the various um, committees within the bar? And then if we agree on, on that, then um, how can we break out A and B of those plans to address some of the issues that we've talked about today, um, you know? What are those measurable, quantifiable steps that we can take to enhance, you know, sub A and sub B, and um, you know, put that into a work plan that staff can then look at that we can take to our stakeholders and you know, take those first steps. So I don't know, Jason, how do you how do you think is best to structure that? So 
my thought on the best way to structure it is to abide by the language of the uh, people in the adopting um, mission statement of the state law, which is a judicial system. <coughs> To me, the judicial system comprises of both attorneys and uh, judiciary. Um, I think the goalpost should be the statewide population. Um, that seems to me the most straightforward way to, to take a cut at diversity. You adopt those goals, and then it's up to us and those after us to, to identify the priorities, to use the data that we've compiled to address, for example, um, the law school retention for uh, certain segments of our population uh, to address our passage, uh, to prioritize the use of our resources to address the areas that are most in need as judged by us. So I don't think we need to, for example, limit ourselves to uh, one or any of these bullet points, but rather adopt um, a adopt goals that are consistent with the statute and then decide on the incremental part how we in, how we get towards those goals because we know we just can't do do everything so we need to figure out what we can do what we're best doing while still achieving the overall statutory mandate so then as far as ways that we've addressed these larger issues and you know in other areas and i can think of um like the appendix I review, where we we sat down as a, a board and said, okay, you know, here's this proposal out of A, B, and C, which do you classify as one? And we kind of went through that process. Do you think it'd be best to go through that discussion in open format like that to do a survey, um, getting people's rankings of, of the different uh, areas, and then have a discussion based upon kind of that, the compilation of all that data? I'm just trying to think of an efficient use of time. Right, no, I. I, I agree with that approach. I mean, I don't think we're going to come up with everything today. The most significant thing we can do as a board is to articulate what the goal for diversity is. Um, and I think we abide by the statute. And then as we continue with this work, and we as leadership, we're going to parse out the five things, let's say, uh, to, to address in, the, in this year, the next year, reflected in the five-year plan. So, so I would just, um, I, I think Highland and Debbie, you were prepared to kind of facilitate a conversation about specific objectives that we might consider incorporating in the plan. We may have confused things, including me, by starting to talk about reworking goal four itself as opposed to the objectives. Um, but I think, Brandon, in terms of you know, we're, we're a little behind schedule today, but I would suggest letting them lead that discussion about pipeline, career advancement, retention, and judicial diversity, what objectives might look like um, based on a, a board dialogue. And then that conversation could be continued further in the programs committee tomorrow. We have the strategic plan on the board's agenda tomorrow afternoon. So if we're, if it, the issues are, you know, if we've, um, if we're far enough along, the board could, in fact, adopt new objectives for the strategic plan tomorrow afternoon. We also, as a group of staff, could come up with uh, a proposal for modification of the goal four language itself. And I think our next panel will also facilitate that as we uh, do something similar, Joanna, and talk about a broad goal around access to legal services as distinct, perhaps, from anything that we might uh, set out to achieve in the near term. So, so I think we should turn it over to Highland and Debbie and talk about specific objectives. That yeah, I mean, I think in the interest of time too, I think you know we do have time allotted tomorrow for a lot of this discussion, but we wanted to get folks' reactions to you know there's different there's different points in time, or I guess. Yeah, points in time that we could focus our efforts on, right? So you heard about pipeline. You heard about retention and advancement. You heard a lot about data. There's a lot of things that can be done. And one question is, what is the appropriate role for the state bar, especially given, you know, the reorganization and the CLA? What belongs there? What belongs with the state bar? Um, 
you had a lot of information put out at you, and I think it would be really helpful to hear the board's reactions to all of that to help guide programs discussion tomorrow. So I, I mean, the one common denominator that I hear from the presenters is that we need more data or more consistent and reliable data. So, you know, in, in looking at the bar from a, a regulatory standpoint, should we take on maybe the, the way that data is collected and then, you know, the way our, our partners, you know, access it and then, and then use it to advance those objectives? I think we could be that clearinghouse for those studies and certainly invest the resources to make sure that we, A, have the proper benchmarks and B, um, you know, come up with, with strategies based upon the best possible data. Because mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any consistency between all these data sets and we could be talking about apples and oranges and not really realize it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think we are an organization, an entity that is uniquely positioned to serve in that role, um, both for the sake of consistency, as well as we just have access to all of these attorneys. And we have touches and communications with them regularly on a regular basis. And so we, unlike all of these disparate organizations, are uniquely positioned to serve that role. And it's, <clears throat> and it's a role that can be, that we can do based on all the different subentities. Like we were talking about like the bar examiners, the, the data that they can collect that also can maybe help inform how do we keep certain um, populations in law school? What is it we, we do? I mean, so it, it crosses various sections of the bar in terms of uh, our data collection. But um, I think I, I do. I think we're, we're, we're more qualified than anyone. So we have the touches. We have the staff. We feel that. Um, and everybody can just funnel it to us. It's just easier to tell everyone to send your information to the bar as opposed to some sort of, you know, um, anyone else. Josh? Um, are, are there any issues with voluntary versus mandatory? I mean, I do think that um, it seems like I was surprised how little information we do have. Um, and it would seem that there are a lot of touches that we could make it mandatory. Um, and to gather that information and to share it, uh, has that come up before? That, does anybody know? Has that been an issue? What information mandatory? Um, so the, the, the for instance, the survey that um, we did last year, I think you said it was, um, that had a very small percentage of people oh. that participated. When we um, do a survey, uh, have we thought about making it mandatory and has that ever come up as an issue? And when I say mandatory, I mean, you know, in order to, before you can, uh, part of your CLE, before you pay your dues, things like that online, you'd have to go through that survey to kind of advance to the next page. We have done it. the current survey we have, for example, is mandatory in that sense. You you have to advance through it in order to get to the um, licensee billing to be able to pay your dues. We I don't believe that we can force you to actually complete the survey. And what we really can't force, which is the real problem, is we can't force people to give accurate information, um, which is another one of our of our issues. So. I mean, it's certainly something we can talk further about with OGC in terms of our ability to so require. We do have a strategic plan objective right now that says that the board will implement a rule that requires attorneys, requires attorneys to report their practice type. And that's very, was at the time particular to our intention to move into prevention um, work and wanting to do early identification of attorneys transitioning into solo practitioner status. So we have certainly thought about making some elements of this reporting mandatory, and we can talk to OGC about extending that. It just occurred to me that I'm fortunate enough that somebody at my firm pays my licensing fees. Um, and so I haven't seen the survey that you're talking about in the context of going online and doing that. I don't know if we as an organization have talked about dealing with that dynamic, not the organization, but your staff. Yeah, we have. Carolina could briefly say what we're trying to do. Again, it's not, it's not mandatory at this point, but what we plan that's, to do. So that's one thing that um, we did take into consideration when we were rolling out the survey. And so um, once the billing period has come to an end, we are working with our agency billing staff that are going to provide extensive outreach. Um, they have a really great 
a relationship with a lot of the admin that support the attorneys and the firms to encourage them to complete those surveys as well as reach out to some of the affinity groups. And you still need to go to your state bar profile to print your um, your bar card. Yes. If you want a bar card, because we no longer one of our business process improvements, we don't send all those plastic cards out uh, when most people don't actually use them. So you do have to go to your profile to get the card. So anytime you go to the profile, you'll see the survey. But it is kind of a flaw. It's not a flaw. It's just an issue. When we implemented all of the wonders of agency billing, it means that there's a whole group of attorneys that don't have to go to the state bar profile anymore. Okay. Did I borrow the mic? I wanted to say one thing quickly about the data, um, just because it's um, it was it wasn't seventeen percent of the data. It was actually uh, seventeen percent of the attorney population. It was actually seventeen thousand responses that we got in the survey. So it's a smaller percentage, but in terms of response rate and in terms of reliability of the data. It's a good sample. It's actually a really, really good and detailed look at the at the attorney population. So, I, and, and I say this partly because um, I've worked with the data a little bit, and we can say a lot about the attorney population using that data. But I would also hate the for, for the um, the desire for like the best possible data to prevent us from moving forward on things that we already know. And the, <clears throat> the things that we already know, I think, are consistent with the national data. They're slightly different for California, but generally. We can say a lot about the the profile of the attorney population in California without needing to say, "Hey, let's just wait and make sure we you know we got the perfect data." Because my concern, is, I've seen this in the past, is that sometimes that becomes a, sort of the goal in itself, and you lose sight of of the old, other goals you might have in mind. So I'd like to move us, unless Donna, you have something. I was just going to try to move us past data to one more topic. So I was just going to say to supplement what you started um, this conversation with. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting when the bar convened the diversity summit in August is we went around the room and we asked the participants, uh, what are some of the things that your organization is doing? And to a person, we, we, heard, we heard the same things, right? We're doing, we are doing um, uh, uh, workshops for people who want to be judges. We, want, we are doing mentoring. We are doing, and there was, there was a lot of repetition and one of the things that I think that brought home for us and that started some of the staff thinking process on this is um, we don't need to be doing what everybody else is doing. That's not where we add value. We need to figure out sort of how we can assist the local bar associations and the, um, the umbrella affinity organizations, how we can assist them to better do the work that they do, what they need from us in order to make that happen, um, where we are uh, uniquely suited um, to do something that somebody else can't do, that's where we can add value. Um, doing the same thing that the local and the minority bar associations are doing may not be the, the place where we add the most value. Yeah. And to piggyback on that, I mean, one of the things that we also heard from Robert's presentation from the CMCP is in addition to serving a unique role with respect to data, we also serve a role with respect to standard setting. So we require elimination of bias CLE. Um, and is there a role, you know, could we work with that to help promote more diversity and inclusion? Um, Robert raised some interesting ideas about separating out elimination of bias CLE into sort of subtopics. There may be other ideas around that, um, and I think that fits squarely into our um, regulation and discipline role as well. And, uh, and also, he mentioned something about standardizing what the the, um, the training would be, sort of setting what the standards are, and having the bar maybe set those standards so that you know, because depending on who you get as an instructor, you know, having it be so that's more of a uniform sort of um, presentation to everybody who takes that training. So um, that may be something where we can. Um, we can weigh in on. Certain and certain an certain objective certain. I'd like to see in that perspective is for us to look at the MCLE requirements to determine if we need to break it down and determine whether or not the state bar should be offering it online with an, as an interactive course like we do for the, the first year MCLE requirements. Just it, and every attorney would have to take whatever we're requiring once every three years for their MCLE. And that way we control the standards because we control the content. So I think we're going to uh, cut it off to extremely valuable presentations, a lot of information. Um, and I think we'll pick it up tomorrow, the program's discussion. Thank you very much, Eileen and Debbie.
So with that, let's take a, uh, a short break and then move on to our next discussion.
Okay, we're gonna get started, everyone. I will turn it over to Donna. For yes. The next segment. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to introduce this panel for you. Um, this is our access to justice slash access to the legal system panel. Um, <clears throat> My main point in presenting right now is just to tell you how um, what we're asking of you right now is different from what we just asked of you with regard to diversity and inclusion. Um, again, as you know, our strategic, our, uh, strategic plan, our state bar mission statement includes, um, thanks to you, the inclusion of, um, of um, a focus on uh, greater access to and inclusion in the legal system. Um, what we have discovered is that we don't have we don't have a good definition of what access means. We haven't put our arms around that yet. Um, we have developed strategic plan objectives. So unlike the diversity panel where we were asking you to think about what should our objectives be, we're not asking you to think about objectives for um, <clears throat> for access at this time. Um, our resources are working very hard on making sure all of those access ob objectives can be accomplished. Um, so we can consider more in future years, but we're not asking for them right now. So what is it that we are asking you to do? <clears throat> we're, asking, we're asking you to help define the parameters of, um, of access for the for state bar work. Um, and uh, uh, similar to what we were talking about with, um, with diversity, we want to identify the areas that are most appropriate um, for state bar intervention, the areas where we are uniquely suited to contribute to the broader discussion and the broader advocacy on access to justice and access to the legal system. Um, it's taking a look at sort of what does access mean and then what let's focus in on what our role on access should be. Um, as we talk about um, the sort of the the many things that access to justice and access to the legal system mean to us, I think there will be, I imagine there will be agreement, broad agreement across the table that all of it is critically important. Um, nobody by, by the state bar focusing their efforts, we are in no way intending to suggest that anything is not important. It is all critically important. It is a question of where the state bar can add, add the most value, where the state bar is uniquely situated to, um, to step in, where we can provide the most value, um, and sort of what fits within the, the purview, the general purview of the state bar. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over <clears throat> to Justice Zelon and to Selena Copeland. Please introduce yourselves and, and take us down this path. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laurie Zelon. Um, my uh, current day job is uh, an associate justice on the Court of Appeal here in Los Angeles. Um, I was the first chair of the California Commission on Access to Justice and a member of the uh, task force, uh, the, the working group that developed the report in 1996, which I carry with me everywhere, um, and have been working um, in this area both in California and nationally for quite some time. And I'm Selena Copeland, Executive Director of the Legal Aid Association of California. Um, and we, are, you know, our focus is really on improving and increasing access to civil legal services for indigent Californians. Um, but primarily, we really serve as a connector in the community. We help make sure that legal aid programs are aware of what's going on, that they are aware of best practices, that they can work together. Um, and my organization serves um, in appointment, feel, I guess, as an appointer to the Access Commission, and we also serve as liaisons to a number of different committees and commissions. So I'm here a lot, and I was here last year um, doing a similar presentation, but I'm, I'm always happy to see you. Okay, so we thought we'd set the table for you a little bit for the discussion, and I want to start in 1996 with the Justice for All report because that was the significant um, effort by the state bar to figure out uh, one approach to doing it. The goal, as stated, was to ensure the right to civil justice for all Californians, to foster systemic improvements in the state civil justice system that will expand access to the system for all Californians, and to develop adequate funding to provide meaningful access to quality justice for low and moderate income people when they need it. 
those goals still ring true today. The report made a variety of recommendations, which I'm not going to spend your time going through now. You, you have the materials. But a lot of the goals uh, still ring true today. But what I want to do is fast forward 23 years from the adoption of this report and the establishment of the Access to Justice Commission. There have been enormous changes. Um, with the development of the web, there is the ability for people to access an awful lot of information on the web, some of it organized, some of it less organized. Um, there are self-help centers in California uh, in every county, uh, in the courthouses and in, in law libraries and public libraries outside of the courthouses. Um, the level of funding through IOLTA and through the Equal Access Fund has undergone a lot of change in a positive direction since this report was adopted. And our support statewide for innovation in the delivery of legal services has also increased. Uh, we have the Shriver Project, which has tested in critical areas. Um, we have the partnership projects, which are established through 10% of the Equal Access Fund, which are partnerships between legal services and courts to uh, improve the system. We've done some simplification efforts in terms of court forms and fillable forms and some simplification of process. Um, we have made real steps forward in language access, real steps forward, meaning we're, we're taking three steps where 100 are needed, but those three really count. So lots of things have gone forward. But what I wanted to put on the table was um, a conceptual change. Because um, we've always, uh, as a community and a large community, thought about um, access to justice largely from a representational capacity. And it has become clear over the years as we've gone from legal needs study to legal needs study to legal needs study that no matter what kind of resources we put into providing more representation and into making changes in the system around that, we're not really significantly moving the needle, both because the poverty population keeps increasing, because middle income people are increasingly priced out of um, paying for representation, uh, and for a variety of reasons. And so what a lot of thought has been given to is the concept of the continuum of services. And what the continuum of services says is that as a system, we should provide help that ranges from information for people who just need to know, do I have a legal problem, and is there some place I can go? all the way to full representation. And steps along the way are limited scope representation, which this board adopted some years ago, um, self-help, um, and various other things. And so keeping in mind that the continuum provides more services to more people. And if we can make those services meaningful so that people get what they need when they need it in a way they can use it, that that really begins to unlock that, that door that stands in the way of full access. So Selena's going to talk more about the numbers. But the bottom line is that large numbers of Californians have no meaningful access to justice, not just to the courts, but to the means to use the entire legal system to solve problems. And so we have unmet need going this way. We have resources here. There's no match between the need and the resources. So the question for the entire access community, which includes Selena's group and legal services groups and private lawyers and pro bono lawyers and bar associations and the Access Commission and the courts, is really how do we reduce the unmet need, maximize the available resources, and take those resources that we have and use them in the most effective and efficient manner so that we provide the most services to the most people with the resources that we have. And, and that's kind of where um, I thought it might help us to begin the discussion. And Selena has detail on numbers. And <laughs> Just a little bit. Uh, so you know, the State Bar will soon be embarking on a, its own justice gap study here in California to figure out what are, what are the number of unmet civil legal needs of California's low and moderate income individuals. 
but we have a national study that was actually presented to you this time last year. And we have a couple of pieces of data that's actually really helpful when we think about the scope of current need here in California. So just based on income alone, about a little over 8 million Californians are eligible for free legal services. And so it's over 8 million. And if we look at the national study, about 70% of low-income households had a civil legal need just in the prior year, at least one. Um, and the numbers are actually slightly worse for rural parts of the nation. So we assume it's probably slightly worse for rural California, for those of you who remember my, my talk about rural access issues. But you know, about 70% of that 8 million probably had a civil legal need in the past year, um, likely more than one. Um, so that's about you know, almost 6 million Californians. And 80% um, of those in, in the national study actually have inadequate or no legal help for those problems. You know, many of them don't even know that their life problem has a legal solution, so they don't seek help. So um, on top of those who don't even know to seek help, those who do seek help are not getting the services that they need. And in the um, Legal Services Corporation study, you know, between 85 and 97 percent of that, you know, gap in the, the reason why people weren't being served when they actually knew to go and ask for help when they knew they had a legal problem, 80, 85 to 97 percent of that was explained by lack of resources. So we frequently go back to the resources issues where if we had more attorneys, if we had more offices, if we had more um, of everything to help support people, more advocates, more social workers, we definitely could do more. Um, but you know, to put that a bit in perspective, if we had those 6 million Californians, if all of them knew that they had a legal problem and they all went to their local legal aid office, it would be very hard to handle all of their issues with full representation. We only have about 1,200 legal aid attorneys here in California. Um, and with very rough math, it's about 4,500 clients per attorney per year. Um, so we have to figure out other ways to, to help you know, meet these legal needs, whether it's through um, increased self-help services at the courts, more online tools that people can use to answer their questions. Um, there are things that, that the state bar and others can consider because legal aid attorneys cannot take on 4,500 clients and we're not yet in a position where we can hire an, an entire core of attorneys to give the full scope representation. Um, and so the need, of course, is very vast. Um, I've been at this table many times since the building opened to have this conversation. Um, and the Civil Justice Strategies Task Force had some really great recommendations that we may refer to as they pop up. Um, but we keep coming to have these, these conversations because, as Justice Elon said, we do make great changes. The State Bar has pushed forward a number of reforms that are, that are very helpful in increasing access to justice and increasing access to legal system. And so now's a great opportunity to think through with your strategic plan and your, your objectives, what do you want to do now? Um, and so we hope to have brainstorming to wake everybody up. And then after our brainstorming session is, is over, then we're going to kick it over to your, um, you know, your colleagues on the board to actually get more um, specific with what you'd like to do. Was, was with a question for you, which is, what do you think of when you hear the term access to justice? What does it mean to you? I'll weigh in. I'm challenged by the term justice because I don't feel like it really fits what we're talking about because when many people think of justice, they think of the court system. And that's really... And the state bar doesn't have a direct role in the court system. I like the use of, you know, legal needs as being a better term than justice. But I, I think of our new technology task force talking about innovation and what the state bar can do to improve those services and that information to the masses in a way that it makes it much more accessible with respect to changing our regulations to allowing those things. To me, that's a perfect example of what we can be doing in this space. But I, justice, it, it suggests the court. And it's so many people don't even need to go to the court to resolve their legal issues. Right. L let me push back on that for a minute just to see if, if I, I can s sow a seed for conversation. Um, th there have been some studies done on procedural fairness. Uh, and they talk about the fact that people, not lawyers, not judges, who are all tied to outcomes, but normal people, um, feel that justice is, being, is having someone listen to you and to hear you fairly and to make an attempt to work with you to solve your problem. 
And procedural justice is more important to people sometimes than getting the outcome they went in for. And so if you think of justice as larger than the court, but really the idea of a just society in which people don't face barriers that there are solutions for, then I think you can talk about access to justice outside of the court, because I agree with you completely. Access to justice may mean, in, for some people, getting linked up with the proper social services. Um, and it, it's well beyond the court system. Um, but I think because people focus on procedural fairness, justice does have a meaning to people outside of the courts. I just would like our conversation to think much further beyond that to the transactional nature of people's needs as well as, you know, that was a great example as well because it's a, not that many people necessarily have to get involved with the court system to, to deal with their legal needs. And so I think we should be looking at the broader picture. What if we define justice? in terms of what we're hoping to do. You could call it something like equitable and availability to the, to the courts, legal representation and or legal advice. So it kind of covers all of those different types of things that people need assistance with in the legal community. I mean, you know me, I, I like to define things to know where we're headed. And justice, I agree with you, you know, we need to define it if we're gonna come up with some programs to head towards it. So something along those lines, you could define justice. The, the challenge, and I, I wouldn't disagree necessarily that we need to define it. With respect to your definition, I, we have to think about the scope of what we can do as a regulatory agency. And I, I struggle with how the state bar can implement regulations or change things that would improve access to the courts. To me, that's a judicial council function. I understand. So I would I focus more on the, you know, the, the need for that, legal but, issue services. Um, what concerns me is, you know, I had a conversation with a judge. He was, we were interviewing him for a different position and came up in a different context. And he said, and he was in a civil department and he had done family law. And he said 70% of the litigate, litigants that come before him have no lawyers. And I asked around, I asked the attorneys. They were saying 65 to 70% or more in family law have no lawyers. They come in there simply on their own. And so that's why I say access to courts is more than just walking in the courtroom. It, it's access to the legal representation, not a lawyer or advice or something um, that makes it equal for everybody that's participating. How about the fair resolution of disputes? and problems that require legal solutions. How about it? Well, what I'm saying, <laughs> what I'm saying is that goes beyond the courts to you know, alternative dispute resolution, uh, people having the ability to negotiate for themselves, information that provides people the ability to solve their problems. And it takes the focus away from the courts, which is a narrow focus that, that I think Trustee Mendoza is pushing away from. Well, I get that, but you got a farm worker out in the middle of, you know, the farm in the middle of the Central Valley that doesn't know anything about fair resolution or the court or anybody to even talk to. That, to me, is kind of includes part of justice, certainly access. I just, I, I wanted to um, say that perhaps we didn't frame this discussion appropriately because I think, Joanna, that distinction or the issue that you identified is the, sort of precisely what we want to have the board um, grapple with, that there may in fact in, a, appropriately be a very broad definition of access and what it means, and that that's entirely appropriate. Um, certainly when I think of access, just the, the words I would throw up, they do include things like interpreters. You don't have access if you can't understand what's going on, not just in court, but to communicate with your lawyer. Uh, it includes court reporters, because you don't really have access if you have no access to an appellate right, because there's no record. I mean, that's a really important part of access. Um, so there are a lot of components of access. 
and I think it's it, it's a very valuable for this board to really um, think through or just take some time to think about what does it mean to us. And that may be different from where we decide it's appropriate for us to focus as a statewide regulatory body uh, that regulates attorneys and the practice of law. And those two things can co coexist and sort of similar to what we were talking about with diversity. Uh, we may have a very broad diversity goal, but decide that at least in the near to medium term, our focus is much more narrow. And I think we're going to have to do something similar uh, with respect to access. Uh, Ruben? I want to thank Mark for the, um, the example of the farm worker in the Central Valley, because as soon as you said that, it really um, brought home to me uh, that person, when that person wants something better in their life, they're going to call it justice. Just the same way the person um, protesting in the street about police violence, they're going to ask for justice. The same way when, when my cousin calls me and says, I'm having a problem, I want to get a divorce, she wants justice. So I have no problem with the term justice. I think that that's universally recognized as encapsulating what the courts do and what lawyers do and what ADR people do and what, you know, what people helping people do. I'm good with justice. <laughs> I, I do agree um, with the idea that justice is a larger concept and that the courts is just one place in which justice can be achieved. Uh, justice can be achieved anywhere. Um, so you think of that comprehensively, and to Leah's point, then you move on to the conversation of what can the state bar do within its jurisdiction? Um, and its limited resources to focus on achieving that justice. So I also don't have sort of a philosophical opposition to the use of justice. I think justice sort of hand in hand with fundamental fairness uh, and the ability for all Californians to achieve that. Um, so you know that and it's also sort of baked into our mission statement already and it's in the statute. So um, that's sort of where I stand. So I would just echo Leah's point, and we've got Helen, um, Helen Hong, the director of our Office of Access and Inclusion, capturing what we're saying here. Um, the plan was to have you just sort of throw out what, you know, your ideas, like Leah said, you know, interpreters, court reporters, or what does access mean? And then we can sort of go through that in the second half of this presentation and say, okay, you know, and, and that's great, and you're absolutely right, that's critically important, that's not a role for the bar. But as a way of stimulating the conversation and getting us thinking through this, we thought it might be helpful to really sort of throw out those broad ideas um, of, what, of what access can mean in, in any of these venues. I'll throw out a few more just to get people's ideas, you know, flowing, um, just to have more broad ideas to be considered. You know, in the past, we've actually talked about, you know, promoting limited scope representation and unbundling of legal services and how can the state bar um, make it easier for individual attorneys to take on a piece of a case and not be on the hook for the entire case. And that promotes justice because someone may say, I need help with my divorce, but I only need help with this piece. And that way they'll have a better chance of getting access to an attorney if the attorney knows they can help her with only that piece. So that's one thing that the State Bar has been in, engaged in in the past. Sonia? Uh, well, the legal system is quite intimidating, especially for the lay um, person. It's something to avoid at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> and it requires, you know, non-lawyer, sophist legally sophisticated person to navigate it. It's not currently set up such that, you know, if there is, um, that, that lawyers will come to them when they have any problems. There's so many things, so many places that even these hotlines and centers that are being advertised, they just don't know where to go and how to choose it, you know, how to choose the right one and to be able to, mm -hmm. to uh, work with them. So for me, access is to, you know, for them to be able to use the court, but they need to be able to get to the right lawyer, the correct, the, the, the appropriate lawyer, or even to get, um, for them to know where, or even the lawyers to come to them. So I think it's really, I mean, talking about uh, the, you know, in, uh, the farmer or anything like, it's the same way as, 
the other uh, people on the street. So right. that for me is. And, and you know, the statistics about uh, unrepresented litigants in family law are reflective of nationwide um, areas in which state courts see um, people's legal problems, and putting aside corporations and major players, individuals uh, in, in the society, um, about 80% of the case, of people in the case types, commercial landlord, um, sorry, small claims, landlord, tenant, um, contract disputes, and family law, which is the bulk of the cases where ordinary individuals come to court. Nationwide, about 80% of the people come without a lawyer. So if we think only in terms of providing access to representation for everybody, we're missing a whole huge swath of the population. Um, and um, the idea of broadening out to the community, reaching out to the farm worker, providing information to, pers to a person who doesn't even know where to start is part of the idea of this continuum ranging from basic information all the way to representation. Mm -hmm. Glenna? I, I think providing another level, another tier of legal services would be helpful, uh, such as the Triple LT program or you know, something that would allow those who've graduated from law school but haven't passed the bar exam to provide some level of legal services would expand the number of service providers that we can have out there in the field. So I, I do think it's something we should be looking at in order to increase the bodies that can provide the services. And that was a recommendation that came out of the Civil Justice Strategies Task Force along with navi Navigators, which Justice Elon and I really love the idea of Navigators. Because mm -hmm. you go to court, and, and if, if you, even if you have an attorney, sometimes you don't really understand what happened to you. And having someone, especially if you don't have an attorney, say, here's what was actually just set into court, you know, in court to you right now. Here's what happens next. Um, when someone's in crisis, they can't understand what happens. That's good. I was just wondering. Um, like legal assistance and that kind of, um, what is it? Hmm? yes, paralegals. Mm -hmm. Now, how do they factor in this? Are you, or they, I know you're on that, that task force for innovation, or is, are they part of that discussion at all? Well, you paralegals know? are not allowed to provide legal advice. They have to be under the supervision of an attorney at this point in time, and we don't have a separate um, function for them that allows them to operate independently unlike mm -hmm. a couple of other states that have allowed something like a nurse practitioner yeah, equivalent in so the legal field. One of, our, one of the objectives that we do have in the strategic plan would have us, by the end of 2020, um, I, I could mm -hmm. look at the slides, it'll tell me, um, would uh, have us study the use of, uh, the, the use of paraprofessionals mm -hmm. in California. So looking at the limited legal, li limited legal license technicians, looking at unlawful detainer assistance, mm -hmm. legal document assistance, mm -hmm. figuring out if there, if there are um, ways to use paraprofessionals mm -hmm. to expand access in that way. So, so that one is, is on our list and we will certainly be looking at that. You guys mentioned navigators. Or do they have any sort of legal training, or are they just, or are they just people who know enough that they can tell you what the heck happened? You know, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In New York, they use college students who go through a training program. Um, in a couple of other states, um, they have people who are law students or uh, have other training. Um, and uh, it depends on their role because in some states the navigator literally, you know, takes you from place to place and sits there and then explains what just happened in the same way that you take a friend to the doctor with you. Mm -hmm. So when the doctor delivers bad news you, and you can't hear it, someone hears it. Uh, <laughs> but in, in other states, um, they allow the, the navigator to actually help the person speak in court and allow the navigator to explain things to the judge if the person, either for language reasons or because of their own emotional uh, feelings, can't communicate effectively. So there's a broad range of possibilities in terms of navigators and the kind of person you choose to be a navigator is going to depend a lot on what services you want to provide through the navigator. So are navigators allowed here in, in California? Do we need the courts here? allow navigators to mm -hmm. participate? We don't have a formal program. Um, we have students who work in the self-help centers who work yeah. quite closely with the litigants in self-help centers and perform a kind of navigation role. 
Um, the Chief Justice is interested in exploring what navigators can do actually in the courtroom um, and uh, would work, you know, would be interested, I think, in working with that. No, that, that makes sense. I, I dealt a lot with uh, women with um, um, domestic violence issues, mm -hmm. and we did a lot of um, self help through the courts, is where I sent them, and sometimes I also went along. Like sit, mm -hmm. to sit with them because mm -hmm. they're not hearing what anything the judge is saying. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I'm saying, okay, this is what happened while we were there. I mm -hmm. remember doing that, I'm just trying to be helpful. Right. Okay, that's interesting. You know, it's actually a very similar model to what's happening in New York. I mean, we were looking at the New York evaluations of the navigator programs, at least the earlier evaluations I read. And when we were trying to explain it to California audience, we would say, like, like what you're able to do for domestic violence advocates, go with them to court and explain what happens. And you know, I think that Donna passed out just uh, the table of contents of the journal that was just posted online recently. Um, and I read just a few of those articles because I think it was very recently posted. I just found out about it from Justin Zilon today. Um, but those, there's some really great articles in there that if people want to dive into this issue later on and you want to learn a little bit more, um, I, I really recommend Rebecca Sandifer's article, which looks at the way that you can have access to, to like broader justice issues without using a lawyer. Um, there's a, I, I don't know if it was in Becky's article or in someone else's article about, um, you know, sometimes having a lawyer doesn't make a difference in certain cases where you can be helped at lower ends of the spectrum with having very good template documents that you fill out and there'll be fewer errors than if a lawyer were helping you out and doing it from scratch. So there's some really great ideas in there that um, because it's packaged all in one issue, you can do a deep dive into all of them all at once. You know, um, maybe to take a step back and borrow a little bit of what we discussed in the prior panel. Uh, there appears to be consensus uh, amongst the trustees that the strength of the state bar is uh, as a platform of information sharing, data mm -hmm. collection, uh, data dissemination, um, and then to credibility on multiple levels, standard setting among them. Uh, is there a way we can think about access to justice that plays off the state bar, those strengths, rather than, uh, not to say that this has not been a great discussion about individual programs, but thinking about playing to the strengths of the agency of what we have now? I, I think yes, and I, you know, I would kind of urge the board as you think about it, to think about force multipliers, um, which is, you know, there we're blessed in California with a lot of players in the access field. Um, and the, the key is to maximize the use of resources by not overlapping with each other in some way, but each of us looking to see how we can be a force multiplier um, and, and really bring something to the table that nobody else is bringing. The state bar, because it regulates lawyers and it regulates the practice of law, um, might have a role in issues around legal technicians um, and uh, regulation of unbundling or, you know, the, the state bar has already done some work on unbundling, um, but looking at increasing the, the ability of people to do unbundling. If legal technicians become something that wants to be studied, the state bar is the first place because that's where the regulation happens. Um, and that's a regulated area for consumer protection reasons. Um, and um, I would also say, just to throw out to think about, you know, one of the issues that's come up uh, among a lot of the thinking in the area is that we need to simplify the legal process. If we're going to have more people representing themselves in the legal system and trying to solve their own problems, we ought to make it simpler. And, you know, lawyers who are dealing with legal problems every day are a great resource to say, what is it in the system that is unnecessarily complicated? Uh, where could we streamline things and make it more straightforward? Um, and, and you know, you have a whole captive audience of all the lawyers in California who you could be talking to about that, just as one example. I want to throw something out just to be a bit provocative to get the board um, and thinking. So we talked about a little bit about what does access mean, access to justice. And we came upon this issue of access to the courts. 
Um, and Joanna, you posited that perhaps, even though of course access includes access to the courts, that that may not be an appropriate area of focus for the state bar. And I too have really struggled with, you know, wh wh where is it most appropriate for us to focus given what we do, who we are, and limited resources that we have. But it sounded, Ruben and Mark, like you two feel differently. And that has very concrete implications uh, because as the board considers, as Donna indicated, not this year adding new access objectives, but certainly next year when we have the justice gap study completed and the technology, the work of the technology task force completed, as you consider new objectives, you know, those objectives could range from increasing self-help services, trying to implement a navigator program, which is a court-based kind of a support, to things that are very clearly within our four corners, um, increasing funding for legal aid, uh, looking at the triple LTs, which is a regulatory function. So it does matter, this, this question of where do we focus and where is it appropriate for the state bar to focus? And I heard some differing views just on that particular topic that I'd love to flesh out a little bit. With respect to the navigator thing, I, to me, there's a UPL issue there that the bar has a role in with respect to any type of legal service provider that's not an attorney because we're going to have to adjust our regulations to accommodate that going forward. So I think... You might be able to see a crossover there. Um, Civil Gideon is a different issue, and I'm not sure where that would fall. But um, I, I think we should focus on there where there is a, a regulatory role that the state bar can play, because I'm not sure how much we can do in, in the court's realm that would be appropriate. <coughs> Sorry, Mark. No, no, it's quite all right. So, to be clear, I'm not. Um, I'm not resolved on any definition. This is sort of a brainstormy session, except that um, I do believe that you need to define whatever it is your goal is so that you can um, attach your programming, if you will, to it. Again, since this is brainstorming, I'm going to throw out some ideas for the bar that I've been thinking about. We talk about pro bono work for attorneys. How can, and we could as, a, as the state bar, come up with some um, means by which we could encourage pro bono uh, participation by attorneys. Let's throw out some crazy ideas. For every 10 hours of pro bono, you get one hour of MCLE credit, or you get a dollar off your fees, or something along those lines. Um, something to encourage that. Now, I might also say this. Um, Within the last week or so, I contacted local bars and I contacted uh, uh, CCLS out there in my neck of the woods. And it turns out that there's actually an access committee in our county that is sort of coordinated with the state, uh, the uh, local judges. And of course, there's also the pro bono section of the bar. Mm -hmm. What occurred to me is that, gee whiz, here I am, uh, state bar, and I'm not, I'm not really interfacing with these people well to find out what is it that you think you need here in this community. Uh, it's sort of like, and the thought came to me that all politics is local. Um, and in some regards, you know, access issues are local. For example, the, the farm worker issue is not maybe not necessarily the same type of issue that you'd have in Los Angeles. Um, so pro bono to me would be... Um, something to consider. Also, lawyer referral service. Um, this came as a surprise to me, too, when I contacted a bar association to find out, you know, how do you, how do you make referrals to attorneys? When I was a young attorney, they had a thing called the Borderline Indigent Panel. And, and they would qualify uh, people, you know, they'd fill out financial declarations and that kind of thing. And then if uh, this person qualified as a person of limited means, they had uh, sort of um, agreements with certain attorneys that would accept cases at certain specified amounts that would be lower normally than you would get on the market at certain rates for these people. 
And I was surprised to find out that this particular um, referral service didn't have any such program. That, to me, at least would give some sort of uh, availability to people of limited means, um, you know, the availability to perhaps afford an attorney when they couldn't otherwise afford them. Uh, it also struck me, and I looked at the rules that were in our book here recently, they're supposed to have uh, these uh, qualified uh, lawyer referral services are supposed to provide those types of services, I think. I, I have to review that again. So um, th those are, uh, and I wrote down this, is, this is brainstorming, subsidized registration uh, 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 representation. I, I don't know how you do that. One other thing with, um, with regard to... Um, providing either pro bono or uh, some sort of a, a indigent panel is that you have attorneys out there that are trying to earn a living, for example, family lawyers, you know, and they're, they're going after, um, what is it, 20 to 30 percent of the available market, all of them, so that if you, in essence, um, either subsidize or increase pro bono, you are in some sense uh, competing, if you will, with the uh, licensees. But that's not really the topic here so much. It's how to, how to help people who cannot otherwise avail themselves of legal services to do that. So th those are just a few ideas. Just to respond very quickly to the lawyer re referral service issue, um, um, tomorrow at the Programs Committee meeting we'll be talking about the revision to the rules to the, lo to the lawyer referral service rules. And there was you could say an exception um, in the rule um, about the requirement to have panels to help those of modest means. And you'll see in the proposal that we present tomorrow that that is closed. Is there going to be a discussion of um, limited scope panels? <coughs> so to, to play off um, both Thea and Joanna, comments about playing to our strength and us being a primary regulatory agency. I think it'd be worthwhile for us to explore uh, triple LTs. Uh, the intersection between UPL and navigators, those, those are things that we know, um, we're very familiar with. And worthwhile because it also addresses what Sonia discussed, which is the confusing aspect of finding a lawyer or navigating our legal system the high costs of retaining a lawyer, um, achieving your, your goals of justice or fundamental fairness without needing to write a big check. Um, these are all, and you know, triple LTs, navigators are going to be either a free or very low cost uh, opportunity for more Californians to sort of achieve those ends. Um, and I think it does speak to our strength. One quick note on triple LTs, however, is that um, the state that I know that has incorporated it for the longest time is Washington. They have far fewer ABA accredited law schools and, and no similar structure like the California accredited law schools or the non-accredited law schools. So they started with a slightly different background where you know, to be a, a, a person helping in the legal sphere, you really had to go to an ABA accredited law school and pass the Washington Bar exam. At least here in California, we have different paths. To, to becoming as someone who helps people in the legal sphere. So it's a little bit different in the um, starting circumstances. And at least the early data that I saw showed that it wasn't necessarily especially cheaper per hour because you still had a lot of associated overhead costs. I think it may show promise in rural places in California, but at least opening up an office, carrying your malpractice insurance, all of that, those kind of fixed costs weren't that much cheaper if you were a limited license legal technician or a you know, bar a bar attorney in that state. I still think it's worth um, research, but it's also good to know how California is different from Washington. Well, I totally agree about studying the LLT uh, option. And the, is that something the Innovation Committee is looking at? Or it's, hmm. The triple LT um, Explore, exploration of a California program is actually already in our strategic plan. So the technology committee is not looking at it specifically, although there is a UPL uh, subcommittee of the technology task force looking at the definition of the practice of law in California. And so that's certainly 
has a very strong correlation to the triple LT. Right. So what? So okay. So in the bigger pick scheme of things, I would break our role into two pieces. The first being where are we standing in the way of innovation that could increase access? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as a regulatory agency, and the second being what affirmative steps can we do, whatever that is, that's helping with support centers, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I think the first order of business for us is where we're standing in the way as a regulator. And so, uh, although I will say with LLLTs, um, I think there's a statutory barrier. The UPL statute would need to be mm -hmm. amended to permit that, uh, and probably a statutory scheme established for that, uh, which doesn't mean we shouldn't study it. But I think we need to recognize it's not directly within our power to authorize that. Um, the second thing is limited scope representation. That's been on the table for a long time. And I remember when I was on the Committee for Professional Responsibility and Conduct in the late 90s, early 90s, <laughs> whatever. I don't even want to think about it. 90s, it was a long time ago. You know, one of the things that we contributed to, we weren't in the lead on it, but we contributed to the development of new Judicial Council forums mm -hmm. to allow limited scope representation of family law cases. But I don't think that the bar's regulations really present a barrier to limited scope representations. The barriers are really from case law and mm -hmm. liability concerns. So the new Judicial Council form for family, I think it's like 20 years old now, um, is really sort of implicitly created an exception to case law saying that a lawyer cannot make a special appearance in a court case that is limited to some sort of subject matter. I think it would be worth studying and whether that could be studied by COPAC or some other group, expanding this idea of a judicial counsel form for a limited appearance. So for example, someone has a landlord tenant case, someone can come in and represent them on one motion and as a lawyer without feeling bound to appear in the entire case through trial, which is a which is a serious barrier, but that emanates from judicial decisions, as I understand it, and not 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 the rules from the state law. The, the 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 study that was done uh, that led to the to the adoption of the the state bar policy and to those forms um, indicated number one, there is nothing in the uh, ethical rules that precludes limited scope regulation uh, representation in California. There is nothing in the case law that prohibits an attorney and a client from agreeing that the attorney will be responsible only for one portion of the case. Um, it is a matter of judicial education for judges to understand that they have to respect those agreements. And um, there are forms that expand from family law into some limited civil cases. So um, there really are no barriers um, in the legal system on, on the court side to doing that. The barrier to expansion that we have found over the last 15 years or so is number one, lawyers not knowing how to do it despite the fact of all the training materials that are on the web. And the reason I asked Donna about um, the lawyer referral is that there are so many lawyer referral panels that don't have limited scope panels. And so you have people coming to self-help centers and the self-help self-help center staff recognizing here's a person who could be helped by a limited scope lawyer and who could afford a limited scope lawyer and they have no place to send them. So that, you know, encouraging lawyer referral services to have limited scope panels, which are not exactly the same as the modest means panels, mm -hmm. um, would be a huge step forward. I just... Um... I do think there are barriers from the case law. I mean, speaking as a practicing lawyer and someone who advises other lawyers, appearing as counsel of record is considered very risky if you're trying to limit your scope of representation. In family, I think if there was something that gave more of an imprimatur of it from the judiciary, like the judicial counsel form, um, and I didn't know about these other newer forms, that would help a lot. Um, and you can certainly limit your scope of representation outside of court, but in court, you need permission, court permission to withdraw if the client won't, won't agree. So it is, I think lawyers perceive it as a risk of being um, uh, not being able to limit their scope of representation as counsel of record because it is subject to each individual judge's discretion in the, at the end of the day. And um, 
there's also there's also case law about civil liability. So there's, for example, Nichols versus Keller, which says lawyers have to identify all issues presented by a fact pattern, regardless of the limitations. And so um, that can all be handled with ed education and training and so on. Um, I think it's worth further study because uh, I do think this issue prevents some lawyers from appearing as counsel of record for people of modest means, whether that's in pro bono context or reduced fee context because of the significant liability concerns. Maybe as, as a framework for thinking about it, I mean, Jason, you gave me a good idea is that there was sort of um, a hierarchy for the, for the board and for the bar mm -hmm. that we focus on areas where we're either standing in the way of or we can promote through regulation. <clears throat> So kind of focusing first on our regulatory, the regulatory nature of our organization and what, what can we do uh, through that vehicle to increase access. And then secondarily, um, looking at things that we can do through our role, um, our ability to collect and analyze data and information and provide um, kind of uh, support and resources to others doing this work, best practices, um, staying abreast of innovation in the field. Th there's another piece here because in addition to being a regulator, we are a funder, of course, as uh, many of us are now well aware through our work with the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission, um, but we give out you know $50 million a year now in legal services money. So we do have another role, which is as a funder. Um, and when you talked, Mark, about subsidies, we heard through that process about something really interesting happening in the state of Minnesota where the equivalent of our IOLTA money is used to actually subsidize private attorneys in rural areas to take on poor people for free, take on free clients, uh, but the, the work is being subsidized. So in that way, you're using your grant funding to both uh, provide a resource for attorneys who may be struggling out in certain parts of, of a community or a state uh, and also increasing access. So we do have a kind of this other role. In addition to regulator, we are funder. Um, and there are potentially things that we could think about there in terms of ways to increase access. But I'm thinking really about a hierarchy. There's certainly number one could be, what do we do as a regulator? And then moving into data collector, aggregator, disseminator, and then maybe third as a funder. Um, and I don't know that that's the right construct, but just throwing it out there for people to react to. I could piggyback on that. What, an idea that was has been thrown about for a long time and hasn't been uh, pursued yet is the uh, loan forgiveness program for attorneys that will go out to rural areas. It's in the medical field has something similar. We don't have anything like that, and it's something we should be looking at. Um, whether Where that money would come from is not you know, whether or not we have to add to our fees, which obviously this year would never be a good idea to do that. Mm -hmm. But or if we were able to able to convince the legislature to put general fund funds towards, it, it would certainly help. It should it should be on our radar. Yeah, I, I really like the idea of targeting funds to achieve uh, the ends that we want to. Uh, things like this, yes, probably this year is not the, the best year to add to our ask for fee increase, but um, certainly we can be advocates. I think there are a lot of sympathetic or empathetic years in the legislature that would, that would support something like that, um, which goes to, you know, I guess my idea about our credibility, uh, our influence, and our ability to sort of think of areas in which we can um, fund. That's a, that's a fantastic concept. So, yeah. um, with respect to loan forgiveness, I do have experience with that. As prior to my appointment to the state bar, I was appointed by the governor to the Health Professions Education Foundation. It is the only state created foundation. It was created in 1987. 
And what it does is to provide loan forgiveness and scholarships to, not loan forgiveness, but loan repayment and scholarships to health professionals in all levels, in all kinds, um, who work in underserved, medically underserved areas. And it has provided over $124 million. And there are different types of, uh, of uh, you know, application and all the different um, fundings that uh, came from, that are coming from health providers or health uh, industries or, or corporations. So this is something that we can look into. Um, it's, uh, uh, there, are diff there are two uh, application periods a year for nurses, doctors, health providers, personal assistants, and um, they uh, are given either a scholarship that, and they will pro they promise to serve in medically underserved areas once they graduate and for loan repayments for doctors who when I look at when when I score them I, I also volunteer as a score you know amazing I mean three hundred thousand dollars four hundred thousand dollars and but they remain they wanted to stay in the medic in in not in private practice but in those areas because they would like to give back to the community. This is something that we can do. And probably funding could also come from the corporate responsibility as part of you know the corporate responsibility programs of the corporations. I think it's I think it's really a very good incentive or a very good program that people can go give can give back to the community. Anna? Yeah, so I want to take us up a level again, um, because um, because we do have objectives spelled out right now. So so uh, it seems like a lot of the things that we're talking about are sort of very specific things that we should be exploring. Um, one of the things that I was hoping as sort of we bring um, this panel to a close is that we can we answer some broader questions about the the state bar's role because it's not it, it's not just about what what we're doing today but it's about things that can come across our path. So as legislation is introduced, what are the parameters of where state bar advocacy is appropriate? As you know, things come up, what, what are those parameters? And so I was hoping that sort of part of what we could get out of today is, is, is answering questions like um, not what role should the state bar um, play in seeking increased funding, funding and volunteer resources for legal services. We'll figure that one out as we go forward, but, but sort of a yes or no, should the state bar play a role in seeking increased funding and, um, and volunteer resources for legal services? Should the state bar encourage attorney pro bono services? Should the state bar play a role in ensuring the presence of court reporters or court interpreters in court proceedings? Should the bar play a role in advancing the cause of civil Gideon efforts um, to ensure that we've got lawyers available in, in civil matters? Should the state bar role, play a role in supporting and seeking funding for self-help self -help legal services where representation is possible? Should that role in self-help apply only in the legal services arena or should it apply for, to self-help in courts as well? Um, uh, should the bar's role in access extend beyond the indigent, but to those of modest means or others who are unable to afford counsel to represent them? Really sort of setting those high-level parameters so, so we know how to respond when things come up this year and we know how to focus our efforts as we're presenting to you objectives for, uh, for our strategic plan for next year. <laughs> just just very quickly, just, just very quickly, I think my earlier comment, you know, with the, the broad range of justice is, is, is related to what, um, what was just spoken, and that is we are the only entity in the state that interfaces with nearly every one of the 200,000 plus lawyers that are practicing. And so I think necessarily, to some degree, the answer to Donna's questions has to be yes for at least some of those things. <laughs> Josh? I mean, I agree it has to be yes. I will say, um, at least for me, a uh, number of times today I've asked myself, you know, who are we and where are we going? Um, and I just keep looking down at the mission statement and understanding that um, we're, what we're supposed to be or or, or the direction we're supposed to head. And then I look at kind of the end of the statutory mission, which says in exercising 
the licensing and regulatory discipli disciplinary function. Um, and so I, I do think that um, that can be limiting. And so one of the things that we're going to have to decide is, um, especially in the, um, I think in the in, in the regulatory word, um, how broad we want to make that. And so I don't I don't know that. It, uh, uh, in my heart, the answer is yes to all of them, but I think we need to sit down at some point and decide um, uh, a clear direction uh, because we can't take them all on, and we do have, a, 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 I think, a, a limited mission in that sense. Any other comments? I just want to add some, some of the things she said. I, I agree it would be wonderful if we could do all of them, and just for me, some of them sound like they're, they're more suited for the courts and, and the judiciary, some of the help you know, self-help things that are tied to the courts and, and interpreters and that kind of thing seems to be more tied to the courts themselves as opposed to us. So just one of the things I think we need to also think about. I think it does need to have, a, a, I think, further the examination in terms of some of the things she said that I think fit us as a regulatory agency, but some of them just I don't think they do. And as a frequent partner with the State Bar, I like Donna's framing because when there's a no, it's very, it's, it's, it feels good to be able to say someone else has it. I don't have to step in. And so as a regulatory agency, you can say that some other entity has this. It's great to be informed, but you don't have to have responsibility for tracking every single change. And, you know, for my own organization, I love when our answer is a no because it frees up my time to work on more important things. I, I absolutely agree. And I, I, I have no philosophical issue with defining access to justice broadly, but then for us as an agency, focusing on our strengths and our, our mission um, centered around the regulation of the profession and to discover areas where we are the only actors in this field and to focus our resources in that way. Um, I, we are blessed with a number of um, institutions and organizations devoted to access to justice. So certainly um, duplicating those efforts um, would seem uh, wasteful. Sean? Um, you know, I was thinking further about the dialogue I had with Justice Zelon, and uh, you know, it occurs to me there's another place where the bar could be helpful, at least in studying the issues we were discussing, which is um, under our new rule 1.16, which is the ethical rule about declining or terminating representation, mm -hmm. there's no discussion of this limited scope. So there's nothing, mm -hmm. and there could be something in the commentary or the rule itself that says the lawyer has a limited scope of representation and it's completed, the lawyer is done. You know, that would help with the dynamic that I uh, mm -hmm. described. And I sort of forget what the rules of court and the statute say. It's that the ability to withdraw in litigation depends on the rules of the tribunal. So there again, mm -hmm. there may be some effort for looking at the bar rules, looking at the statutes, and so on to make lawyers uh, to enhance the, the willingness of lawyers to appear at limited scope. Because I, I think you're right about the continuum of services. I think that's a key to providing uh, a lot of assistance to people who need it. Let me make you an offer. If the bar starts looking at the bar's rules and uh, identifies areas where the court needs to change, I am the co-chair co with uh, Judge Brazil, who you heard from a little earlier, of the Providing Access and Fairness Committee, and that falls squarely within our mandate. So you know who to call. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I thought the discussion was um, really, really productive and insightful. I appreciate both of you taking the time uh, to lead the discussion. Thank, thank you. you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a five minute break.
All right, two-minute warning. Okay. Prod each other. Got it. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. I think we we will. If we start a close session at five o'clock, get out of here at six. And we really can because the course is just an extension of this. Right. So we don't have to. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right, we're getting started. Um, next up. is the discussion on our budgets. Yes. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Leah and John. All right. So we're going to talk to you uh, this afternoon about our fiscal condition. 
and our critical need for a licensing fee increase. This, of course, is not the first time that we've brought this issue before the board. And as you're well aware, we are actively seeking a fee increase for 2020. But today we're going to walk you through in, in some level of detail uh, both the need for the fee increase, how that need breaks down, uh, what the fee increase would be used for, as well as the very real impact, the reality of the situation should we not realize a fee increase. Uh, really, uh, we plan to tee up for the board the kinds of very difficult decisions that you will need to ultimately make if we find ourselves uh, looking at 2020 without a licensing fee increase. So this is the beginning of a conversation, uh, one that I hope we don't need to take to the uh, most concerning conclusion, uh, which would be one where we do not realize a fee increase and we have to make some very difficult decisions uh, about the future of the organization. Uh, but we will tee that up for you today. Uh, with that, uh, John and I have a series of slides to go through. I encourage you to interrupt us during the presentation with questions, um, and we'll take it from there. So, John. Oh, he needs a mic. I apologize. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through to, um, at least the presentation summary um, for today. I'm going to spend just a quick minute talking about the background and overview um, for the fee, for, uh, fee history and the general fund. I'm going to talk a little about the 2019 final budget that staff will prepare or propose tomorrow um, at the board meeting. Um, Leah will cover the 2020-2024 forecast and the assumptions. She will also discuss um, the state bar needs as we go forward. Um, I will cover what the impacts are without the fee increase, and then Leah will um, do the conclusion and the summary based on, um, on those results. So um, just quickly, um, and I don't need to say this too many times, but it's been um, two decades since the state bar has received um, an increase in the mandatory fee. And the last, at least in 20, or 1998, the fee was uh, 318, and as it is today, it's 315. Even with a modest um, CPI adjustment, that fee would be well over $500 today. Um, the other note is that the general fund, this will be the third year in which um, the general fund is projected to have a deficit, um, and that deficit in the proposed budget currently for 2019 is $15.8 million. Um, just to note, 2018, um, we show a budget deficit of 8.9, but um, currently it's projected closer to $4 million. So just to you know, reemphasize the aspect of uh, no fee increase, um, this is the blue line is that uh, fee over the past 20 years, and just compared to CPI if um, it had had an inflationary factor to the, to the fee. Um, with this, um, just really to emphasize the 2019 budget, um, just to show you where reserves would be um, based on the proposed budget for 2019, um, reserves would end at about uh, $6.1 million at the end of December of this year, um, leaving us with about 6.6%. Uh, I'm going to turn over to Leah to cover the forecast. All right. So one of the things that we began to do last year is we're obviously looking at a deterior deteriorating uh, fund balance was the delineation uh, or articulation of what our true funding needs are. Uh, and we wanted to do that for a five-year period. So we began uh, really primarily uh, myself, the CFO, and the CAO working together to document our needs for the period 2020 to 2024. In doing so, we obviously looked at what we need in order to sustain our organization at status quo. And I really want to be clear with the board that just to maintain status quo, we need a very significant fee increase. But in addition to status quo, we also looked at the amount of funding that we need 
to implement key strategic initiatives for the State Bar. Primarily, what would we need to invest into the Office of the Chief Trial Counsel to achieve our statutory case processing timeline of 180 days? The board will recall that last year we completed a workload study. And the workload study determined that we would need 58 new positions in the Office of the Chief Trial Counsel in order to achieve that statutory backlog. So the funding need, the five-year forecast, does in fact include the funding for those full 58 positions. In addition, uh, years of stagnant funding have resulted in the type of problem at the state bar that you find in many government agencies, that is our inability to plan for and invest in technology and capital appropriately. And of course, delayed investments, a lack of investment catches up with any organization. I heard from a board member earlier today expressing surprise about all of our manual processes. But this is what happens when you can't invest appropriately in technology. It delays uh, and it negatively impacts the public. And it actually makes our cost of business ultimately more expensive. But that's the situation that we found ourselves in. So the five-year forecast certainly includes significant technology and capital investments. In addition, the five-year forecast uh, includes some other really important components and one that I want to highlight. Uh, several of them are listed on your screen and I'm not going to go through all of them. But one I want to highlight is our uh, SCIU uh, salary adjustment, which is our contractual obligation with the union. You may recall that uh, last year we initially were seeking a fee increase and ultimately that was withdrawn. And as part of that effort, we did have to commit to, and, and it was the right thing to do obviously for our staff, but to a salary increase even without, irrespective of whether or not we receive uh, a licensing fee increase. So that salary increase goes into effect January 1 of 2020, uh, retroactive to January 1 of 2019. So of course that is included in our five-year forecast. Also included, another really important bullet there is parity for retiree health benefits for all employees. As I, I've shared with the bar, board previously, I was uh, shocked to come to the state bar and learn that only our executive, our highest paid staff were receiving any retiree health benefit. I, I can't emphasize enough uh, how problematic that situation was. You worked here for 30 years as an investigator, for example, retired and had no retiree health benefit from this organization. Um, just beginning last year, when we moved to the CalPERS health system, did our non-executive staff begin receiving a very modest retiree health benefit. This is called the PEMCA minimum. Our staff currently receive $133 a month towards retiree health. Um, and this is not tenable, it's not appropriate, uh, and it's not acceptable for us to continue uh, in this fashion. So we have uh, had an actuary cost out the provision of reasonable retiree health benefits for our represented staff, and that is included in the five-year forecast. You can go forward, John. I'm not going to read all of those. So the five-year forecast is here, noted on your screen. And so you can see 2020 to 2024, we project growth in our revenue, uh, growth in our mandatory licensing fees that is based on looking at our historical growth rate over the last 10 years in, in licensing fees. And then in the expenditure rows, uh, many of the uh, issues that I did call out previously are baked into those numbers, uh, the technology investments um, and other expenses. So you can see that beginning in 2020, we project a deficit of $31 million and that grows to $49 million by the year 2024. Um. So uh, in terms of our funding need and how it breaks down kind of conceptually, we've got an operating deficit um, that is, uh, and the, the funding that we're seeking is designed to make workforce investments and increase our ability to protect the public, the new positions for the Office of the Chief Trial Counsel. About $43 million over the five-year period for uh, investments in capital and technology. 
In addition, uh, the five-year forecast does include the funding that we need to maintain the reserve level recommended by the California State Auditor, which is a 17% or a two-month reserve. I should also note that in developing our five-year forecast and, the, and identifying our funding needs as an organization, we did also very explicitly look at the Client Security Fund. Uh, the Client Security Fund is funded by a mandatory li licensing fee. And so this is another component of our funding need, although it is a different stream uh, from that which supports our general fund expenses. So how does, what, what do the numbers really look like? On an ongoing basis, we're looking at a need of a $100 increase in the licensing fee. We also feel that it's critically important that there is some kind of annual adjustment built into the licensing fee going forward. We don't want to find ourselves uh, 20 years from now in a situation where there's been no increase for 20 years. Uh, one way to effectuate a, a change to that system would be to have a COLA or CPI adjustment built into the fee annually. So what does that $100 get us? $40 uh, gets you those 58 new positions in the office of the chief trial counsel. 17 of the $100 uh, gets us that parity in retiree health, uh, so important from an equity and fairness perspective. $13 funds the COLA, our contractually obligated COLA. And $30 is our structural operating deficit. So I think it's really helpful to have the numbers broken down in this way and to be even more sort of explicit about it. If you take the bottom two bullets, the $30 and the $13, so that's $43, that's the amount of a licensing fee increase that we need to just sustain ourselves. This is our core operating deficit and our contractually obligated salary increase that goes into effect January 1 of 2020. That's as distinct from the $17 and the $40, which are new items, growth items. So hopefully that's a helpful way for the board to understand the breakout of that $100 increase. In terms of our capital and IT needs, um, I think uh, Steve and his team have done an amazing job of in, in a significant detail, identifying our capital and technology needs over the five-year period. And one thing that we are clear about is these needs are more one-time in nature. They're one-time and cyclical, I should say. They're not one-time for the duration of the history of the state bar or in perpetuity, but they're certainly cyclical. So as opposed to the $100 ongoing uh, licensing fee assessment uh, for our public protection and workforce investment related uh, activities, here we seek a one-time assessment of $250. And that breaks out as follows, $128 for our capital investments, $82 for technology investments, and then $40 for the reserve funding, again, the 17% reserve level recommended by the state auditor. Lee, I have a question. Yeah. That the 17% was on the prior slide as well on the $100 fee increase. Is this an, can you explain the difference between the operating deficit there and the 17% on the next slide? How are they different? This, the reserve is not here. You saw it on this slide. Okay, so it's the operating deficit doesn't doesn't adjust for the reserve whatsoever. No. Operating deficit is simply the difference between revenue and expenses. Okay. Um, our you know status quo expenses and versus the revenue that's coming in. Okay. So the, the reserve assessment we view that as one time because it's essentially you build your reserve and your your putting it away, so to speak, so that you are always maintaining uh, that two-month funding level. And when John mentioned our uh, projected reserve balance at the end of this year, uh, assuming that the board approves the, the 2019 budget as proposed by staff, it's taking us well below that 17%. I think we're going to five or six, six percent reserves. So that's a comparison there. 
So the client security fund I mentioned, um, I, I, we're not spending much time in this presentation on the client security fund, but I do think it's important that you that you understand that our needs for assessments and fee increases extend beyond our uh, traditional licensing fee. When we look at the client security fund, uh, really based on the extensive work that was done in March of last year, some of you will recall we had a statutory re uh, report due on the fund. Uh, we determined that in order to pay out all of the eligible applications in the pending inventory, we would need a one-time uh, assessment of $82 for active attorneys. And as Lori mentioned uh, when she did her presentation earlier this morning, the bulk of that inventory continues to stem from the loan modification crisis, the huge spike in applications to the fund that we received pursuant to that crisis and our inability to really address that inventory absent a significant infusion of resources. So one of the issues uh, that's come up as we've started talking about the need for a fee increase and, and an, uh, an issue that we're going to have to bring forward uh, at a later date, perhaps the next board meeting, uh, to the board to really discuss options related to is the impact of a fee increase on low and moderate income attorneys. So when you start adding all these numbers up, we're talking about a $100 ongoing uh, licensing fee need, um, a one-time assessment of $250 for the licensing fee, another $82 for the client security fund, you can see that these numbers really begin to escalate. And for those where their employer is paying uh, for the fee and where their employer is not a legal aid organization, you know, there may not be as much concern about the ability to absorb that increase. But where an attorney, a solo practitioner, a small firm practitioner, someone of, of low to moderate income themselves has to absorb that cost, there, there is a concern. And so one of the things we've started to talk about on a staff level is how could the fee increase be structured so that the impact on low and moderate income attorneys could be uh, somewhat softened. So what you have here is simply data about our current structure for fee scaling and fee waivers. This is the very beginning of this conversation, but just to give you a little bit of information about the lay of the land now. So right now, legal aid organizations which receive uh, funding from the state bar are eligible for 25% scaling. So although the licensing fee is paid by the legal aid organization directly, we do subsidize 25% of the fee for fees for the attorneys that are working in those organizations. Then we also have income-based fee scaling. 50% scaling for earnings of less than $20,000 and 25% scaling for earnings less than $40,000. Um, these numbers are quite low. We did look into it. I, I know, John, I pulled it off the slide, but I don't know if you have off the top of your head um, when that was last, when the $40,000 Yeah, so it was uh, 1999, and so with the CPI, it would be 64000 today. Um, so an equal, you know, wages of 64000 So no change since 1999. Okay. Leah, I'm sorry to interrupt. And John, is that um, all income or just income from legal practice? It's actually income. It's the... It's the income that you receive based on your work. So based it's not, yeah, work. it's not household okay. income or we had taken a closer look at that, but it is specifically related to <laughs> your 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 wages. And there, there are a number of issues here. Um, if we, when we think about potentially expanding this, uh, we don't require documentation of income. I, I believe that we do for the 50% waiver, but yes. not the 25%. So it is a self, you know, an attestation of what your income is. Um, you can see at these levels, it's a relatively small number of our licensees who are qualifying. But again, if there's really a concern about the impact of a licensing fee increase on low to moderate income attorneys, we would need to bring these these income levels up because twenty thousand and forty thousand uh, are just too low. So when we talk about expanding 
scaling and then perhaps perhaps expanding waivers entirely, then you've also got to think about would there have to be uh, documentation provided to prove your income? And that in and of itself is a significant workload issue. So this is, uh, this is me. Um, so just I'm going to briefly talk about the fiscal condition without uh, a 2020 fee increase. And um, part of tomorrow, I'll, we'll get a little more in detail on the 2019 budget. Um, but assuming, I, I'm using these numbers, uh, assuming those 2019 numbers, um, the proposed um, and, and assuming a baseline budget, um, we would have a deficit, an operating deficit for 2020 at $11 million, which would actually um, push us into negative reserves of $4.9 uh, million. And again, assuming no fee increase, um, certainly we're not going to add staff based on the workload study um, in OCTC. Um, we would defer capital and there would be limited um, IT investment. And this just shows you quickly those numbers. I won't go into the details, um, but certainly at the bottom you see the 4.9 um, million uh, negative reserves um, and the $11 million operating deficit. Again, a baseline budget for 2020. And if you look to the right, you see a lot of numbers, whether it's services, um, supplies and equipment, other expenses, capital projects with uh, significant declines. With that said, um, knowing that the projection for 2020 um, would push us in negative reserves, um, we and, and based on the board discussion in November, staff did um, provide, an, well, and we'll discuss a little more tomorrow, an alternative related to the capital plan. And based on that um, alternative, which will be uh, provided to the board tomorrow, uh, we would be reducing capital, um, eliminating the third floor um, improvements, which overall um, reduces the deficit by 5.4 million um, and leaves reserves at about 11.5 million or 13%. Still not at the board level, but at least um, as I will show you would be sufficient for supporting operations in 2020. Um, just briefly on the capital, just to show you what this looks like now and we'll have more discussion tomorrow. Um, the Two year, as part of the five-year capital plan, the next two years um, proposes $14.8 million. Um, the alternative, which will be discussed tomorrow, actually reduces that to $6.2, um, in some cases deferring um, some infrastructure related to HVAC and, and generator and other such things, and includes reducing the third floor. With that said, um, if you look at 2020, based on those reductions, um, the deficit would be 11 million, um, would leave us about a half a million in reserves. It does include the cost of living adjustment um, that we're contractually obligated. It reduces technology investment at 3.7 and then capital deferral at 3.2. And this is just a quick summary just to show you the uh, final budget versus the alternate um, um, option for tomorrow. Um, again, showing you that if you do the alternate in 2020, we would have enough reserves to get through the year, assuming no in fee increase. So knowing that we would be going into or ending 2020 with um, very little in reserves, um, we actually started to look at 2021, um, knowing that we would start with only two days of operations. We assumed um, pers normal personnel um, increases um, related to pension and health care and merit increases, but we had to model what that would look like um, in order to determine what would be some of the reductions. And so even modeling 25% uh, in operating costs, no capital and limited um, investment, we would still have an operating deficit. And this shows you that operating deficit, which is um, about $4 million. And if you can see to the right, 25% um, across the board with 100% in reductions in capital. So it just gives you context of um, going in with the $10 plus million deficit going into 2021, um, what, what it would take just to get down to $4 million um, before you have to start looking at other options. So just to make sure the, the board understands, there will be and they're in the posted agenda item, you have two different uh, options with respect to the 2019 budget. And the decision that you make tomorrow will impact the uh, year-end reserves. And that 
in turn impacts the point in time at which we go into negative fund balance territory. Uh, the budget uh, staff has proposed it with the big um, item there being the investment in the third floor, vacant third floor at Howard Street so that we can lease it out. But that in making that investment would result us going into negative fund balance in the middle of 2020. If we don't make that investment and scale back on some of the other capital investments, as we'll talk about in more detail tomorrow, we would not go into negative fund balance territory until you know January 2nd of 2021. So it essentially buys us another six or so months of operating um, of operations until we go into negative fund balance. And then John has now moved into 2021. So under the most conservative um, uh, set of projections that we can develop. So we've we've uh, the board has adopted the alternative budget for 2019. We've uh, implemented 25 percent reductions across the board in all uh, areas of our operating expenditures. Um, we've radically scaled back any kind of technology or capital investment. We still have a projected deficit at the end of 2021 of this $3.6 million, which means that we're, it's, you know, mid-year 2021 that we're in negative fund balance territory. So just want to make sure that was clear. It's me. All right. So what, when we're talking about being in a negative fund balance environment, that's obviously not something that we can sustain. So first, of course, we would look at more significant cuts to our operating expenses. As, as I mentioned earlier, we've already in this model taken an across-the-board reduction of 25%. But when we start to look at an item level or an object level at our operating expenses, we see that you know these are the key areas where should we get to this point we could look to make some pretty drastic reductions. Uh, we have security listed here. I'm not sure that that's actually an area um, that we can uh, or should cut, but we certainly have uh, security uh, staff training, training and travel for both staff and volunteers. These are line items that typically do get cut or eliminated uh, when you're in a severe fiscal crisis. Uh, catering, you can see that number, you know, we've brought that down from about half a million dollars a year um, at one point down to only 88,000, but that certainly could be eliminated. Janitorial is on the list. This is not one that I would uh, recommend. We used to have a twice daily janitorial service here in LA, for example. We did move it to once a day as uh, part of prior uh, budget reduction measures and I think um, many staff uh, have, were negatively impacted by that. So although it's on the list, that would be um, something that would be difficult to recommend. Building repairs, uh, professional services, printing. I mean, you could certainly take an approach where you'd eliminate all uh, professional services, for example. That would have very significant consequences for our program programs, but that's something that could be done. So these are operating cost uh, areas that we would need to look at uh, if we were in a no fee increase environment, looking at a negative fund balance. And then in terms of personnel costs, you really aren't going to be able to avoid a situation where you have to look at reductions in personnel because about 80% of our general fund expenses are associated with personnel costs. And about 70% of those costs are represented workforce. So we've got a temporary help budget something that often goes uh, in a fiscal crisis over time. And then there are other measures that we might have to look to, uh, concessions with our bargaining unit, um, hiring freezes, eliminating vacant positions, and of course, uh, layoffs as a last resort. So just to conclude, is this our last slide, John? It is. Great, look at that, Jason. Um, just to conclude, we have not had a fee increase in 20 years. Um, it's not sustainable. We have made some really significant uh, 
reductions over the last three to four years. And in addition, we have imposed new requirements on our executive staff to contribute to the cost of their benefits in ways that we have never done before. So we've done a lot of work internally to re-engineer, become more efficient, uh, reduce costs, and we've reached the limit to which that can be done. So we are in looking at our third year of a structural general fund deficit. And we must receive a fee increase for 2020 and beyond uh, without jeopardizing our ability to carry out our mission and initiating a series of pretty drastic uh, reductions to both operating expenditures and personnel expenditures uh, should we not have a fee increase going forward. Well done. Yes, Mark. Uh, any questions? And keep in mind, we're going to go and close at five. Okay. Um, my only question is, uh, you had on there about um, IT. Was that covering the the programs that we heard about this morning to um, modernize? You know, the the um, Odyssey, the Odyssey, and the, all of those programs. Is that is that part of that IT reduction? No, no, no. Those um, those two initiatives are funded, although future phases, I think you heard Terry mention that probation is not particularly benefiting at this time from the implementation of Odyssey. Future phases would be implemented. One of the key uh, technology initiatives that's included is the, the platform on which my state bar profile sits, the licensee record, so the official record of an attorney's licensing history. That is currently on an AS400, that black and green screen platform. And an upgrade to that is included in our five-year forecast. And it is something that we uh, certainly identify as a critical need for the organization. And that, that's one that would not be funded without a licensing fee increase. Debbie, your uh, mic. It's one of those things that you can include in your argument for a fee increase in that, um, the anti you know, how antiquated some of the um, processing um, computer programs are, are that we have and how that also affects the efficiency of the organization in terms of OCT and all of that, in terms of what they're dealing with, you know, shipping paperwork back and forth. Good grief. And I, I would just note, um, as I think I mentioned that ultimately this the five year forecast lives in a in an Excel workbook, and, and some of you have seen this. Um, and this workbook is something that we have um, is the subject, or or our need for a fee increase generally is the subject of both an audit by the California State Auditor and a review by the Legislative Analyst Office. So all of the detail about uh, capital and, and IT is included therein. Any other questions? Wait till five, Sarah, to go into closed. Okay. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we are now going to go into closed session. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I've got a number of saying around for closed. <coughs> So uh, we are going into close pursuant to government code 11126, section C, subsection 17. Thank you.